Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. I was 19 years old and the only female working at a shop specializing in automotive batteries and things of that nature. I had been working there long enough to realize that most of the clients were male and oftentimes made for some awkward situations. For instance, I would get talked down to and patronized quite a bit or flirted with to the point where I would be somewhat uncomfortable. However, this never really bothered me. One day during a particular busy rush, a very tall man who was maybe in his mid-30s came through my line. This guy had some very strange energy, he seemed a little off. However, it was my job to be professional and assist whoever came through my line. I brushed aside the uneasy feelings. I just wanted to ring this guy out and getting through the rest of the line that was now trailing out the front door. I greeted him and talked to him as I would any other customer while I was processing his transaction. Things were going fine until he realized I was almost done. He started stalling, making up weird excuses as to why he couldn't use certain credit cards, how he needed me to put his battery on hold and he would be back, etc. I told him that I would hold it for him and that he could come back whenever he found the time. I figured he would leave at that point but he just stood there and just stared at me. Now that I think about it, he was more staring through me than at me. I was a bit uneasy but kept my polite, professional demeanor. Sir, if you're not purchasing anything at the moment, may I ask that you step aside so I can assist the other customers, I said. He completely disregarded my question and, in a slow, raspy voice, asked, So, what's your name? I didn't wear a name tag specifically for reasons like this. Customers had found me on Facebook before and it was really unsettling. Thinking quickly, I threw up my nickname. It's Rhea. Rhea, he said, as he kept staring. I just smiled awkwardly and said, Yep, that's me. By this point, my manager had realized what was going on and he proceeded to ask the man to step aside as well. After hearing it from my manager, the man walked to a corner of the store by some shelving and continued to stare while I was ringing the rest of the customers out. A bit of time went by and the line had cleared up but he was still standing there, staring and now smiling the most sickening smile I think I've ever seen. It made my skin crawl. Of course, my manager and coworker saw this too and my coworker grabbed my arm and said, come on let's go out back. As we were walking to the stock room, my manager asked the man if there was anything else he needed. The man muttered that there wasn't and left. I wish that was the end of it, but of course he had to come back in to purchase the battery. When he came back the next day, we again had a line. He let people go ahead of him and waited until I was free before coming up to the counter to make his purchase. I greeted him again and tried to remain professional, but it was hard considering how creeped out I was. I was again met with the same stare and the same freaky smile. I can't remember the entire conversation, but at one point, the questions he was asking became personal slash weird slash inappropriate enough for my coworker to cut in. He looked at the guy and then at me and said, Rhea, go take your break, before he basically pushed me out the way of the computer and rang the guy out. I stayed in the back until my manager came and got me, telling me it was safe to come out. We were all pretty creeped out, but thought that was the end of it. A few days went by and we had all mostly forgotten about this creepy dude until he walked in again. This time though, he didn't look through the store, didn't approach the counter, didn't say a word to anyone. He just stood, jacked hood pulled over his head, in the corner of the store, staring and smiling. The smile had become even wider and more sinister looking and at this point I started to freak out. I started shaking and feeling sick to my stomach. Then my manager cut the horrible tension by pretty much screaming at the guy. Hey, I'm sick of you coming into my store and pulling this crap. The creep paid him no mind and kept right on staring. This pissed my manager off and he walked out from around the counter and told the dude, Look man, if you don't quit coming in here and staring at her, I will not hesitate to call the cops. What you're doing is harassment so you need to get out of my store. At the mention of police, this dude's smile dropped and he slowly sauntered out of the store. We never saw him again, but I was immediately taken off closing shifts due to fear that the man would come back and try to catch me when I was alone. About three years ago, I was in a long distance relationship with a younger man, meaning he was only 17 at the time while I turned 19 in the relationship. His name is Peter. Peter was not a nice person to say the least. He thought that the first impressions he made on people were the only one he needed and as such he stopped being nice, polite, or reasonable to people after the first meeting. I was young and saw past this thinking I could somehow change him. However, this abuse towards people around me and myself eventually became too much and I broke off the relationship with him. The breakup went smoothly all things considered, except he wanted me to say the words so he could play the victim. This had been a core element of our fighting because he hinted that he would wanted to break up, but instead of just saying it, he kept me on the hook and became even more abusive. I'm getting sidetracked, but the point was that I thought of the matter as resolved and entered a loving relationship with my current boyfriend shortly after this. Then came the day where Peter wanted to get his belongings back. I texted him a list of everything he had left in my apartment and he okayed that it was everything. We also made an appointment for him to stop by my apartment around 3pm the following Thursday. 
I have no intentions of letting him get back into my house nor being alone with him, since he suddenly seems to have many mood swings after seeing me in another relationship. He has been blocked from my Facebook account, but somehow knew I was in a new relationship, which was a major red flag to me and my boyfriend. Thursday came and I felt eager just to be done with it. My boyfriend and I are walking home from high school when my phone rings. It's Peter. He yells at me that he has now been waiting at the train station for over an hour. I try to reason with him, agree to meet him there with his belongings since he needs to catch a train. My boyfriend walks with me to the train station, but we arrive only to find it vacant. I live in a small town and the train station is mostly used during rush hours in the morning and evening. It is also located rather bizarrely among normal residences and there are a lot of off alleyways leading all over town from there. I get a text stating that Peter can see us, but won't come out of hiding when my boyfriend is there. We leave his stuff on a bench at the train station, calmly replying that I'm not actually interested in meeting him. When I say calmly, I mean that my reply is calm. I'm shaking and my boyfriend is furious over this child's play. On our way home, I receive another text. This time, he states that he has a gift for me and it is in my mailbox. This freaks us out even more, mostly because this indicates that he might be waiting at my home. It is entirely possible that he watched us on the train station and then ran all the way to my apartment. However, there is no trace of him and nothing except a bill in my mailbox. By now, we figure that he is acting out of spite and proceeds to ignore the bombardment of text, calls, and so forth that follows that day. After a while, life returns to normal. Then I get another call, this time from my ex-elder brother who is worried about his sibling. Apparently he has disappeared, taking one of his brother's gas pistols. I am speechless, but since I haven't seen anything, I shake it off as another childish act. The same day my boyfriend sees police officers walking around the basement staircase on the exterior of the house we lived in, while doing some grocery shopping. He did this every day around 4pm. The next day, we are contacted by my boyfriend's mother. In the newspaper, there is a description of an unnamed young man from the same town as Peter, who has been arrested for attempted robbery of the pizza place I lived above. He was armed with a knife, a gas pistol, and lighter fluid, while stating that he was not attempting a robbery, but was there to visit his ex, presumably me. Contacting the police, I discover that he also had a mask fake papers, and a wig and a duffel bag, which he had thrown down in the staircase when, around 4pm, he had jumped a fence and tried to enter the pizza place. This means that my boyfriend went out at the front door, while my ex was hiding right beside the front door armed. I have never been that freaked out before. The sad truth is that my ex never got charged with anything because he is a minor, has a father with a military background and money. Luckily after this, me nor my boyfriend ever saw him again. So this happened when I was in 7th grade, a 12 year old kid. At the time it was just my mom, my brother, and I living in a rental in a rundown low income area. We moved in during the summer before the school year started, and we were welcomed by our next door neighbors which wasn't too uncommon but not super common at the same time for that area in Oregon. My mom worked 8am to 5pm every day, so my little brother and I would ride the bus home every day from school. My cousin would also sometime ride back to my house with us and her parents would pick her up later, important for later. One day when I came home I noticed our small laptop we owned was gone off the counter. I figured my mom had moved it. Later when my mom came home later we determined it was missing and that a lot of other things were missing like my iPod and wallet and my mom's safe with her handgun in it and lots of family valuables. We called the cops and reported a robbery and they came to investigate. They determined the person probably slid through the doggy door leading into the garage and then entered the house through our unlocked garage door. Cops stayed in their cars on the curb all night and said they would stay on watch for our house more than normal. I was terrified all night and my brother and I slept in my mom's room. The next day we locked all our doors. It was Wednesday and it was a random half day at my school so I rode the bus home around noon and my cousin came with while my brother went to a friend's house for the afternoon to hang out. I used the key under the mat my mom leaves for me, and my cousin and I hung out for about an hour or two until her mom came and picked her up. After she left, I hear the doorknob of the closet right next to the front door slowly open and out comes this skinny, what looked like a 35 year old man that I recognized as our next door neighbor. He seemed to be constantly shaking, intense eyes, had a really unhealthy look to him because of the extremely sunken face. Terrified, I'm in the living room just standing looking at him while he looks at me, with a surprised look on his face. I think he thought everyone left when my cousin did, until his face changed to an amused smirk when I believed he realized that I was alone in this house. He begins to walk towards me while I stand there shocked, not sure what to do. He grabs me really hard on the shoulders. He seemed crazy and excitable with his intense eyes. I instinctively jump and buckle my knees to allow my full weight to be the force that rips me from his grip and fall down. He then bends down for me when I heel kick him as hard as I can. He then yells and falls to his knees. I use that time to run past him to my front door. I open it and run to a kid I rode the bus with's house about six houses down. He and his mom were there and she called the cops and my mom while I waited. The cops got to the house and he wasn't there but had managed to steal a few more small valuables. I gave my testimony 
community that it was our next door neighbor and he was later caught the same day selling some of our stuff at the pawn shop in town. He ended up being a crystal meth addict, stealing our stuff to sell and pay for his addiction. He was super weak from all the drug abuse which is probably why I was able to get away from him. He also was apparently somewhat high when he spontaneously decided to attack me being that I was alone. He had apparently watched us for a few months, learning our schedules from when we left and got home. He took the time to take the key from under the front door mat while we were gone, get a copy, and then put the original back under the mat for my brother and I to use when we got home. The cops were surprised he was smart enough to do that, as he seemed to be mostly dim-witted with everything else due to the drug abuse. Either way, I testified against his physical attack and he got a few decades of jail time being that he was already on parole for drugs. I was terrified and slept in my mom's room for the next year. About 25 years ago, when I was in middle school, 7th grade, I had a real bad problem with bullies. I couldn't handle the ridiculing I took while riding the school bus, so I started walking 3 miles to and from school every day. The path I walked was pretty safe, mostly on a sidewalk and always on a busy road, with the last 2.5 miles being a straight shot directly to the school. Back then, there wasn't a stigma attached to kids being outside on their own, so this wasn't deemed unsafe or noticed by anyone, or so I thought. I lived alone with my father, parents being divorced, and my mother saw me on weekends. He didn't see any harm in the walking and my mother wasn't aware of the bullying or the walking. I did not want her to know, so I continued unimpeded for over half the school year. Now, I wasn't really an active kid and I sure didn't like having to walk 6 miles every school day, so I assumed this was the motivation for the error I was about to make. One day on the way home, a car pulled up on the shoulder and stopped, about 100 feet ahead of me. That car looks familiar, hey it's my father, he's gonna drive me the rest of the way. I started to jog up to the car, seeing him in the driver's seat waiting patiently. Huh, his hair looks darker than normal today. Wasn't the inside of his car tan and not red? The thoughts left as soon as they entered and I caught up to the car and opened the passenger side door and started to get in. As I was tossing my backpack on the floor in front of me and swinging my legs into the car, I started saying thanks dad, but the sentence never completed. Before I knew it, I had shut the car door and we began to move. This isn't my father. This man was much older, by at least 20 years, hair obviously dyed black, and hands propped at 10 and 2 on the steering wheel. The shirt he was wearing looked just like one my father would have worn. A short sleeved collared button down, brick red with black horizontal lines, not pressed but not too wrinkled either. He was smiling at me, which probably would have felt warm if it was coming from my grandfather, but instead it felt menacing. I heard a click and looked over at the door, which had just been locked. I stared at the door for a moment longer, then turned to face front and completely froze, terrified. Hello, I saw you walking. I figured I'd come give you a lift. I did not move or answer. His voice matched his smile, deceivingly friendly. We were roughly a mile away from home, and half a mile from the next turn needed to head in that direction. All I could concentrate on is how I was going to get out of the situation. Are you on your way home? This snapped me a little out of my zone. Yes, I want to go home, I answered. Stay calm, talk normally, don't act scared. Where is your house? I can take you there. Feeling just slightly relieved, I told him to take the next right turn. I felt myself begin to breathe and I realized how tense I had been. My body relaxed slightly and I finally moved and wrapped my hands around my backpack straps. We started to come up on the intersection and I pointed ahead, reiterating that this was my turn. Okay, but if you want, we could take a ride instead. It sounded like a question, but it didn't feel like one. The dotted line for the turn lane had begun, but he did not get over. Instantly, I tensed back up and my grip and my gaze on the backpack straps tightened. Through strained muscles, I choked out that, no, no, I really need to get back home. He swung the car into the turn lane and began to make the turn. Wide-eyed, I glanced up and verified that yes, indeed, we were making the turn. Are you sure? I'll make sure you get home before anyone realizes you're gone. Grip tightening further, I abruptly stated that no, I need to get home now. My father is expecting me home now. He's waiting. I just hoped it sounded more convincing than it sounded to me. We completed the turn. Sigh. Okay, maybe next time. We can meet at the same place tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow's good. I just need to get home today. Now. My eyes were firmly trained on the road ahead of us, hoping that if I just focus on the direction to home, I would get there. The turn until my neighborhood was approaching and I informed him, again pointing towards the direction. The direction home. The next few moments were silent. As we came upon the turn, I reminded him and to my slight surprise and incredible relief, he made the turn. For the first time, I had more hope than doubt. My old neighborhood consisted of mainly apartments, but in the back were a block of townhouses, which is where I lived. If you were unaware of the layout of the complex, the townhouses might go unnoticed. Right before we got to the area where I lived, I told him here, stop here. He pulled over to the side of the road in front of an apartment building. He unlocked the door and I hurried out of the car, backpack still in hand. I began to close the car door behind me. See you here tomorrow, same time. I paused for just a second and risked another look at the man. Still smiling, still terrifying. Yes, tomorrow, see you later. I finished closing the door and hurried off. I swung my backpack on the right way and briskly walked into the opposite direction of my house. 
I could hear the car still idling behind me, and it wasn't until I was able to turn off that road and leave his view that I heard him start to move. He had to drive up to where I was walking to turn around, and I glanced back as he was making an awkward turn, instead of going around the block to leave. He caught my gaze and gave a slight wave before driving off. My hand was in the reluctant process of waving back, but I was slow enough that he was gone before I completed the motion. I turned my head and kept walking, and the moment I could no longer hear his car, I ran. As fast as my legs and heavy backpack would let me, I ran around to where I could hide between two buildings and hid there for a while, until I felt enough time had passed for me to feel confident he was not driving around waiting looking for me. It was probably 30 minutes, but it felt like hours to me at the time. I ran the rest of the way home, keeping a lookout, making sure he couldn't see me going through the backyards. I reached my front door, unlocked it, and almost spilled inside. I was moving so fast. It wasn't until I locked the door behind me that I felt safe. I didn't feel scared anymore. I was home. In the end, I told both my parents, and my mother forced my father to drive and pick me up from school for the remainder of the school year. And luckily for me, the bullying stopped the next year. My father didn't believe me and thought I made up the story to get out of walking to school. In his defense, me trying to explain that, no, the car was exactly like yours, except the entire color of the inside, and no, he did look like you just with darker hair, and it all happened so fast. It was worth his disbelief and annoyance every day in the car, so I never had to meet that guy again. So this happened when I was 16, visiting my grandma, who lives in a small town in Poland. Just for context, it was summer and my family wasn't with me at the time. As you can imagine, living without my parents for a short time, my grandma's really chill was a dream. I could stay out late as much as I wanted to without my parents being able to prove it. Now at 16, you feel you're invincible. You don't really think about how many screwed up people there are in this world. Because of this mindset, I wasn't worried about walking alone at night. The day on which the story takes place was very hot. I remember shopping and hanging out with my friends until about 8pm when it started to rain. Instead of walking home quickly, I decided to visit my aunt's house, hang out with my cousin for a bit, and walk home when the rain stopped. Well, I lost track of time and ended up leaving her house at about 10.30pm. At this point, the rain had mostly stopped, and this being my favorite type of weather, I declined my aunt's offer to drive me back, telling her I was getting a cab. I'm still surprised she believed this, but maybe she just didn't care. So I went on my way, called my grandma to tell her I'd be home in 30 minutes, but not telling her that I was walking alone. If there was one thing that scared me, it were the huge train tracks which you had to cross in order to get to my grandma's house the fastest, so I decided to take the longer way around through some sort of nature preserve. I'm not sure how to call it. I enjoyed my walk through the light rain until the long metal bridge came into my view. Just as it's beginning, I saw a man. It was a small quiet town, so it wasn't common for the people here to be out this late, but I wasn't scared immediately. I only saw his back, but he looked like every other guy you'd pass by on the street. He didn't seem to notice me, and I didn't really care. I got distracted by looking at the trees to my left, but when I came to the beginning of the bridge, the man was nowhere to be seen. I suddenly stopped dead in my tracks and got an ominous feeling. This man couldn't have already been out of view. It would have been impossible for him to move this fast. He would have had a run and I definitely would have heard him running on the metal bridge. At the end of the bridge, there was a small path that led under it, which was hidden by thick bushes. I got even more scared by the thought that he was hiding there, waiting for me. I slowly started to walk backwards, not taking my eyes off the bushes. I hid behind a tree and decided to wait a few minutes to see if he was hiding there. After about 10 minutes, my biggest fear came true. Suddenly, the man emerged from the bushes, looking in my direction. He was holding something big and shiny. I could make out in the dark that it was a knife. My mind started racing with a thousand questions. How did he see me? Why didn't I see the knife before? Where was he hiding it? He suddenly started to run in my direction, so fast. He ran straight past me hiding behind this tree and I was so relieved. When he was out of sight, I ran faster than I ever ran not stopping to look behind me, being frightened the whole way back thinking that he'd somehow find me and do whatever sick thing he had in mind. Luckily, I arrived home safely, my grandma waiting for me already mad. Looking back, this was one of the most stupidest things I could have done because of what happened a month after this incident. Two teenage girls about my age were stabbed dozens of times by this bridge. One body was found about 30 meters from it and the other one was thrown into the nearby river. To this day, nobody knows who did it, but I'm pretty sure that it was the same man whom I've encountered. For context, this took place when I was 16 years old. I'm 24 now, so it's been a while, but this was one of the many stupid things I've done in my life where I could have ended up dead or even worse. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and me and my friends would often go to the Lloyd Center to go shopping or just to hang around the food court being degenerates. I was walking around the mall with my friend Crystal and my mom when a man at a pop-up kiosk stopped us. He said that he represented a modeling company and wanted to talk to us about modeling for their clothing line. I considered myself better looking than the average duck, spoiler alert, I am about as plain jean as they come, and so I promptly announced that I wanted to sign up for the modeling agency. 
which my mom quickly shut down. I replied with a why, which got me in trouble later down the line with both parents, but that was the only start of my woes. I convinced my mom to allow me and Crystal to go off on our own and with a reluctant sigh, she allowed us to go off. Me, being the dumb kid I was, marched right back to over to the modeling agent and signed myself up with a phone number and email address. He said that he would be back in contact with me shortly to set up an interview with the company. That night, I went home and saw that I had a friend request from someone that shared no mutual friends with me. Hesitantly, I added the person and a message popped up. Hi, I'm such and such from the modeling company. You signed up with our agent earlier today and I wanted to get in touch with you. I know you're in the Portland area, so we wanted to set up an interview with you next week at 9pm at this location. Are you able to come speak to us? I responded with a maybe and logged off my computer. That's when my phone started to ring. I picked it up and it was yet another guy from the agency. This new agent asked me whether or not I could come and do the interview. I said maybe and bid him farewell. It was about here that my gut instinct started to kick in. Why would they set up an interview so late at night? And I googled the address and it was in an industrial park by the airport. I chose not to answer the onslaught of emails, Facebook messages, and phone calls that I was getting. This went on for about a week before I got radio silence. The guy on my Facebook blocked me, there were no more emails or calls. It was at this point I began to worry. What if I had allowed my career to not even blossom, let alone flourish? What if I had made a mistake? I was already in hot water with my father for telling my mom off at the mall the first time. So with school in my mind, I allowed the idea to fade from my mind of what could have been. About two weeks later, our home phone started to ring. My father answered the phone and as soon as he started listening to the message, his face became ash and he instantly hung up the phone, turning me to demand what I had done. I tried to feign innocence, but I knew the jig was up. We had just gotten a phone call from the Portland Police Department to warn our family about a ring of traffickers who were targeting young girls with promises of modeling and acting. They had stumbled upon the name of one of the men who worked for the ring and through that started contacting families of young women whose information they had gotten a hold of. The worst part of it all, they had my family's address and home phone number as well. I was grounded for the rest of the year, which was to be expected, but it was better than being carted off to some trafficking ring, so I couldn't complain. When I was finally allowed back to the mall with my friends, we walked by the kiosk where the modeling agent once peddled his false hopes and dreams. All that was left was an empty booth. This happened about four years ago. I had just graduated from high school and was a month and a half into summer break. Needing money for college, I began working full time for the school district I had just graduated from. Due to a music festival I wanted to attend as well as monetary concerns, I did not go with my family to North Carolina, which was fine by me. What 18 year old doesn't want a house to themselves for a week? Furthermore, my parents' house is out in the country, so I had little to no fear about my neighbors complaining about parties or being bothered in any way whatsoever. But I was wrong. I often take the back roads home from my friend's house, but on that night I decided I wanted some McDonald's, so I took the main drag and came home on a different route. This way takes you past a mechanic shop not a mile away from our cul-de-sac. It was between midnight and 1am and as I passed the mechanic shop I noticed a car's lights turning on. Or should I say light, for this car had only one headlight working. I remember thinking that it was strange that this car all of a sudden turned its lights on as I was passing, and began to become even more concerned when it pulled out behind me. But I tend to be paranoid by nature, nothing serious but I always question the person behind me is following me and whether they mean me harm, so I brushed this off as an unfortunate coincidence. But as I neared my street and the car was still tailing me, I started to become freaked out. I looked at my gas tank and my heart sunk as I saw I was on E. Either I pull up my street and go home, or I risk driving around some and seeing if this dude follows. Yet that option held the risk of my car running out of gas and leaving me stranded on the road and I figured I'd rather take my chances on my own soil than on the side of some dark and lonely country back road. So I turned onto my street only to have my heart sink when the one headlamped car makes the turn right behind me. At this point I know I'm screwed. With nothing left to do I began pulling up my driveway. It's a hill about 100 yards long. To my utter horror they begin to follow me up. Looking back, I should have called the cops, but there was no love lost between law enforcement and myself and at the time, I was too caught up to even consider calling them. If my family would have been home, this would have never happened. I could have called my dad and he could have grabbed his gun, but he along with the rest of my family were gone, 12 hours away at the beach. So when they began to drive up my driveway after me, I stopped to put my car in reverse. They responded my reversing as well, yet they stopped at the bottom, effectively blocking my driveway. At this point, I pulled forward again only to have the same jig and dance happen. They followed, I reversed, they reversed, and sat at the end, blocking my escape. I quickly pulled up and turned my car around to come at them head on. By this time, they were halfway up my driveway, the furthest they had come up. Looking back, I was terrified, alone, and angry. Who did this person think they were? With my brights on and shining right into their face, I opened my car door and got out. I pulled out my pocket knife and held it in my left hand while I grabbed my hammer in my right. I used to keep one in between my sear and door. 
In some weird desperate mindset, I made a split second decision to grab the hammer from the head with the handle sticking out. My hope was that it would be mistaken as a gun. I began yelling at points of my hammer slash gun at the car, screaming at them to get out and what do you want? All the while, I held my hammer as a gun and prayed they would fall for it. Whether they did or not, I cannot say. Part of me believes they thought it was a gun due to my brights being behind me making my whole front side a shadow, yet they could have just not wanted a fight. Perhaps they thought I was a girl or was timid and wouldn't resist so aggressively and violently. Who knows, but it would. Worked. They slowly backed out of my driveway and crept around the cul-de-sac. As they were leaving my street, I ran after them hiding behind my neighbor's houses and at every driveway the car would slow down to a near stop, as if scoping out the houses. Thankfully, they didn't pull into any driveways and they turned off my street altogether. After I was safely in my house, I ate my McDonald's by the front window with all the lights turned off, waiting to see if they'd come creeping back. Thankfully, they didn't, but that night I locked every door in the house, which I always did anyways, and slept with a hammer, machete, and baseball bat next to me and my pocket knife under the pillow. Complete overkill I know, but I was terrified. Now I know where my dad keeps his gun, so if it ever happens again, I'll be better prepared. Last year, I was dog sitting for my aunt. The dog is small, sweet, and a little skittish. I had worked most of the week, so I was just living in the house for the time being. It's a nice house, not big enough to feel empty if you're alone, but not small enough to feel cramped. The only rooms I used were the kitchen, bathroom, living room, and the guest bedroom. My last day of work this particular week was a double shift. I was excited because after this I had two days off. I planned on using them to introduce the dog to RuPaul's Drag Race. I usually try to keep good spirits for a double shift because regardless of the time and annoying customers, extra money is always needed. My old job was a barista and cashier. Mornings are always busy and nights are slow. On weekends, people are more concerned with coffee and breakfast than anything else we may have to offer. I was having a nice time, actually, because this day was turning out to be not as hectic as the previous ones that week, one even involving a small fire. As the morning rush line was dwindling, the limited tables in the restaurant came into view and I started people watching. As I slowly scanned the customers eating bagels and reading the paper, my eyes met a man at a laptop. He had long, dirty hair and a bit of a stubble. He stared at me with a little too much intensity. I wondered if he found my people watching rude, so I decided to clean and restock instead. It didn't take long for a line to reform, so I returned to my register. Once again, after the line died down, I could see the few tables in the front. The man was still there and he was still staring at me. Every now and then he would look at his computer and then back to me. It almost felt like he was looking right through me, or like he could see every part of me. It felt so uncomfortable that I went and cleaned in the back of the restaurant, out of his sight. After the next rush, I took my break and sat far away from the man. He was out of sight and I was out of his. When I came back from the break, the man was gone. My manager asked if I had interacted with him at all. I told her about him making eye contact with me, but that nothing else really happened. She told me that the man had been watching 18 plus content on his laptop and she had asked him to leave. So that was weird enough. The man had been watching that and stared at me. I really wish that this is where the story stopped. Hours passed and the rest of the day was entirely normal, despite me and a few female co-workers feeling a slight edge. We were in the process of closing, which is actually a process I really enjoy. We're well in and I'm almost done with my assigned jobs when my manager comes up to me again. She informs me that the man had found his way back in the restaurant at some point and she found him hiding in a back corner. She chased him out by threatening to call the police. She knew that earlier in the day, he seemed to be paying attention to me. She said I could finish up whatever I wanted or needed to, but afterwards she strongly advised me to get home as soon as possible. She also offered to walk me to my car. I took both offers and quickly got my things together and clocked out. My aunt's house was not far from work. It was a 5 minute drive at most, which was helpful because then I didn't feel the crippling anxiety for much longer. I got in the house and after triple checking that I had locked every door, got into my pajamas. But unsurprisingly, I was not ready to sleep yet. Now was the time to introduce the dog to RuPaul's Drag Race. I went into the living room. The living room consists of a couch, two chairs, a TV, a window, and the front door. Unfortunately, the porch light was broken and the window had no curtains. That had me a little stressed, but I was willing to take that over the only other TV in the house, which was the one that exists in the scary basement. Facing the basement TV included having my back to a sudden glass door facing the very dark woods. No thanks. I was setting up the TV when the dog started growling. I really didn't think much of it. As I said, the dog is skittish so he growls and barks all the time. I wasn't looking at him. I was muttering shush shush and figuring out how to work the TV. The dog didn't stop and started to get louder so I finally put down the remote and I turned to face the dog. I froze. The dog was barking at the window and there was an outline of a man at the window. The exact same build as the one at the restaurant. I screamed and luckily that was enough for the man to run away from the window. I stood there frozen for a while. The dog had calmed down but I hardly felt safe. So I went into the kitchen, grabbed a big knife and called my mom. She did not advise calling the police, my mom never does, and instead came and spent the night with me. I told my aunt. 
I spent the rest of my time dog sitting clutching the knife anytime I slept or took a shower. My aunt also gave me permission to have one friend stay with me every night. Nothing else ever happened. I never even saw the guy come into work again. A part of me wishes I knew who he was or where he went, or what he even wanted with me. I'm glad he was a coward and that all it took to scare him off was my scream and an extra small dog. The year was 1995 and I was 16 years old. I lived in a three bedroom, tooth bath house in a middle class suburban community with my mother, two younger brothers, and our 140 pound Doberman, Turbo. From the front door of our house, relevant, you could see directly into our living room which had an open concept floor plan with the kitchen and dining room. Our couch was on the wall directly in front of the front door. It was the summer between my sophomore and junior years in high school. My brothers and I spent a decent amount of time outdoors. I suppose anyone paying attention knew who lived in our house, and I suppose they knew that the only adult was gone when the only car was gone. However, prior to the man showing up at the house, I never noticed anything off, and I never noticed anything afterwards, so maybe we were just a random target. It was a Saturday and mom and the boys had run to the grocery store. In Nevada in the 90s, almost no one had air conditioning, so to cool off, you would open up all the windows and doors and use fans. On this particular day, I had the back sliding door and front door wide open to get a cross breeze. Neither screen door was locked. I was napping on the couch in full view of the front door in shorts and a tank top, with unlocked doors. In my defense, there was 140 pounds of protective dog muscle on the floor next to me, and probably only for that reason am I alive. Around the approximate time I expected my family home from the store, Turbo began barking. Assuming he was barking their arrival, I told him to shush and try to go back to sleep. Turbo continued to bark, becoming more and more intense and even aggressive with his barking. Finally, after 5 to 10 minutes of Turbo refusing to quiet and my family never coming in from the car, I sat up, realizing something was wrong. A man who I didn't know stood, seemingly frozen, staring at my frenzied and barking Doberman. Assuming that the man had some appropriate business at my home, I hurried the 10 steps to the unlocked screen door, constantly shushing Turbo. I apologized for my dog and for not hearing his knock. He never knocked. The man explained that he was from the phone company and he was here to check our lines. He never took his eyes off Turbo. Turbo never stopped snarling. I leaned forward far enough to see the street. Only unmarked, privately owned cars lined the street. I looked at the man who was dressed in tennis shoes, jeans, and a t-shirt. I was 16 and dumb enough to nap in front of an unlocked door, but I was no fool. Phone company personnel A, always wear uniforms, B, always drive company vehicles, and C, don't come without being called, and D, don't work weekends. I looked at the man who had yet to look up from the 140 pound dog that was now foaming at the mouth. I grasped the screen door handle and held it. This got his attention. He met my eyes as I said, you have 30 seconds to show me identification or I'll open this door. I don't even think he made an incoherent excuse as he ran away. I fell to my knees and hugged Turbo. I then gave him all the meat in the fridge. I believe with absolute certainty that I would have been attacked if we hadn't had him. I like to think that if I hadn't had a huge, overly protective dog, I would have been in the habit of locking doors. But what would a screen door latch do against an intruder? And that creep stood there and watched me for 5-10 to 10 minutes. Perhaps he was paralyzed in fear, but maybe he was working his angles and only Turbo's insistent display of his willingness to kill anyone who threatened to be changed his mind. That that's my theory. Turbo is long past, but his legacy lives on, and two loving, loyal, and lethal, when necessary, dogs sleep in my room every night. For context, I'm a 5'3", 24-year-old female and working as a programmer for an IT company in the Philippines. Now the area where my office is in compromises of three buildings, Building A, where my office is in, Building B, and Building C. To get to the other building, it would take you like around 10 minutes to get there, important for later. This happened to me a year ago around the end of February until March. I just got out of a bad breakup at the time and I really intended it just to focus on myself and not meet anyone yet. I just got out of work and it's around 7pm on a Friday night and went to my usual waiting spot, which has benches and is located at the back of our building near the entrance of the underground parking, for our company shuttle and Omar shuttle dispatcher is there. Now, I've known Omar for two years and is someone I consider now as a friend and we've been often chat about our lives, even the breakup with my ex then, and joke around. He's a 40 plus year old guy and he gives out this big fatherly vibe so he's really someone that I trust. That night, he was there and with someone new that I didn't recognize, our conversation went like this. Omar, oh hi, good thing you're here, I would like you to meet someone since he told me he already wants to meet you for a long time now. And then this guy stood up and shook my hand. I greeted him as just to be polite and this new guy, let's name him Ray. He's average looking and a little shorter to my height, 5 foot 1 I think. 
and he instantly gave off an all five as soon as I shook his hand. I thought that would be the end of it, but he proceeded to talk to me for a few minutes while I wait for my shuttle to arrive. Omar has purposely left me and this Ray guy so that we could talk and get to know each other. I'm actually puzzled at this point because, one, I have no clue who this guy is and why he would be so eager to meet me, and two, I clearly told Omar before that I'm not into meeting anyone just yet. But for the sake of being polite and nice, I talked to Ray but we never reached any personal questions, exchanging numbers, social media accounts, or even telling him my full name. I just told him my nickname, and I left it just as that when I finally got on the shuttle. Fast forward to a week and Friday again, I got off at work in the same time and surprise surprise, Ray is there again with Omar and his security guard. They were chatting but as soon as I came, Ray instantly greeted me and at this point, I'm a little creeped out as I expected our encounter would only be a one time thing. I just said hi and brushed him off and sat on the benches to wait for my shuttle again and of course, as this guy doesn't seem to know the definition of personal space, sat beside me and talked to me again but this time he's asking for my cell phone number. I told him off and clearly said that I'm not giving out my number to strangers and just giving him one word answers just to give an impression that I wasn't interested at all. He would ask, why wouldn't you give your number, I just want to be friends. And I could see it in his face that he was getting frustrated every time I told him I wasn't giving it to him. This happened while Omar and the security guard was looking at us from afar, but this went on until I got on the shuttle again. As soon as I got home, I mindlessly scrolled through my timeline and saw a notification that I have a new friend request and guess what? It's Ray and he even messaged me with a, please accept my friend request. I just deleted his request, but now I'm pretty shocked since I didn't tell him my Facebook account, so how did he manage to find me? The following day was the last straw when I decided to get off at an earlier time so that I could avoid him, but to my surprise, he was there, again waiting for me, along with Omar and the security guard. Ray immediately ran up to me to say hi, but I brushed him off and dreaded the fact that I would have to wait with this creep again when I saw my shuttle isn't there yet. He immediately asked me if I accepted his Facebook request and I decided to play dumb and said I haven't been active on Facebook and I haven't seen any requests. He got disappointed and he fiddled with his phone for a bit and then revealed his phone to show my Facebook profile and asked me if this was me. I said yes, and this time, I was completely ignoring him at this point and playing with my phone and told him that I wasn't going to accept his request because I don't know him. And then Ray grabbed my phone out of my hands angrily and said he was going to add himself using my Facebook account if I won't. I muttered a what the and grabbed my phone from him and with perfect timing, I got on the shuttle in a hurry and told the driver to go. At this point, I could confirm that this guy could be stalking me and now knows my daily schedule and social media accounts. I reported this incident to my manager and told her how this was already happening for some time now. She was surprised that I didn't report it earlier but I blamed it on my lack of assertiveness and fear that I might be overreacting to his advances. We reported the incident to office security and told them what happened and they couldn't do anything at first as, one, I need actual evidence about my allegations to him, and two, I only knew Ray by his first name and they would need more information than that. I didn't bother to ask where he's from or if he's even working in our office slash building which is dumb of me and I should have asked in the first place. My manager then decided that I should be at least accompanied by some of my office mates to confirm the situation and the guys volunteered to accompany me every time I got off work. They accompanied me for a couple days and no matter what time I got out, Ray was there to harass me. I felt bad for my office mates as they had to deal with his BS as well. First instance when he saw I was with my office mates, I could see the visible anger in his eyes and he would try to butt in our conversation even if we were ignoring him. At one point when I'm talking with my office mates, he let out an exasperated sigh and said, Can I talk to you for a second please? What do you want? I just want to talk to you. If you don't, I'll leave. Okay, and then I went back to talking to my office mates. He butted in once more and asked that I should introduce him to my office mates when I didn't. He proceeded to introduce himself instead which irked the heck out of my office mates and I as his behavior doesn't seem normal at all. After that incident, my office mates and I told my manager what happened and how dangerous this guy might be. She decided that we should escalate it to HR and have them deal with it immediately. Gladly, HR responded and took the situation seriously and began to do an investigation on who Ray might be. Same day, they sent an email that after searching through records, turns out Ray wasn't an employee at our office and they might need to talk to building security to find out more about this guy. HR also requested our office security to escort me and observe the situation. I honestly felt relieved as now I'll feel safe for the time being while they search for who Ray might be. He still showed up even if I got out late or earlier than usual, but never went near me when he saw I was accompanied by security, but he would just keep his distance and stare at me, smile creepily, and linger outside my shuttle until it left. HR contacted me for a meeting with him and my manager about some news on Ray and I was shocked by the information that they found out. Ray was not an employee of our building slash office, but in fact, 
attempt in the security office of building C. I then thought, okay, this creep is really putting an effort for someone who is clearly not interested and if he's attempt meaning there's a chance I won't be able to see him after this. But then what HR said chilled me to the bone. He was a temp assigned to work on the security cameras meaning he had access to all the building cameras. It has been his way to spy on me and the reason why he was able to be there at the exact same time I got out. HR has already spoken to his supervisor and gave a warning to Ray and of course, Ray denied the allegations even if I had witnesses against him. The supervisor wanted to apologize to me in person but I decided not to as I just wanted this to be over with. After that meeting, I never saw Ray again and I reckon he must have been kicked out after HR issued warning against him. As for Omar, I never seen him as well and I felt bad but he was also part of the people who enabled Ray and didn't do anything when I was clearly getting harassed. I received received a bit of backlash from the security guards at the building for a while as well. Hearing them say that I was overreacting and I should have accepted his advances, which was disgusting, as I heard the same thing being said by female building staff as well. Nothing strange happened for a few days, but then the security guard that was with Omar at the time, when Ray was harassing me, added me on Facebook, but I didn't make much of it and just deleted the request. I'm still working in the same office and building as of today and been totally shaken up by the incident that I decided just to keep my distance from people so I could avoid from this ever happening again and to Ray, please don't meet me again. This story is of my brief friendship with a guy that near stalked me, and I'm sharing it for some closure, I think. I started my freshman year of college at a university in my hometown that's pretty nice. I'm not going to share too much about it, but it has a smaller amount of students but enough that you don't really run into people often. I lived on campus and I was only 17 at the time. I had Tinder of course, as I was fresh out of a relationship and looking to experience new things in college. I matched with this one boy, Asher, who seemed nice enough. Pretty socially awkward, but I never really minded because I have anxiety issues myself and I'm really sympathetic to it. Because of that, I ignored a lot of warning signs I shouldn't have. We texted for a while and he seemed really nice and caring. He wanted to know a lot about me, which I wasn't too keen on sharing, but I told him the basics and we texted kind of regularly. He lived on campus as well and invited me to hang out. At that time, things didn't seem too sketchy so I was completely down. When I first met him, that's when things started to get uncomfortable. We hung out in his dorm, which is pretty standard overall. I got cozy with him on his couch. I'd say almost cuddling, but not quite. Still, really standard. When we started talking more, I realized how uncomfortable things really were. He kept making comments that just put me off, but I tried to ignore them. Things like, I've never really cuddled with anyone before, sorry if I'm doing it wrong, and so many comments about how he already liked me a lot and wanted me to stay forever. Weird word choice, but whatever, he's just trying to be nice, I let him down easy. I ended that hangout pretty quickly for some fake excuse, and went right back to my room. He kept texting me, professing how much he was into me, and I told him sorry, but I'm not looking for any kind of relationship, so I do not want to keep things romantic. A bad lie, but I'm very non-confrontational and I didn't want to be mean. That's when things started to get really weird. He sent me this long paragraph saying about how it was okay I didn't want a relationship now, and that he'd wait for me to save his virginity for me. We had never talked about anything sexual, I had never really even told him I liked him or flirted back. I just never turned him down. It was one of the creepiest messages I've ever received. Unfortunately, this was just the start of all the things we were to come. He wouldn't leave me alone even though I kept trying to de-escalate things, and I kept running into him all over campus. I wasn't sure how he suddenly was nearby when my classes ended, and I wasn't sure why suddenly we'd both be in the dining hall at the same times, even though I hadn't changed my regular routine, but I just tried to brush it off. Definitely a mistake. I ended up turning him down completely because I was getting creeped out and couldn't figure out how he wasn't understanding that I didn't want anything romantic or sexual with him, telling me how he was going to off himself and no one was ever going to love him. I've been in a manipulative relationship in the past, and I recognized that behavior right away and shut it down. I told him I couldn't be friends with him, and in my head that was that. He didn't reply for a while, but when he did, everything broke loose. I was luckily out of town at the time for a concert, so that made me feel a lot better. He went off, sent me paragraphs after paragraph about how horrible of a person I was, and how I needed to get put in my place, etc. I could handle that, I just ignored it. Then, once the regrets set in, he made it his mission to win my love however possible. He apologized profusely, told me how he couldn't be all alone and I was his only friend, and how much he loved me. Whatever, terrible, but I didn't care about that. Then, I guess to prove his dedication, he did the creepiest thing yet. First, he told me he was outside my room. We did not live in the same dorm building, and you can't get into the buildings unless you live there. I don't know who let him in. I wasn't there, and my roommate was out, so that was okay. I texted back at that point and told him to leave and how wrong and creepy that was, and he pulled out his last resort. He just sent me screenshots of my contact in his phone. On Apple devices, you could fill in tons of information and have a note section. Everything was entirely full. He knew my home address, my room number at campus, my parents' and brothers' names, 
my pets' names, my schedule. It was terrifying because I'm a fairly private person. My Instagram is my only social media and I do not share that much on it. I don't think I'll ever find out how he discovered all that about me. I blocked him on everything right away and reported him to school. The school did nothing at all. I still see him on campus, but it seems like he doesn't care about me any more gladly. I was around 16 years old when this happened to me. It was just me and my dad at our house, and since he was a businessman that traveled frequently, I was left home alone quite often. First of all, I'm going to try to do my best to describe you the layout of my house so you can better understand my situation. My house is pretty small since it's just my father, my dog, and me living in it. There's a long hallway full of full-size windows separating my dad's room and mine. Our dog loved to look out the windows, so we always kept them open enough for her to look out. I'm the last room at the end of the hallway, In between the two rooms is my bathroom and a spare room. All the rest is irrelevant. Let's get to it. It was around 11pm when the worst night of my life began. My dad was passed out in bed after a long day, and I was mindlessly dancing around my house getting ready for bed. I just hopped in my shower, not knowing what was coming ahead, when my dog starts aggressively barking up a storm. I walk out the bathroom and go out and explore. I head to my room to throw some clothes on while my dog is still barking. Months before, I'm not sure how I managed to break my door handle, but you don't have to twist the knob to open it. All it needs is a small push. Scared, I barely managed to put a shirt on when my dog opened the door. I looked to see her enter my room, while in the midst of barking that's when I saw it. There's only one window that has vision to the opening of my room, and in the corner of it I saw a face. It was dark, so I took a second to comprehend what I just saw, but when I finally realized it, I screamed. My dad owns lots of guns, so when he heard me scream, he ran out with a pistol. He asked me what happened and could barely mutter what I saw. He ran outside to see if the man with the terrifying face was still near. We stood out there for maybe a minute scanning the area. A man was casually strolling towards us from the opposite direction from about 100 yards away. I knew it was him. I got that feeling in my stomach that you can't mistake. It was like he was trying to cover up that he was there by coming from a different direction. But he didn't fool me. You better stay away from my daughter. You see what I have here, you know what this does. Holding up his gun, I could have sworn my dad was going to shoot. The man brushed these threats off easily. My dad and I went back inside. He went back to bed like nothing had happened, but I could not sleep a week. I kept thinking he was going to come back and hurt me because of the threats to him. We called the cops the next morning and they came and scrubbed out our house. He looked around the house trying to calm me down but I was still pretty shaken up. He went to the front yard and that's when he saw it. In front of the windows in the long hallway there were small bushes, nothing much. The cop from outside went to the window that had view of my room and there it was. If he tried to tell me the news without making me more upset, he failed. There were incidents in the dirt right in front of the window. That meant he knew where he needed to look for you and it seems as if he had come here more than once because of the broken pieces of bush and the divots in the ground. Turns out he was the nephew of my old neighbor and he had been staying there for months. Never rested, never got in trouble, probably barely got a slap on the wrist. But at least he's gone now. How long had he been watching me, I'll never know. All I know is I keep my door shut and I never keep the blinds open. To begin, I've always had this feeling that someone was watching me ever since I moved into my family house 8 years ago. At first I thought I was just being paranoid, but I could not help looking over my shoulder when I would walk to school or to my bus stop. When I would walk to school, I was always scared in the mornings when it would be dark during the winter or fall because where I live is just fast country lands. I live in Canada and although not much crime happens in my neighborhood, I never could rid myself of this eerie feeling. Even when I would come home from school, being home alone did not help. I would triple check my windows and locks to make sure everything was locked. However, in my basement, our garage door would never fully lock since the door hinge was broken and detached from the door, therefore it would never properly close. I always told my dad to fix this door but because he would always go away for work, he never found the time to do so. Stupidly, I thought nothing bad would happen since my garage needed a 4 digit passcode to get in. Now my theory is that he knew the passcode of my house, therefore he had free reign for 7 years to go through my things. At first I thought I was being forgetful. Maybe I was the one who misplaced my underwear somewhere. Maybe I was the one who misplaced my favorite top or maybe my dad accidentally donated it. But I should have known better. During my 4 years in high school, he never really contacted me. It was when I went to university that things started to change. Since I live in the countryside, I decided to go to a university an hour away. My dad did not want me to live on residence because he didn't want to leave the house unattended for long periods of time. So we came to the conclusion that it would be the best if I drive to and from school. Now I would leave for university very early in the morning, around 6am, and come back around 6pm at night. I stopped being aware of my surroundings at this time because I would be tired from my 12 hour days and now that I wasn't walking alone everything would be fine. When I would come home from university, I would find certain things moved in my house. I am a neat freak and I like things a particular way in my house. 
When little things like my makeup or candles would be moved, I thought it was odd and would frequently bring it up to my dad, but he would just say that it must have been me who was doing it, but it wasn't me. During my second and third year in university, I started getting weird notes in my mailbox. The writing on these notes looked almost childlike and it would always be written in blue ink. I have those country style mailboxes at the end of my driveway where the little red flag goes up whenever we get mail. From my way back from university, I would always check the mail and sometimes I would find these letters. The letters would never be long. In fact, they would only be one of three sentences that would contain odd questions like, Where are you? I wonder what you do while you're away from home. How do you find university? It must be tiring driving that long. Did you make new friends? Do you still hang out with your best friend? You dress differently now. Why is that? I miss the scarves you used to wear. You don't close your curtains as much anymore. Why don't you look for me? These letters would always come once a month at the beginning of the month. I would show my dad and at first he would say, oh maybe your cousins are just pranking you or it's probably your friends. But every time I would ask my friends or cousins, they would give me this confused response saying that they never sent me any letters. Now that I am in my fourth year at university, the letters do not come as frequently but two weeks ago something happened that makes me think that things are escalating. I came back home from university at 7.45pm and it was fairly dark outside. I saw that my mailbox flag was up so I checked the mail and it was just bills. At this point, I haven't gotten a note for a little over three months now, so I am thinking maybe the notes will not come anymore. As I settle in for bed, I change into my pajamas, and I check the locks usually. As I checked my front door lock, I look out the glass panel on my door, and I saw that the red flag on my mailbox is up. It's 10.30 at night, so no way the mail could have gotten dropped off, and plus I just checked the mail. I call my dad and tell him about it, and he said not to freak out, and that maybe one of our neighbors accidentally got our mail, and just dropped it off since this happens frequently. I stay on the phone with my dad, and quickly run down my driveway to check my mailbox. As I open the mailbox, I feel my heart drop because it's an unmarked manila envelope. I quickly run back inside and open the manila envelope and although there is no written note, I find something more disturbing. It is a pair of my old blue panties that I haven't seen in years. At this point I scream and my dad tells me to hang up and call my aunt who is a police officer. My aunt comes over and checks the inside and outside of my house but she can't find anything. She tries to jog my memory and ask if I know anyone who could be doing this but I honestly have no clue. My aunt told me to keep any more letters I get and she has been staying with me the days my dad is out for work. I just hope that we're able to find whoever this is. About two years ago when I was 17, I received a Facebook message from someone named Dan who I didn't recognize. I had mutual friends with him and he looked to be around the same age as me so I wasn't alarmed. What follows is the messages. Dan, hello, have you been? Haven't seen you in a few years. Me, hi, not trying to be rude but do we know each other? Dan, um, yeah, you really don't know me? I didn't respond. Dan, wow, real nice way to treat a family friend. Me, sorry, I just don't recognize you. Dan then sent a picture of me and him together from when we were little. And I mean really little. Like I looked maybe two or three and he looked five or six. Me, oh wow, did our parents used to be friends or something? Dan, I was your neighbor. You really don't recognize me. Come on, I didn't move that long ago. He had, in fact, moved a long time ago. At least 12 years ago. So I honestly feel like it's not that uncommon for me to not recognize someone who I hadn't seen or talked about since I was four. Anyways, the conversation continued like that. I apologized for not remembering him and just started catching up. He was being nice enough and I was bored, so whatever, no harm, no foul. After we kept talking, I started remembering more about him. Like I remembered him coming over and swinging in my backyard and me going over to his house with my big brother and all of us hanging out together. Dan was a few years older than me, at least two, but I can't remember exactly. Anyways, we kept talking on Facebook, just messaging back and forth about normal things until it started to get late and I was tired and at school the next day, so I told him I was going to bed. I closed my computer and just laid down and went to sleep. The next morning, I woke up to a bunch of messages from him. Things like, good night beautiful, and sweet dreams, message me when you wake up, are you asleep yet, can't wait to talk to you. Literally there was almost 50 messages. I was creeped out but I opened the messages and glanced through them and just didn't reply. On my phone, I have it set to where I don't get notifications from Facebook Messenger. At the time, I was in a lot of group chats with different team sports and group of friends, so it was just easier to, at the end of the day, check my messages versus getting a ton of notifications all day long. Some point during the day, I had gotten more messages from him that I just hadn't noticed while I was at school. He was saying stuff like, do you still live at insert address here? I did still live there. Does your mom still freak out about you hanging with boys? My mom has never freaked out over boys. Let's go out and catch up. Let me take you out and treat you right. It just kept going on and on with really random questions that weren't necessarily threatening but just somewhat creepy. He then talked about wanting to go on dates even though he didn't even live in the same state anymore that I live in so I have no idea how he would have planned on going on dates with me. The messages just kept continuing over the next week him telling me he wants to go on dates and asking me really weird questions about my mom, my brother, and my house and then he started asking about his house that he used to live in. I didn't reply to any of his messages but I was getting at least 50 a day. 
Eventually, I brought it up to my mom and just asked her if she remembered Dan from next door. Her face completely drained of color and she got super serious all of a sudden and she asked me why I was bringing him up. I told her that he had messaged me on Facebook and was trying to get me to go out on a date with him and was just trying to catch up. I didn't tell her he'd been messaging me 50 plus times a day and I wasn't responding at this point. She told me to block him and never message him again. I asked her why and this is a summary of what she told me. When I was 3 or 4 I used to play over at his house a lot. His mom would always offer to babysit me if my mom had to go out and run errands and he also had a little sister who was around my age so my mom figured it was a perfect opportunity for a play date between Dan, my brother, me, and Dan's little sister. One day when I came home after one of these play dates, my mom was asking me and my brother what we had done that day. My brother started talking about how he had watched some movie. I apparently told my mom that Dan had brushed my hair for me. My mom thought that was a little weird that a 6 year old boy wanted to brush a 3 year old girl's hair so she asked a couple more questions and it came out that he wasn't brushing my hair. He had been taking a brush and was rubbing it all over my body while I was only in my undies. My brother didn't know anything about this because we had been in Dan's room and my brother had been in the living room with Dan's little sister. After that my mom didn't let me go back over to his house. Apparently when my mom confronted his mom about it, a huge fight broke out. Not physically, but a screaming match. It turns out that Dan had been doing similar stuff to his little sister, but it had escalated farther than that with me. My mom threatened to report them to the police or Child Protective Services. She did both, but before much could be done, they moved out and found somewhere else to live. They were renting the house. After hearing that from my mom, I immediately blocked Dan on Facebook. I wasn't quick enough, I guess, however, because he messaged a bunch of my friends on Facebook asking about me and had changed his relationship status to take it and in a relationship with me. He then followed me on Instagram and found my Snapchat somehow. He liked and commented on almost all of my Instagram pictures and sent me a bunch of Snapchats. I quickly blocked him on both and luckily he never figured out my phone number. Luckily I haven't heard from him since. We were both 16 and 13 respectfully. My sister and I were home alone while my parents were out of state for a couple of days to attend the funeral of a longtime family friend. Our grandfather lived only a couple miles away and was originally supposed to babysit us, but he trusted my sister and I would be fine, and he would be on call if anything were to go bad. Well, of course, something did. Just our luck. It was around 10pm or somewhere close to that on the second night and I was upstairs in my bed trying to sleep after a long day of biking around with a couple of friends. My sister suddenly came running up the stairs which she almost never did unless she was in a hurry for some reason. She came into my room and was frantically talking to someone on the phone. I lied there in confusion while she talked. I don't remember exactly what was said, but when she hung up, she hugged me and told me that everything was alright and that grandpa was on his way. What had happened was that my sister was sitting outside on our stoop talking to a friend of hers on the phone when a pickup truck came rolling onto our driveway. My parents don't own a pickup so I immediately threw up a red flag. Once she saw a man get out carrying a duffel bag, that's when she came running inside and called our grandfather. My grandfather may have been 60 at the time, but he's no pushover. Being 6 foot 4 and having the strength of Godzilla with a demeanor to match when it comes to protecting his loved ones. He also owns firearms, which I wouldn't doubt for a second he would bring alone in case something really hit the fan. We also lived in an area where the police would take a bit of time to reach, which is another reason why my sister called him and not the authorities. Suddenly, we hear what sounds like a door being kicked open downstairs. Almost immediately afterwards, we began barricading my bedroom door. Since none of the bedroom doors had locks them at the time. Once we're done, she looks at the window while I sit there, covering myself with my blanket, all the while we hear footsteps downstairs on our hardwood kitchen floor. My sister then looked around my room and asked if I had a bat or something, which I did in my closet. My Louisville slugger that I used when my parents made me play baseball when I was in elementary school. I also had a hockey stick, but who would use that as a weapon unless in a very circumstantial situation? She rummaged through my closet and found it, then stood next to the door while I ducked down behind her, thinking maybe I should grab the hockey stick, but it's much less intimidating than a bat. Unless this burglar has some sort of PTSD associated with hockey, then this is the ultimate weapon. We then hear the sound of a gunshot followed by a man yelling out in pain. The sound of both I can still hear even to this day when I think about it hard enough. My sister and I are standing by the door, almost sobbing when about a minute later, we then hear my grandfather yell out our names, asking if we were alright to which we both yelled out simultaneously that we were. My sister and I pulled the dresser and various other objects out the way of my door and we both went out into the hallway. We heard my grandfather on the phone with 911 as we stood at the top of the stairs. When the police and ambulance arrived, the man who had broken in was taken out on a stretcher, to which I later learned was shot in the abdomen. My grandfather had come in through the same back door and found the man in our kitchen looking through drawers. When he came at my grandfather with one of our kitchen knives, that's when he was shot. The man almost died from blood loss, but ended up surviving and I hope he's learned his lesson, both through being incarcerated and by being shot in the abdomen and almost losing his life. But, of course, you never know with certain people, especially the nefarious ones.
This all started my sophomore year of high school. I was 15 and at a new school, so I didn't have many friends yet. I was in that phase where I thought I needed a boyfriend to have validation, so I was actively trying to find a date for the homecoming dance. A classmate suggested a junior in one of her classes, whom I will call David, to be my date and got him to ask me out. He seemed nice, so I said yes, a decision that would haunt me for the next two years. David and I had fun at homecoming, so when he asked me to be his girlfriend, I said yes. It's important to know that he was quite the loner. He was very much into science and often spent alone conducting experiments in his room and even at school at times. I just brushed it off as him being quirky and figured I shouldn't get in the way of his passions. But it wasn't long before I realized there was much more to his nice guy facade. Over the first several weeks of our relationship, we would talk over the phone and David would make increasingly inappropriate comments about things he wanted to do to me. I was 15 at the time and he was 17. So not only was I incredibly uncomfortable, but he was also nearly an adult making these comments to a younger girl. I kept telling him I wasn't comfortable with the things he was saying, but he always laughed it off as me being prude. I was fed up after a while and finally threatened to break up with him and that finally made him stop. I should have recognized the red flags and bailed at that moment, but again, I was dumb and felt I wasn't worth anything unless I had a boyfriend. Although the inappropriate comments stopped for the time being, he would still become increasingly possessive and downright obsessed over what I was doing at all hours of the day. He would intrude on conversations I had with my friends and want to know things that frankly weren't any of his business. One day when I was getting into the shower, he called and my dad told him I would call him when I was done. Instead of simply waiting like any rational person would do, he called a total of 4 times over the next 10-15 to 15 minutes to see if I was out of the shower yet. I began to feel suffocated, but every time I asked him to back off, he would cry about how depressed he was and that he only wanted to talk to someone to feel like he was wanted. I always fell for it like the dummy I was, but now I recognized the clear manipulation that it was. One day I finally had enough. I broke up with him in person at school and he bawled like a child. I didn't let it get to me this time however and firmly told him that I didn't want to be his girlfriend anymore. Although he couldn't get his way, he still somehow convinced me to stay friends. I know I was an idiot, but things didn't end there. Over the next several months, David kept trying to get me to go out with him again, even going as far as to cry in front of other people to garner sympathy. Fortunately for me, David had earned a bad reputation throughout his school year, so no one really believed him. He would even try to trick me into a date by subtly suggesting we go see a movie as friends, which I always got around by inviting my friends to come along too. They knew what he was doing and never turned down the chance to help a girl out. In the last few weeks I spoke to him, he would sit on the phone for hours on and literally begging me to take him back, and thankfully I held on strong and kept refusing. One night his brother actually called me telling me he was crying hysterically. Eventually it came to a point where I told him I didn't want to hang out anymore because it was clear that he would not stop until he became his girlfriend again. He agreed to not approach me anymore, but I wouldn't be writing this story if it ended here. The very next day at school, David came up to me like nothing had happened. I once again reminded him of the conversation we had the night before about how we agreed to not hang out anymore, but he acted offended that I would even suggest such a thing. Eventually, my friends and I convinced him to leave, but of course it didn't stop there. For two weeks straight, he would follow me around school, call my house, and my cell phone. For two weeks straight, he would follow me around school and call my house. This was the days before smartphones, so blocking his number wasn't as easy. I tried to get help from the school staff, but the vice principal basically told me that there was nothing I could do because he wasn't trying to hurt me. I was frustrated, but thankfully David seemed to back off when it was clear that I wasn't going to give in. That is until I got another boyfriend. The following school year, my junior year, I started dating a senior named Justin. Not long after we went public with our relationship, I noticed David following me again. Now Justin was a football player and he was a pretty big guy with unresolved anger issues, so he didn't take kindly to this guy. He would hang out with me and my friends and David would hover over nearby, walking by every now and then and making it blatantly obvious that he was spying on me. One day Justin walked straight up to David and confronted him. He didn't lay his hands on him or threaten him in any way, but he did ask, what are you doing, in a really angry tone. David simply muttered some kind of excuse and scurried away. We thought that was the end of it, but later in the day I was called to the principal's office. Turns out David claimed that Justin threatened him and blocked the doorway so he couldn't move. Justin denied it, of course, and told the principal I could back up his claim, which I did. Thankfully, nothing came of it, but this was only the first of a long line of incidents. Over the school year, David and his brother, who was a year younger than me, would try to get Justin in trouble every which way they could, he even started rumors and threatening his life. A classmate of mine overheard them talking about ambushing Justin and hurting him, but even though I brought this to the staff, nothing was done about it. All the while, David kept following me when Justin wasn't around. There was even an incident in the school gym one day when a bunch of classes had to stay there for the period. He and I both were there and he made sure to sit on the bleachers nearby, even following me when I moved. I was on the verge of tears, but then I saw two guys I knew sitting on a few rows down from me. 
They were cool with me, so I got their attention and, after explaining what was going on, asked them if I could sit with them to feel safer. They accepted and we ended up having a good time talking about music. In spite of this, things just kept getting worse with David. Finally, it came to a head when David's brother wrote a letter to Justin's sister. They had been good friends before this whole mess started, and in the letter David's brother threatened physical harm to me and to Justin. The sister gave the letter to Justin, who then came to me and we both brought it to the principal. That was when the principal called everyone involved into his office and had a nice little chat with us. The principal showed the letter to David's brother and said, I can expel you for this right now, but I am willing to let it go on one condition. David and Justin were both about to graduate, so the principal gave him the ultimatum. He stated that David and his brother were not to contact me or Justin in any way, shape, or form for the rest of the school year, or he would see it to that neither of them would graduate. I was pissed because Justin did nothing wrong, but in the end, we just wanted this whole mess to be over with. From that point on, David didn't bother me again, thankfully. Justin and I ended up breaking up that summer for unrelated reasons, and the following year I didn't have to see either of them ever again. A few years later, however, David tried to send me from requests on Facebook. I deleted the request and blocked him. I even unfriended and blocked the two mutual friends we had for good measure. Sure, I was being paranoid, but it made me feel better. There was one last incident involving David not with me, but with my younger brother. When he was 14, he took his then-girlfriend to see one of the Transformer movies and David walked in. Upon recognizing my brother, he sat behind him in his date and kept laughing uncontrollably at inappropriate times and even started kicking their seat. My brother tried confronting him, but it did no good. They didn't bother getting the manager because my brother's date was too afraid he would attack them if they tried to leave. Thankfully, that was the last incident I or anyone close to me ever had with them. I'm doing much better now. I'm 30 years old and, ironically, I ended up marrying one of the guys who sat with me in the gym that day. My advice to any teenagers reading this is that you should always pay attention to red flags and get rid of toxic people in your life. It's always better to end up alone than stuck with someone who makes you feel bad and treats you like your feelings don't matter. This happened a few years ago when I was bartending in college. I was coming home down a stretch of divided highway at around 3am when I noticed a car heading towards me in the wrong lane. I doubted myself at first and thought that the car was on the other side of the highway. Sure enough, the white Ford sedan passed me at a really high speed at around 90 miles per hour. It's worth noting for later that I also drive a white Ford sedan. I was used to drunk slash idiot drivers in the middle of the night so I pulled to the side of the road and let him pass me. I had a moment of clarity and thought to call the police, thinking this person could hurt themselves or somebody else. The dispatcher answered and after telling them which road and exit slash mile marker I was at, told me they would send a car. The state police station was only a few exits away so I figured they would send somebody and I would just drive home. As I headed back onto the highway, I noticed some lights a few miles behind me. I live in a more rural part of southeastern Pennsylvania and traffic at 3am tends to be truckers and cops. The car gained on me as I was getting up to speed so I stayed in the right lane and waited to be passed. Instead, they flipped on their high beams making it uncomfortable to drive and rode my tailgate. At this point, I thought I was going to be pulled over by the police. I drove a white Ford sedan and had just called out a different white Ford sedan, so I grabbed my registration from my glove box. Suddenly, the car behind me audibly slammed on the brakes and stopped in the middle of the highway. They must have shut off their car because the lights went out and I saw what looked like the same Ford sedan from earlier. Still, I thought this may have been a police car. They had a roof rack, and it could have looked like I had reached for a gun in my glove box or something. I panicked and called 911 for the second time and asked the dispatcher if they had sent a cruiser to investigate. The dispatcher was a little curt with me and assured me that they sent somebody out. Dispatcher, we have sent a trooper out to find the car, sir. Me, I only ask because somebody is following me and acting weird. It could be a cop and I think I freaked them out by getting my registration. Dispatcher, are you pulled over? Me, no, they didn't turn on the lights. Dispatcher, let me try to get the trooper we sent out. As she was talking, the car again sped towards me and stopped inches from my bumper. Again, their high beams were on and again they slammed their brakes. I told the dispatcher, I'm pretty sure this is not the police behind me. The car sped to my bumper again and turned their high beams on, this time laying on the horn. Hearing this, the dispatcher asked me what was happening. Dispatcher, what's happening? Did you honk? Me. That's the car behind me. I don't think it's a cop. Dispatcher, I'll try to get the trooper again, but I don't think that's him behind you. For some reason, this is what shook me. Before that, I was thinking I would get pulled over and maybe get a ticket. Up until then, I was going to the speed limit and trying to avoid getting pulled over. I told the dispatcher, I don't care if I get pulled over, I'm speeding and if they put their lights on, then I'll pull over. I started to accelerate and the person behind me just kept up with me. The speed limit was 55 and they kept on my bumper the entire time, but this time they were swerving. I tried to signal for an exit, then bail on it, but they followed. At the next exit, I took the off-ramp and continued onto the on-ramp and the car behind me followed the whole time. I thought about 
trying to go to a Wawa gas station, but the dispatcher and I thought that it would be unsafe. She was calm and talking to another person trying to send police to me. The other person, maybe a supervisor, asked if I could drive to the state police station. Realizing that I was one exit away, I told her I was coming there and she said that she would have troopers meet me outside. As I pulled off to the exit, the car followed me. I blew a few red lights trying to get to the police station and the car tried to pull into the other lane to pass me or pull up alongside me. Once the police station was in view, I put on my turn signal and the car slammed on its brakes again, turned off their lights, and turned into a parking lot. The story ends kind of anticlimactically as I pulled into the police station and met the troopers. Two of them went to find the car and I stayed with the third trooper. I think the dispatcher and her supervisor and the state trooper escorted me home after taking a statement from me. I was never called to follow up or testify so I can only assume the person didn't get caught. I don't drink as a general rule, but once a month or so I'll go out with friends and binge. My friends and I had a great night at a bar in the city and they left. I was chatting up a cute guy so I decided to stay. I went back to his place. After post coitus, I'm ready to head home so I call an Uber to pick me up. I don't know where I am, I know the city I'm in, but not my exact location. I order the Uber, but it's taking forever. So I cancel it and try again. Pretty soon a car pulls up. I drunkenly mumble something like, is this the Uber? And I hop in. Mistake. Ubers apparently are supposed to have some kind of marking on their vehicle. The guy pulls away and starts driving, we're chatting, I'm fumbling for a cigarette, and the next thing I notice is that we're headed for the highway, but in the opposite direction of where I thought we needed to drive, and we're going at a solid 90 miles per hour. Then I get a call from an Uber driver, he's there and I'm not because I'm in the car with someone else. I start texting my friend frantically counting off mile markers for her. Then I realize that's going to do Jack, because she's probably drunk too. So I call 911, but I realize this guy is crazy. He's refusing to let me out of the car, so I've got to do it on the sly. It's been about 40 minutes now, I'm terrified. I don't know where I am, I don't know who this is, we're driving at over 100 miles per hour, weaving in and out of traffic. This guy is trying to get me to hang up my phone call. And also smoking pot, so I don't want to do anything that might provoke a violent reaction from him. I start chatting to the 911 dispatcher as if it's my friend, praying that they'll catch on. Hey girl, it's me. Yeah, I'm with someone right now. We're driving past highway exit. No sweetie, it's not my Uber. I thought it was, but it's not. It's a shame you can't come and meet me and bring friends. Thankfully, the operator catches on. He gets me to stay on the phone while he sends cops, and we develop a code. If I see cops, I'm supposed to casually put my hand out the window, which looks semi-normal because I'm smoking a cigarette. We pull into some random little housing complex, and he busts out some powder and forms two lines. I now have confirmation that he does drugs, which means he's probably emotionally volatile. I relay this to the operator in code, oh girl, I wish you were here right now. This guy just busted out the coke. You'd love it. He's taken a really big bump, man after my own heart, etc. Pretty soon, I can see the lights in the cop car so I start waving my hand out the window. At this point I don't care if he's on to me or not. I don't know if he has a weapon but I slump down on my seat just in case things get hot. The cops surround us, get him out of the car, and then once it's safe they extricate me as well. They whisk me to the hospital for a drug test and evaluation and that's where my story ends. On my way to the hospital, as I'm explaining all of this to the officer, I find out that of the guy's 40-ish years on this earth, he's been in federal prison for 30 of them, for violent offenses. I want people to learn from my mistakes, and if nothing else, call 911 and stay on the line. For background, I'm a 24-year-old woman living in Australia and work in an establishment that caters for an adult audience. One night, as my shift is coming to a close, one of the patrons asked me to buy a drink which I accept because, employer policy. I talk him up to a couple of expensive drinks for the two of us, have a quick conversation, and make my excuses about my shift being over but he should come back to see me soon. He starts to gaze at me and it feels uncomfortable. He stands up and with his creepy grin asks to walk me to my car. I know never to put myself in that position and politely decline and I tell him I might see him next time. I walk out past our biggest bouncer and the guy doesn't follow me. Great, nothing extraordinary, just standard par for the course of my profession. But sadly, this isn't where our story ends. For this creep, it's only just the beginning. I'm off for a week after that night, but when I come back into work, I'm told a patron has been coming in every night for the last week asking for me. He says he wants to buy me another drink. Naively, I think, oh great, a bigger pay this week, and gets set for my shift. Then I rolls on and who should roll in but our man of the hour, and he asks for me. So I saunter over and he buys me a drink. The whole thing I'm sitting there with him, he just has this creepy grin on his face. Not like a normal creepy grin, that's just normal. No, this is the kind of grin where he knows something you don't and is very pleased with himself about that fact. So we're talking and I'm getting him ordering himself drinks and trying to upsell him where I can. About half an hour goes by and I make my excuses to leave so I can try to spread the tips around. But this guy isn't having it, he won't let me leave and the more I insist the angrier he gets. 
He's practically hissy at me by the time I give a look to one of the bouncers, who promptly comes over and defuses the situation, giving me an opportunity to walk away. Great, crisis averted. Wrong. Bouncer doesn't throw him out, just gives me a buffer so this guy starts following me around the place, even attempting to walk into an employee-only area which is where another bouncer finally notices and kicks him out. I finish my shift and walk over to my car. There he is, I kid you not, sitting on the bonnet of my car. How he knew it was my car, I will never know. He wants me to give him a ride and tells me how pretty I look. He's spewing greasy slime ball creep lines at this point and I'm not interested. I try to give him a hint nicely and decline to give him a ride, but again he just turns to me and grabs me by my arm insisting I give him a ride. I tell him to screw off and jam my key in his shoulder as hard as I can. He lets go and I push him with all my might so he falls down. I jump in my car, lock the door, and shove that key in the ignition. He's back up and banging on the window angrily to let him in. And I mean hard, so hard I think his hands or my window might break. I gun the accelerator and I'm out of there. When I get 5 minutes down the road and I'm sure I'm not being followed, I pull over to the side of the road and call back to work. I tell them what's happened and alert them that the other girls need to be careful leaving tonight. As I hang up the phone I break into tears. I eventually compose myself, pull back into the road and head home. I cry myself to sleep. Next morning word has gotten around and owner calls me to make sure I'm okay. I assure him I am but he insists I take some time off in case this creep comes back. He wants to put some distance between us, makes sense. A week goes by, then two, he's coming in every night asking about me and being told I quit and don't work there anymore. I lie to get him to stop coming in, you know, but he just keeps coming in and asking, clearly not buying it and then suddenly two and a half weeks in, he stops. Great, I am really needing money at this point so I'm happy to be able to go back to work the following week. Time goes on and everything seems to go back to normal. Same old chances but the good kind that leads to higher paychecks. Abusive guy doesn't come back in, I'm happy. I start being forgetful though. I think I leave a door closed when I leave the house but it's open when I get back. Lights on or off, food left out, things ending up in different places than I remember putting them sometimes moments before. I'm losing it but it's probably just the stress of everything that's gone down. One of my close friends who works with me reassures me that it's normal after being grabbed like that and it will pass. This keeps up for a month until one day I head out to work, get 15 minutes down the road and realize I forgot some clothes I'll need that night at work. I head back home only to find the lights in my front room on and the TV visible as on from the outside. I really am losing it, good thing I came back I guess. I head inside, grab my stuff, make sure to turn the TV off and the light out and head to the door. Suddenly I freeze. There standing blocking the door is the creep that grabbed me. I'm stunned, jaw dropped on the floor. Then after what seems like a lifetime of standing in silence staring at each other, him smiling, I scream what the, I'm screaming for him to get out and ask him what he's doing here, how he knows where I lived, all in one jumbled mouthful of confusion. He just stands there with that smile on his face while I'm loudly freaking out but stupidly not moving. I start gasping for air in a mixture of panic attack and bewilderment, then he decides to speak in my wake. The words ooze out of him and leave me chilled. Welcome home honey, you're back early. A switch goes off in my head, I throw everything I have on me at him and sprint to the back door. I'm out ski. I leg it faster than I have in my life, screaming bloody murder as I go. I hide in some bushes around the corner, tears running down my face, gasping for air. I check my pocket and my keys are still there. No phone though, I threw that at the stalker creep along with everything else. I sneak back to my house, jump in my car and nope out of there. I head to work, tell them what's happened and call the cops. Cops head to my house and send others to my work. Stalker guy is gone but when they turn up, they search the house and turns out he's been living in my crawl space. I'm paranoid that's what all those doors and lights and misplaced things was about. I pack up whatever I can fit in my car while cops are still there, that they'll let me take and I drive. Haven't been back since. I moved states, knew everything. This happened around 2006, when I was in my mid-twenties and my sister, the unfortunate main character in the story, had just turned 21. At the time, she and her boyfriend lived with my fiancé and I. On weekends, we went out to one of the two bars that had karaoke, air hockey, etc. This particular night, we were at the bar further out from where we lived in the city, a good half an hour by car. Everyone was having drinks, socializing with people we knew. It was one of those places, lots of regulars, singing karaoke, nothing out of the ordinary really. Except that night, my sister started hanging out with these two older ladies who had a liquor store in their purses, and were quite sharing, although I didn't know it at the time. As she tended to drink a lot more than me, that was a score for her. Less money spent on drinks drinks, but she ended up far more hammered than usual. Towards the end of the night, around 1.45, she was really very drunk. The aforementioned fiancé, my sister's boyfriend, and I were in a heated air hockey game, planning to leave as soon as it was over. She walked up to us and said she was going to smoke a cigarette outside. Nothing unusual, everyone did until we were done. 
About 5 minutes later, we paid our tab and walked out, but she was not on the porch area where smokers congregated. Okay, weird, but not alarming. We went out back of the bar to check for her, inside, in the restroom, in the large parking lot. It is notable that this particular bar was in a business park, so there were multiple businesses that were closed, as well as the Mexican restaurant next door that had just closed as well. We searched, asked everyone that knew us and those who didn't if they had seen her. No one had. I asked the workers from the restaurant that were sitting outside as well. They seemed nervous when telling me they hadn't seen her, but I didn't think on that much until later. By then, I was in a full-on panic after trying to call her cell about 15 times only to have it go to voicemail. Being a bit inebriated myself, I started searching for her. Went as far as to take off my heels and start running down the highway searching for her as, honestly, there had been times she would start walking home in the past, though never from this place as it was so far away from where we lived. The fiancé and her boyfriend thought we should go to the house to see if she got someone to bring her home. Seemed unlikely but not unheard of. We get home and she's nowhere to be found. Just as we were about to head back and I was going to phone the police, I received a call from the PD on my phone. They indicated that they had my sister, that there had been an incident, and I needed to get down there. We rushed to the PD where we were taken into a room with my sister. Her face was red from obvious crying and bruises were starting to show on her arms and chest. She said that when she told us she was going outside, she thought we said we were leaving then, so she walked to the car. After a few minutes being drunk and tired, she sat down up against it to wait. A van pulled up and a young man was asking her directions to somewhere. She walked closer to try to explain when suddenly the back door flew open and two other men grabbed her and threw her in, taking off. They were rough with her, hitting her a few times while holding her down, saying they only wanted money. They snatched her purse from her, breaking the straps and searched it, quite haphazardly as they didn't find the $30 she had in it. After driving around a bit speaking in Spanish, she couldn't understand they pulled out a gun, making sure she saw it and put a bandana around her eyes, telling her that they'd let her go. She was driven to some woods by a neighborhood she did not know. The door was opened and they pushed her out, telling her to run, that if she took the blindfold off or turned around, they'd shoot. She ran and ran. Eventually, she did take the blindfold off and came to the first door she saw, beating on it and screaming for help. The police were called, she was picked up and now we are back to my being there, hearing what I feared had happened. Report filed, police did a search and did locate the bandana she ripped off, but as she was so intoxicated and terrified, she was not able to give a clear description of the van other than white older model or the three occupants other than young Hispanic men. The investigation turned up nothing as no cameras caught any of this. We even had detectives in our home who said, look, we need the truth. If you got drunk and just went home with someone and didn't want your boyfriend to find out, we will file charges against you. Aside from the bruises, broken person or trauma, there was nothing concrete to go on. That was unpleasant. I am still fairly convinced someone at the restaurant knew something given their suspicious behaviors when I asked about her, but the police were never able to find that link. All said and done, the guys were never found. Eventually, we just moved on. In different states, it's now just a story in our lives. It still makes me sick thinking of what could have happened, but thankfully, it didn't. A little backstory, I was about 16 at the time, and I rode the public bus to and from school. This particular day, I had done some special effects makeup before the end of my classes, so I had fake blood running down my face and I couldn't be bothered to take it off before leaving school. Now I knew as I was boarding my bus, people would stare or ask questions, so I wasn't surprised when this man, who looked to be in his mid-30s, started asking about the makeup. The conversation was normal at first, just the usual, oh wow, did you do that yourself, kind of stuff. I answered the questions as normally as I would, and expected the conversation to be done and over with. But I was wrong. This man, he mentioned his name was Joe, started steering the conversation into strange territory, asking me if I had a boyfriend, to which I lied and said I did. He then proceeded to ask if my boyfriend liked the makeup and if I was on my way to see him now. I again lied and said he likes the makeup and yes, I was going to see him, trying to get Joe to believe someone was expecting me. The conversation died down for a bit until he said this, you know, you remind me a lot of my sister, he said with a grin. I just smiled a response, not really knowing what to say. After not hearing anything from me, Joe continued, My sister was kind of a jerk. She was always lying about me to her parents. I had fantasies about breaking her jaw. Now, at this point, I was terrified. My bus stop was still another 20 minutes away, and I just wanted to be out of that situation. Seeing that what he said made me uncomfortable, he switched the subject, telling me about where he worked and what he does there. I just nodded along to what he was saying, remaining silent the entire time. Closer to my bus stop, he says to me, Why don't you come to my house? I have a free are full of pizza and ice cream. Maybe we could hang out for a while. To which I politely declined, saying my boyfriend was expecting me. Finally, I get to my bus stop and quickly get off the bus, speed walking all the way home, all the while calling a friend to inform them of what happened. Things were fine for a bit after that. I switched my bus route so I wouldn't run into him again. 
but one afternoon, I had to go to a store that was on my old route. I was nervous about getting on that bus again, but was happy when I didn't see Joe. I did my shopping, and as I was leaving the store, I saw Joe standing out by the door staring at me. The second I was out the doors, he walked over to me, a grin on his face, and wrapped his arms around me. I pulled away from him, telling him I was very busy and had to go. He then asked, well, what are you doing? I have time I can tag along. I was very persistent, saying I really couldn't, I had to go, and I walked away, heading into a neighboring store that I knew would be busy. Sure enough, Joe followed. I ignored him as I made my way down a heavily populated makeup aisle, keeping my attention on some cheap lipsticks in the hopes he'd get the hint and leave me alone. I was wrong. Joe reached over my shoulder, grabbing a red lipstick as he leaned in close and whispered, This color would look gorgeous on you. I can't wait to see you wearing it. He then placed the lipstick in my basket and walked away, leaving the store. I remained in the store for about 20 minutes after he left, afraid to leave and make the walk home. After I mustered up the courage, I put the lipstick back, put away the basket, and called a friend to stay on the line with me until I made it home. Now I don't know if he followed me home or not, but I can say that after that day, the motion detector porch light started coming on at night, and I started hearing knocks at my bedroom window. Thankfully, I moved shortly after and haven't seen Joe since. This happened two summers ago, while I was house sitting out in California for an older couple I had met at a conference for work. It had seemed like a dream scenario, the couple wanted to vacation to Hawaii for two weeks, but didn't want to board their cats, and I had been chatting with them about wanting to visit California again, where they happened to live, because I had loved it for the first time I went, and we figured that we could mutually benefit if I came out and house sat for them. So I flew out there, and they showed me around for a few days, taught me how to take care for the cats, two of them, one that was extremely shy and I barely saw, which is important later, and their plants gave me access to their house and cars. These people were so generous, and before I knew it, I had dropped them off at the airport and I was on my own. At first, it was really the dream vacation. I was staying in Oakland and making forays into San Francisco, Sonoma, Monterey. In the mornings, I could walk out the front door and shortly be hiking the paths surrounding nearby Mount Diablo, and I was just ultra content with the world. I was so enamored by the area that I had actually started looking into taking some steps to relocate out there even. But then one day, about halfway through my final week there, when I got back to the house I felt really odd, almost like I shouldn't go inside. I shook it off and went inside anyway because it was getting late and I needed to put out dinner for the cats. Once I was inside, I forced myself to ignore how off I felt, and I made some food for myself, went to bed, and was shocked to find the shy cat hiding under my bed and crying. This was the first time I had ever seen her close up. The entire time I had been there, up to that point, she never left my host bedroom unless she didn't realize I was around. Again, I ignored feeling weird, and just assumed she had decided I was okay and went to bed. I did start locking my bedroom door that night though. I also remembered that about halfway through that night, I thought I heard someone walking around in the gravel outside my window, but after listening for a bit, I didn't hear anything else and went back to sleep. The day after, in the morning, I still felt a little odd, but kept up with my plans for the day. I drove out to a little musical festival in Sonoma and went clothes shopping and had an overall great day. When I got back to the house though, I found the front door locked in a way that I hadn't left it. Basically, my host never locked the deadbolt, only the lower second lock, and that's the only lock my key worked on, so I never messed with the deadbolt, but it was definitely locked. So I had to call my host and find the hide key, which, to their credit safety wise, was buried like a whole foot underneath a bush outside and had definitely not been unearthed for a long time time, so I used that, went inside, and kept the key with me just in case it happened again. And it did, but with a different door. This time I had stepped out into the garage to get a drink, and when I turned around to go back into the house, the door was shut and locked. I could use my normal key on that door, but I was still getting pretty bewildered. My own cats were whack, so I think in my mind I was trying to come up with a way that the cats could be locking me out the house, but I was coming up empty. I decided I must have been misunderstanding how the locks worked and just wrote it off and started checking and triple checking locks when I went out of the house or into the garage. That night when I went to bed, the really awful feeling of unease was still there, and so was the shy cat, who was clearly unhappy to see me, but also wouldn't leave my room. But again, I just locked my bedroom door and went to sleep. The next morning, I felt awful. Nausea, body ache, I had no desire to leave the house, so I decided to stay in and Netflix for a day. This vacation stay was like a full two weeks, so I didn't feel like I was in any hurry to get all the turrety things in anyways. But as the days went on, I started to feel that feeling of wrongness again, and it morphed into feeling incredibly watched. Around mid-afternoon, it got to the point that I was so uneasy that, even feeling awful, I decided to get out of the house for a bit to shake it off. I was getting a bit low on food, so I went to the grocery store and bought a couple food items that I didn't think would hurt my stomach and then I left. When I got to my car, I started crying and my entire body was telling me not to drive back to the house. I couldn't not though, because I didn't want to neglect the cats. So I drove back, parked in the driveway, and convinced myself, after about half an hour, to just go open the front door. Once I did that, I thought I would get over it and would be able to go in and 
at least feed the cats, and then maybe I'd go get a hotel room after, but my body physically would not let me inside. It was like I was stuck in the entryway. I then made a deal with myself. I would yell into the house saying I had already called the police and that they were on their way. In panic logic, I figured that would make anyone in the house leave, so I faced the inside of the house, looking down the hallway towards the bedrooms, and I did just that. The second I had finished saying, they're almost here, so if you want to avoid being arrested, you need to leave now. The light in my host room turned on and I heard some banging. I immediately hightailed it back to the car, called the police for real, and proceeded to have a mental breakdown while talking to the dispatcher. Once they got there, they checked the house and didn't find anyone. The double doors in my host bedroom were left wide open. I'm so glad the cats didn't get out, and there was a pile of food wrappers in the corner behind the blinds, so they said it looked like someone had been there. What makes it so scary to me is that nothing was taken, and that based on the shape of the house, that would have been the perfect vantage point to see me in the living room as I stayed home sick. To explain this, the house was in an L shape and from the windows into the garden that were in my host bedroom, you could see into the living room windows. Also, the minute the police were gone, they said they couldn't prove anyone was there, there were no signs of forced entry, and we couldn't get a hold of my host immediately to verify if anything had been taken, etc., which once they were back, they verified that nothing had been taken, so, so they said they'd patrol a bit but nothing else. The shy cat was right back into my host bedroom and I didn't see her again until I left to go back home. So basically, I think the intruder had been there at least two days, forcing her to choose between two strangers and leading her to choose the one that was at least a little less strange, me. It messed me up pretty bad, especially because they didn't catch the person and didn't seem to have any desire to look, and I still had to stay in the house for the next three days. Nothing else odd happened and I didn't feel off the rest of the time I was there, but the damage was done. I've never felt completely safe in a home without doing a complete search before bed since, but I am extremely glad my gut spoke up. I guess I'd rather have some residual anxiety than be dead. So about 5 years ago, I, male 26 years old, set out to travel the world. Being straight out of college had left me dead, ever more desperate for any job I was overqualified for and generally depressed. I felt isolated and alone in my small town in Washington and found the only way to get out, travel. My high school buddy suggested I look into Wu Fai Ji and volunteering as a way to travel cheap, and so I did. The way it works is quite simple. You work for around 25 hours a week on some farm for food and housing. The draw is that since the community of cheap travelers is quite big, it is a great way to meet new people, get outside of your comfort zone and just let yourself live and figure your life out. Fast forward 8 months and I'm a seasoned cow patty shoveler. I started out in Washington, Oregon and went south to California. There, I was able to save some money I was paid under the table for some extra work and was now faced with a decision, where to go in the world. The excitement of being able to purchase a ticket to almost anywhere in the world got the best of me, and on the advice of my volunteering partner, I chose it at random. I went to a randomizer website and clicked the country button, Georgia. The country of Georgia. To say I didn't know anything about it was an understatement, but the fear of the unknown made it exciting and exotic somehow, and so I did it. I purchased a ticket and started browsing for a farm that could host me. There were a few options, and most were remote and hadn't even had an internet connection. I messaged every single one because few ever respond and got a response from one farm on top of a mountain. The picture showed a traditional Georgian stone house with a large garden out in the back, a family with several cheerful children, grandparents having dinner, animals. It seemed warm and inviting. The description was written in good English and the requirements for work seemed reasonable. I was excited. After I flew into Tbilisi, the capital, I followed the instructions that they have sent to locate the farm, which wasn't an easy task. Few in Georgia speak English, the roads are screwed since few have been maintained since the fall of the Soviet Union and the country is generally poor. It took me around 20 hours of Soviet buses and taxis, weird serpentine roads and paths to get to the desired blue pen on my map. It was a dirt path leading up a steep hill into a national park up in the north of the country. There was nothing for miles on end but trees in their silence. As I got up that hill, I saw the house about half a mile away on even a steeper hill, surrounded by the trees. From that viewpoint, it seemed abandoned, overgrown, brown, and dreary. As I walked past the gate, Giri, fake name, the apparent owner approached me. He was a heavy, small, middle-aged guy with a big smile on his face. He shook my hand and in broken English started to show me around. He also smelled of booze. As he was showing me around, I noticed that there wasn't anyone there but us. I asked about his wife and kids and he brushed that aside and said something to the extent, they're away right now. By this point, I am creeped out. From browsing around, it was apparent that the farm was in deep decline. Apple trees and crops were dying, the roof of the small barn caved in, and the house itself full of trash and smelling of mold. It was obvious that Geary was going through a rough patch, but I wasn't going to turn around and just leave in the middle of nowhere, without a plan, having not slept for the past 36 hours. It was evening, and after feeding me well and trying as best as he could to hold a conversation in English, Geary showed me my room on the second floor and I went to sleep. I almost immediately blacked out from the exhaustion and stress, and would have slept for 10 hours 
hours if I wasn't awoken by a strange noise in the middle of the night. It sounded like something metallic and heavy was being dragged across the wooden floor. In that sleepy in-between state, I listened to it for a few minutes, thought nothing of it, and went back to sleep once it stopped. In the morning, Geary, now sober and grumpy, asked me to repair some of the windows and doors in the house as he himself planned to go and fetch some components in a nearby village. Again, I got this weird feeling creeping down my spine. Something wasn't right. He didn't maintain eye contact and was evasive. There was no cell reception, no internet. Once he left, I checked around the house to get a general idea of the place, and it became apparent that the place was hardly ever lived in, like one of those abandoned houses. There was broken furniture, newspapers, and old photos on the floor, a shattered mirror. I took my phone and looked through the saved listing again. The photos didn't match neither the backyard, the garden, or the walls. Geary wasn't in any of them. It was a completely different house. Now by this point, I am full-blown panicking. I pack my stuff and start to leave when I see a group of three men going up that first hill. There aren't any other paths I can take, so I go behind the house and rush down this hill into the forest. After some time, I stop and listen. I hear them in the house. They're clearly looking for me. Afraid of making any noise, I remain still, hidden behind a bush. I don't know how long I wait, but they were persistent. At some point, I hear them leave, so I count until some large number and proceed back into the house and path, and once I find it's all clear, I book the heck out of there. Never ran this fast. But I am still in the middle of nowhere. No traffic, no public transport. I reach a paved road and start walking in the general direction from where I remember coming. Hours go by and finally a car drives by and stops. It was a really nice Russian family that gave me a ride to town. The listing disappeared from the website a few days later I left and I haven't heard from Geary since. I've yet to make sense of that experience. I have traveled since and volunteered too and have yet to have an experience like that again, but I trust my gut feeling something was really not right. More than a few years ago, I was working as a burlesque entertainer in a gentleman's club. It was idly sitting at the end of the bar one night when a couple came in. Not unusual. I had no contact with them and thought nothing of their being there until later. A few days after that night, the doorman handed me a piece of paper that had two names and phone numbers written on it. Laura and Richard. I was supposed to call one of them, so I called Laura, who told me they had been the couple who'd been at the bar the other night. And they noticed me and thought I'd be perfect for a part in a movie Richard was producing. Would I be up for a meeting? Of course I would. Who wouldn't? I was told Richard would pick me up the next night at 7 and to wear something wild. 7 o'clock came the next evening and I was ready in a white lace dress with ostrich feather trim when Richard showed up outside my building so I went down, introduced myself and got in the car. We agreed to go to a local bar I knew well from the meeting but first we had to go back to his place so he could pick up some contracts he'd forgotten so off we went. He went in the house and came back out with a few manila envelopes and an open bottle of beer, a brand that I didn't drink. Plus, it's against the law to drink alcohol in a vehicle here. So I stuck the beer into the window well of his jeep and we went to the bar. At the bar, he showed me what were supposedly scripts from this movie he was producing. In some contracts, it looked pretty legit. Richard was very nice and I was interested. I had made some plans to go out later with my soon-to-be boyfriend, so I excused myself to go call him on the bar's payphone and took my corona that I'd ordered at the bar with me to the bank of phones. As a dancer, I'd been taught by the other older girls to never let your drink out of sight. My boyfriend wanted to get going to another club, so I went back to the table where Richard was and told him I had to go. He didn't like that and tried a few different things to get me to go to the movie set with him, saying I could meet Mickey Rourke and check out the set. But all I really wanted to do was meet my boyfriend, so I declined, took Richard's card, and left. I never heard from Richard again, but a couple of months later, the police came around to the bar I was working at. They had two big books, some mug shots, and a stack of Polaroids with them. And they wanted to talk to all of us about a predator couple who had been setting up meetings with dancers by saying they were in the film industry, then drugging them. They showed me the two mug shot books and asked if I saw anyone I recognized in the pictures and I immediately identified Richard and Laura. They then showed me the Polaroids, which were trophy pictures of the couple in the act of attacking the poor drug girls, and asked if I knew any of the victims and where they might find them, in order to talk to the girls. I only knew a couple of women in the photographs, but there were a lot that this had happened to. Richard and Laura were prosecuted. He went to jail, but she didn't because she was from a wealthy family and she also turned witness on him. About 12 years after Richard was convicted, I saw in the newspaper that he was up for possibility of parole, so I wrote a letter to the parole board telling the story and urging them not to let him back out, because he's a dangerous offender who should have to stay in prison for the entirety of his sentence. If I had drank that open beer he had handed me in his jeep on the way to that meeting, I wouldn't have made it to the meeting, and would probably have ended up in that stack of Polaroids. Girls and guys, always always keep your eye on your drinks. Have fun, but be careful out there. 
So this happened about a year and a half ago. I moved to Los Angeles three years ago. First time living on my own and I love it. Even with everything that happened, I still love living here. So I'm a smoker, on average about three to four cigarettes a day. So thankfully I'm only at a pack, like every five or six days, whatever. Math isn't my strong suit. Anyway, I live in a non-smoking building so I have to step outside when I want to smoke. The first time I saw this guy, he was outside my building, sitting next to a dumpster. No big deal, probably just another neighbor I hadn't met. His name is Oz. The first time I I saw Oz, I was having a cigarette outside, and he just glanced over at me every once in a while, but that's it. Two days later, it's like 11.30pm and I'm heading downstairs to smoke. I look at the lobby of the building and see someone underneath a blanket behind some chairs. I see a cord going behind the blanket bulge, so I immediately assume someone's in the doghouse for the night and charging their phone. I have my smoke, head back upstairs, and go to sleep. A week later, it's the middle of the day. I've gotten some work done and decided to take a smoke break. I go and sit outside like I always do. Oz is sitting outside as well. This time he's got some paperwork with him. A lot of paperwork. At this point, I feel like I should provide a description of Oz. He's about 6 feet tall, early to mid 30s. He has medium length hair that has been styled into dreadlocks. A full but short beard, if that makes sense. He was wearing worn down pants and jackets. Based on his face, he seemed like he cleaned himself up regularly, but his clothes made him look homeless, and sadly he was. So Oz is going to over the paperwork in his hands when he looks over at me and says hi. So I responded kind. He then asked me how I'm doing today. I'm doing pretty okay, I respond. How are you? I'm good man, I'm good. Good. It's a nice day, right? Yeah, yeah it is. So when are you moving? Now that question came out of nowhere. Was he hoping to find a new place to live? Was he trying to move into this building? Was that what his paperwork was all about? I mean, if he's moving into a new apartment, great. I hope life works out well for him. But why was he asking me when I'm moving out? I know the building at the time had a vacancy or two, so if he was going to move in, why ask a question like that? Why make it sound like he's waiting for someone to move out so he can have a spot? My brain asked all those questions in less than a second of Voss asking me that. After a couple seconds of being stunned by Oz's question, I just said, I'm not moving anytime soon, man. My cigarette was over by then, so it was time for me to go to my apartment. Another week later, I go see a friend stand up set, and when I get back to my apartment at like 10 p.m., I see two police SUVs outside my building with lights on. I go inside because if there are two police vehicles already there, I can't do anything so might as well stay out of the way. The cops are talking to one of my downstairs neighbors, and I can't catch anything they're talking about. Two days later, notices have been put up next to the mailboxes that say, this man is not allowed in this building and it has a photo of Oz. Turns out the blanket bulge I saw was actually Oz, when he somehow managed to get inside the building and sleep in the lobby with an electric blanket. A couple of months go by and I don't see Oz. I honestly forgot about him by that point. When finally one day, Oz is there again, sitting outside the building with somehow even more paperwork. This time when he sees me, he's almost immediately hostile. So when are you getting out of here? What? I want my apartment back, man. I don't know what you're talking about. You stole my apartment and I want it back. I was so confused by this. I snuffed my cigarette out and went back into the building. This exchange pretty much repeated itself every few days for the next two weeks, each time making me more and more uncomfortable. On weekdays, I would get home very late, like anywhere between 11.30pm and 2am. Oz never had a predictable pattern to his appearances, so I started getting really nervous about going home. Like, I wanted to avoid going home so I could avoid being accosted by Oz. Finally, one Saturday after lunch, I step outside and have a smoke. Oz is there, and this time he's mad. He's saying that if I don't get out of his apartment by the end of the day, he'll get me. That shook me up a lot. I got back inside and stayed there. Around midnight, I decided to step outside and have a smoke, hoping against hope that Oz isn't there. But lo and behold, Oz is there. Wizard. He's sitting by the dumpster again, and I go to the opposite direction to inhale smoke. I see Oz go up to the stoop and stand in front of the door to the building. Great. When my cigarette is done, I head to the stairs to get into my building. Oz steps to block me from getting to the door. Excuse me, I say as I try to go past him, but he stops me. You ain't getting in here, he says. Why? Because you don't live here. Yes, I do. No, you don't, man. You don't live here. Yeah, I do live here. Now, please move out of my way. Maybe if I stay kind, he'll let me go home, but no, he doubled down. Nah, man, you can't get in here because you don't live here. For the last time, I live here. Prove it, man. You got paperwork? Yes, I have a lease. Where? I was getting really irritated at this point, so my answer started becoming really cold. Like, I was getting pretty rude to this guy. I don't carry it with me everywhere I go. Now move aside and let me in. No, now you need to get out of here. Move. Nah, now you need to get out of here or I'm calling my security team. No, you need to move or I'm calling the cops. Do it, man. My security guys are already on their way. They're gonna screw you up. At this point, I was already stepping away from the door and pulling out my phone. I called the non-emergency number because in the moment I didn't feel threatened by Oz, but I should have called regular dispatch instead of non-emergency. Cops got there about half an hour later and Oz was still there. 
The cops came and got out of their car. One cop was holstering their nightstick and dropped it on the ground, then holstered it properly. The two cops that showed up separated and talked to Oz and I separately. I tell my cop that I was just trying to get back into my building, he's blocking me. He's been harassing me lately saying I need to move out. Oz, however, had a very different story. He claimed that I stole his apartment from him, stole his credit cards, and stole his insurance payouts. The apartment he claimed I stole from him isn't the apartment I live in. The cherry on top of this lack of a Sunday is the part where he accused me of throwing dog water on him. An actual water bottle filled with a mixture of dog spit and water. That's the guess I have as to what dog water is. First he claimed I threw it up at him while I was standing on the sidewalk and he was on the stoop. Then he claimed I was on the fire escape above him and literally poured the water on him from above. Thankfully the cops knew immediately that this was a lie, but because I guess no actual crime had been committed, all they could do was tell Oz to go away. He was not happy about it, but he did. I hoped that Oz would not come back after that, but sadly I was wrong. Oz did come back just one last time. A few days later, it's the middle of the day and I'm walking downstairs to inhale fire. As I step outside, I see two cops, Oz and one of my downstairs neighbors. Oz and my neighbor are separated and giving statements to the cops. When my neighbor is done, his name is John. I go up to him and ask him what happened. John then shows me his elbows, both scraped up and lightly bleeding. One of his knees is also lightly cut up. Oz also had a couple of bruises and light cuts on him. John tells me that as he was trying to enter the building earlier, Oz was standing right outside and tried to force his way in. John stopped him and tried to tell him to leave. The two got into a small fight and the cops were called. I decide to sit outside with John while everything is being figured out and while John is waiting for his wife, a nurse, to get home and look him over. The manager of the building is called and helps the cops to look at the security camera footage for the front of the building. After looking at it for about 10 minutes, the cops and manager return. Sadly, the fight took place outside of view of the cameras. So it became a case of he said he said, so all the cops can do is tell Oz to leave once again. Since then, I have not seen Oz anywhere near my building, and a sign has been put up outside the building stating, this building is not open to the public, no unauthorized entry, which is both comforting and disconcerting. This event took place quite a few years ago, so unfortunately I don't remember everything that happened, but I remember nearly all of it. Anyways, this happened when I was around 4 to 5 years old and on Easter Sunday. My family always gathers at my grandmother's house to celebrate holidays, birthdays, etc. So as we do every holiday, my mother and I started our hour-long trip to her house. My mother prefers to live away from all the city commotion, which explains the long drive. We were probably around 20 minutes away from our destination when my mom noticed that we were a little low on gas, so we pulled into this old, almost rustic looking gas station with just a handful of customers inside. It was red and white with a few festive decorations outside and lots of Easter stickers from the two large glass windows that were on either side of the door. My mom, having taught me not to talk to strangers nor open the doors for anyone but her, trusted me enough to leave me in the car alone as she went inside briefly to pay for gas. She told me she would be right back before going into the gas station. It felt nice that day, so the windows in the car were down so we could feel the breeze while driving instead of the AC. While I was waiting on my mom, I remember adjusting the colorful paper clippings in my Easter basket next to me, then looking out of the backseat window. When I looked over, I saw a tall, older man, maybe around 30 or 40 years old, approaching my window. He crouched down slightly and looked at me, hi there, what's your name? I remember him saying. At this moment, I remember that I wasn't supposed to talk to strangers, so I told the man that my mom says I shouldn't speak to strangers. He then replied with, well, we could be friends then, my name's Charlie, and now that you know, I guess I'm not a stranger now, huh? At the time, I thought he was right, in my mind, I thought, since a stranger is someone you don't know, this man wasn't a stranger anymore because I knew his name. The man and I had a short conversation that I don't quite remember. All I remember is him telling me that I had a nice Easter basket. At this point, I started to get a sick feeling in my stomach, but being a child, of course, I didn't know why. My mom then walked out of the gas station and noticed the man immediately and began approaching the car quickly asking the man what he thinks he's doing. The man seems to panic and he pulls my door handle violently. He quickly realized that it was locked, thankfully, and proceeded to reach into my window and grab me by one of my wrists and attempt to pull me out. This obviously scared me a lot causing me to panic and pull him against on instinct. This caused him to let go and take off running. My mom quickly ran to the car and I unlocked the doors. She grabbed me and pulled me into an almost painful bear hug, then inspecting me closely repeatedly asking if I was okay. I ended up with a slight bruise slash redness on my arm where he grabbed me, but other than that I was just shaken up. The reality of what had just happened set in at this moment, and I remember just crying and holding until my mom right after I said I was okay. I don't remember anything after this point, but I recently asked my mom about it and she said that she called the police immediately after. To this day, my mom still says that this was the most frightening moment of her life and claims that if she had gotten there any later and came back to an empty car, she wouldn't have been able to live with herself. 
I am a female and now 23. This happened around the time that I was 15 years old. Around this time it was my sophomore year in high school, so little backstory to help understand the story I'm about to tell. I was involved in my high school color guard. We are a part of band except we don't play instruments. We would spin colorful flags. We also use rifles and sabers in our performances. Around this time it was the fall and we were practicing our show, doing a lot of reruns to try and perfect it before our usual competitions. Normally practice would start at 4 and end almost at 9. Side note, I didn't live close to my high school like most people that went there. The drive would take at least 15 minutes max. Walking from my house to school would take an hour and taking the bus would take 45 minutes. My brother at this time worked late hours and my parents didn't get off of work until midnight. So my next best choice was the bus. The neighborhood wasn't the worst, but it also wasn't safe to be walking home at night. So on this night, I was saying goodbye to my friends and not wanting to bug them for a ride, I walked to my bus stop. I had my cell phone and started scrolling through Facebook. I would occasionally glance up and look at my surroundings. I noticed a car slowing down in front of my bus stop, but it immediately signaled to make a turn to my left. I didn't think much about it since there are houses behind that bus stop. It wasn't weird until I noticed this car doing that again and then again and again. I found this odd. It wasn't until he had basically passed by me for the seventh time that he finally parked on the curb by my bus stop. That's when I got a good look at him and that I took in his appearance. This happened a couple of years ago so my memory isn't great, but I do remember he was Hispanic and reminded me a bit of an uncle of a friend of mine. He spoke his first words to me that sent me panicking. To translate what he said to me in Spanish, it was basically him saying, Hey, come over here. Do you need a ride? Hop in. I'll take you. He kept saying that for a good five minutes and then suddenly drove off. I then let out a breath I didn't know I was holding in. I was trying to calm myself down and tell myself it was over, but I knew it wasn't and I was right. His car showed back up and the thing about about my bus stop is that there is a house behind it, except before the house there is a good amount of space with just dirt. Cars can actually go in this space and I've seen it before. He parked behind my bus stop. At this moment I was already thinking about how to get out of the situation. I was frozen in place, not fight or flight, but freezing. The worst thing to ever do. At this time this big guy was close by and was walking his pit bull on a leash. In my frozen state I knew this was my only chance and fought to get the words out. It was my only chance to save myself and I'm so glad I spoke out. Excuse me, could you please stay with me? That man in the car right there won't don't leave me alone. I'm very scared. Please stand by my side. My words choked up and I was shaking at this point. The guy was kind hearted and agreed. He stared down the man who at this point had his window up and began reversing. He drove off and the guy stayed with me till my bus came. At this time it was 9.59. I know that some of you might ask, why didn't you go back to your high school? Well at this point no one was really there. Mostly everyone had been picked up. I had a cell phone but no one was going to be able to pick me up. This was my only transportation and that time I didn't know about Lyft or Uber. I'm not even sure if it was a thing back then. Overall, I'm just happy to have been saved by that kind-hearted guy. Because of him, I am here and able to share the story of mine. I'm still shaken up at the memory of it because of the scare it gave me. After that incident, I asked for a ride for the remaining of that season. Sometimes, even when you don't want to bug people with rides, it doesn't hurt to ask. It's better to be that annoying person than finding yourself in my situation. Stay safe when taking the bus at night. I work evenings as a dispatcher in a medium-sized midwestern city. I was driving home at 2am when I stopped for gas. In retrospect, it was stupid to have stopped at all. The gas station was poorly lit and completely empty of any other customers, but I knew the shady areas of town and this was not usually one of them. As I was pumping gas, I noticed a middle-aged woman sitting on the curb across the parking lot. It was a cold night and had just started raining. The woman was not wearing weather-appropriate clothing so she was drenched. When the woman saw that I was watching her, she called out to me from across the parking lot. My second of many stupid decisions that night was choosing to engage with her. I was worried for her, so I approached her to see what sort of help I could offer. Hi beautiful, I'm just trying to get home, but no one will help me, she said. I'm trying to get to city A, but the cab ride is $60 and I only have $40. Can you help me? I don't usually give money to panhandlers, but this woman seemed genuine. The weather was terrible and my job centers around helping people, so I agreed. I told her I didn't have any cash, but if she would come with me inside, I'd take some money out of the ATM and give her a few dollars. But the ATM was wasn't working. I apologized and told her there was nothing else I could do for her. She followed me back outside, idly chatting with me as I opened my driver's door to get in, and then she got in my car. I was too shocked to really say anything. I sat staring at her as she buckled herself into the passenger seat. As soon as she got into my car, her demeanor changed entirely. She no longer seemed forlorn, as much as she did extremely, extremely excited and restless. Just take me to my aunt's house, she said. She can give me money. Of course, alarm bells are going off in my head, although my first instinct is to tell her to get out of my car. 
My gut tells me that that would be dangerous. She'd already proven to be unpredictable, she seemed to be high, and I didn't know if she had any weapons on her. Forcing her out of my vehicle, I thought, had the potential to elicit a violent reaction. Where are you asking me to take you? I finally said. Just start driving, I'll tell you where to turn. No, if you want me to consider driving you somewhere, I need you to tell me where we're going. I say, with no real intention of driving her anywhere. Don't worry, honey, I'm not gonna rob you or nothing, just drive. No, I repeated, where is your aunt's address? Okay, it's on street A. What's the house number? As I was asking her questions, she got really agitated. We still had not left the gas station parking lot. I considered getting out of the car and going into the gas station to help, but A, she had seemed to know and be friendly with one of the attendants that was inside when I tried to get money, and B, I wasn't about to leave her alone in my car. Finally, she snapped at me and said, why are you asking me so many questions? I thought we were friends. You don't trust me? I work at a police department, I said. It's my job to ask these sort of questions. She flipped out. She started yelling at me about being a snitch, about trying to get her into trouble, just in general losing her mind. At this point, I'm more scared than ever. I just wanted her gone, but my instinct still told me asking her to get out of my car wouldn't work, so I decided to take a risk. I'm not a police officer, I just work at a police department. Why don't I take you to Walmart and see if they have an ATM that works? My idea was to get her out of my car as peacefully as possible, then lose her in the store. She liked my idea and immediately calmed down. I knew that driving off with this woman in my car was incredibly, incredibly risky, but it seemed like the best option at the time. As we're driving, she keeps talking to me. Her thoughts were erratic, bouncing all over the place. It sometimes seemed difficult for her to follow through one a thought, but this is roughly how our conversation went. I'm glad we're friends now. I have about five or six people trying to get to me. I'm going to come to your work tomorrow so we can go arrest them together. Okay, we can talk about that tomorrow. Tonight you said you're trying to get home? Yes, honey, I'm trying to get to City B. City B? I thought you said you needed to go to City A. Yeah, yeah, City A, that's what I meant. That's why the cab ride is $40. It's far away. The cab ride is $40? Yeah, you said you have $40. I do. I have $40, but the cab ride is $60. Silence. Are you sure you can't take me to my aunt's house? She lives close by on Street B. I thought you said she lived on Street A. No, I meant Street B, but it doesn't matter because she won't give me my money anyway. You sure you just can't take me to City A? It was obvious that this woman was utterly full of it, because the details of her story were constantly changing. When we pulled into the Walmart parking lot, she finally got out of my car, only after I got out first, and followed me into the store. I told her before we went to find an ATM I needed to use the restroom. My plan was to call the police from inside a stall but she followed me into the bathroom and that's when things got really weird. She grabbed the crook of my arm and whispered into my ear, if you don't got any money to give me, that's okay, but let me ask you something, do you want to do it in the stall? I told her no as forcefully as I could manage, bolted it to a stall, and locked the door as fast as I could possibly manage. As soon as I had a barrier between us, I said, you know, I have some friends at the police department that can probably help you better than I can. I'm just going to call them and we can figure this out together. Again, at the mention of the cops, she started screaming at me. I just kept reiterating that the police would help her. She snapped to me that she was just going to leave and stormed out of the bathroom. But it wasn't over. I waited to make sure she was really gone. Sure enough, not 60 seconds after she left, she came back into the bathroom and started banging on the stall door. And she said something that scared me more than anything else. Hey, come back to your car with me. I left my beer in your car. I blatantly tell her that no, I saw her get into my car and she had absolutely nothing with her other than the clothes on her back. After that, she left the bathroom again and didn't come back. I waited a good 5 minutes before exiting the bathroom. I immediately found a manager who called the police for me. Thankfully, I was in a different police jurisdiction from the one I work in because I was mortified at how entirely stupid I had been the whole night and would have died of embarrassment if any of my co-workers had responded. The officer that responded took my statement and advised me to be more careful in the future. He said that sometimes panhandlers turn violent and that just recently there had been a report of a woman who matched my description assaulting a good Samaritan that had stopped to try to help her. I definitely learned a lesson on stranger danger and I'm lucky to have come out not harmed. I'm glad my stupidity didn't kill me. This happened a few years ago, when I was around 20 or so. I was hanging out with my buddy Matt at my apartment, located in the downtown area of a medium-sized, midwestern city. We were drinking whiskey, watching comedies, playing tunes, etc. He mentions that he has a close friend, Emily, who used to live in my apartment building with her mother. She now lives across the street from me, and he thought it would be a swell idea if we met because apparently we are very similar and I was single at that point in my life. He rings her cell and tells her to come by my place. She arrived at my apartment and I instantly became 
became fond of her. She was hilarious, very pretty, and a musician just like me. She was around 30 or 10 years older than me. My friend Matt was 35. I've always had friends that are much older for some reason. We played songs together and laughed hysterically for hours. Matt decided to go home, leaving us two alone. We chilled for a while longer, ended up making out, and I got all of her contact info before she told me she's going home and that we should meet up soon. Over the next few weeks, we develop a strong relationship, and we hang out almost daily. I would throw some pajamas on and walk across the street and we'd get wasted and watch movies. It was awesome. After arriving home from my 10 day trip to New York City, things got really weird. The day I returned, she asked if she could come over, so I unpacked my stuff and then told her to stop by. She rings the buzzer, takes the elevator 7 floors up to my apartment, and lets herself in. I was talking non-stop about all the awesome things I did and people I met in New York City and I could immediately tell she didn't want to hear any of it. She would change the subject every time I brought it up, and eventually she said, can you stop talking about New York, I really don't care. I was surprised to hear her speak like this. The Emily I had been getting to know was not like this. She was caring and passionate and an amazing person, so I thought. Fast forward to a few nights later. I had just gotten home from a working 12 hour shift and I collapsed in my bed, ready to pass off for the night. It's about 9pm and I get a text from Emily that says, hey what's up? I don't feel much like replying at that moment. I am too exhausted and our last hangout was too weird for me to comprehend, so I am still trying to decide how to deal with that. I plug my phone into my charger, turn the lights off and fall asleep. Bang bang bang. I wake up to somebody pounding on my door and screaming at the top of their lungs. Open the door, let me in now. My entire apartment reeks like cigarette smoke. I grab my phone from beside my bed, my heart beating a million miles per hour. 27 missed phone calls, a bunch of text messages, all from Emily. I scan through the text while she's still at the door screaming, trying to break my door down. The most recent text from her is a long one claiming I'm a bad person for not responding to her text earlier, and that she's coming over to beat me up for not doing so. She still had a key to the building still, from when she used to live there. I get out of bed and nearly having a panic attack and try to decide what my next move should be. Should I open the door and calm her? Should I call the police? Should I just ignore her? I decide to open the door. She begins wailing on me, swinging her arms trying to hit me. She was smoking a cigarette and there were three cigarette butts on the ground next to her. Smoking indoors was prohibited in my apartment building. She was very obviously on some sort of drug. She kept screaming at me, telling me how awful I am for not responding to her text message, slurring her speech and losing her balance. I was somehow able to calm her down and I took her to the roof of the apartment building which had a pretty nice little enclosed picnic table area. We sat beside one another. She was quiet now finally. She kept asking me how I could be such a jerk and that I need to explain myself. The look in her eyes was pure evil as she spoke to me in a calm demeanor now. I said to her, Emily, I don't ever want to speak to you again after tonight. This whole scenario is absolutely insane. You need help. Let me walk you home. I take her home and return to my apartment to attempt sleeping, at which I do not succeed. A couple days later, I return home from work and there is an envelope taped to my door. I open it and it's a handwritten letter from Emily apologizing and saying that I'm a beautiful human who doesn't deserve an evil person like her in their life. There was a literal candy bar attached to the envelope, one that I had never heard of that she always told me I needed to try. I never spoke to her again. From what Matt tells me, which, by the way, he always knew she was a problematic person, she's a heavy user of crack now and is working as a food runner in a restaurant nearby. This happened on Saturday. My girlfriend, Tess, my puppy, Jack, and I are all getting ready for a road trip. We're planning on meeting some friends at their house and then starting the trip from there. On our way to their house around 11am, a white car with all tinted windows cuts us off and brake checks us close enough that I had to slam the brakes and swerve to avoid an accident. In the immediate fury, I honked and flipped the driver off. I wish I hadn't done this. Immediately, the driver rolls down his window and waves his hand over. He slows down to go back to the other lane so that our cars are parallel to one another. The driver is gesturing wildly and yelling at us while we continue driving down the avenue. I proceed to make gestures to calm down and then try to ignore him and continue driving. He continues driving next to us. Eventually, I try speeding up and he revs in front of me and tries brake checking me again. At this point, I swerve to the other lane and he again slows down to match my vehicle speed. He is still gesturing and screaming while I try to ignore him. Suddenly, he reaches in his lap and I notice he is holding a glass bottle. He throws it and it shatters at the side of my vehicle. Tess is hysterical at this point and the pup had hidden under the passenger seat. I go into adrenaline mode and try turning into different streets as the chase ensues. He is following close behind when he throws another glass bottle that shatters against my back window. I tell Tess to call the police as we speed down a two lane street and up a hill. She calls 911 as I come to a stop at the light at the top of the hill. The guy chasing us slows down to a stop behind us. Suddenly, he hops out of his vehicle and in my rear view mirror I see him reach back into his car and grab something and puts it into his shorts. He begins walking towards the side of my car as the car in front of me drives away. I noped out of there, slammed the gas, and turned into the next avenue. Within a minute, he has caught back up to us as I am now on speaker with 
with 911 explaining the situation and giving them the details of his car and appearance. Tess is crying as we speed down a busy avenue, weaving in between cars at 20 above the speed limit. I'm updating the 911 lady with where we are and she tells me to drive to the station. At the next red light he yells not audibly, do we have a problem, don't flip me off. I'm trying to gesture that we do not have any problem, he's still trying to get me to get out of the car. The light is still red and he again hops out of his vehicle. I again floor it through the red and he continues chasing as I make way towards the police station. We're now accelerating and brake checking each other as he tries to drive off the road. I make gestures that he should continue following, hoping to get him to the station. About a block from the police, we get stuck in a busy intersection. There are many cars around as he again walks up to my car. This time I'm boxed in and Tess is panicking. I'm looking for any escape options to no avail. The drivers around us notice and many put their windows up and lock their doors. He comes right up to my window, slaps it with his palm and asks one more time, is there a problem? I again say no. The 911 lady tells me to not engage over the phone speaker. He says good. He gets back into his car and then speeds away. 20 minutes into this horrible car chase experience. We end up meeting with the cops and they say that there was nothing they could do, even though I updated them with more details of his direction and where he was last. We calmed down and then we continued our road trip. So I, a 20 year old female, lived in a shady apartment complex in an otherwise rich suburban area for 3 years. This story is about a neighbor that I'll call Bob. A little backstory, me, 18 years old at the time, and my then 16 year old sister used to babysit all the neighborhood kids. These kids considered us their friends and it got to where they seemed to have a radar of when me and my sister went outside. They'd come out and talk to us and we let them ride our skateboards and such in the parking lot. The kids were ages 8 to 13. So one day we were outside with them and we were joined by a stranger. He he stood between us and our car, towering over us. He introduced himself and asked us to sign a petition he made up. We did, just being friendly, then he asked us how old we were. I thought maybe he was a fellow teenager that looked older or that he was just awkward. So I told him I was 18 and the very next question was if I wanted to go out with him. In front of my mom and the other kid's mom, I awkwardly declined, but he continued talking about how he thought me and my sister were in middle school. Also, he was 28. Eventually, he wandered away to ask someone else to sign his petition. A few days later, he knocked at our door after asking neighbor for the address. He had a bag of what he said was chicken and wanted us to go eat it with him at the park. We declined because we both had schoolwork to do. He walked away and he was mumbling about how antisocial everyone was. Later, we look out our window and see him playing baseball with two girls. He kept physically moving their arms to different positions even though they shrugged away from him. Next day, one of the kids runs up to me. I'll call her Maddie. She's eight. She's got a new pair of Heelys and wanted help with them. I was holding her hand and guiding her along when Bob appears and says he can help better. Maddie says no, but he insists. He pushed me aside and reaches for Maddie, holding her tightly around the upper chest area. Her grandma was there too and flips out. He wanders away. The next day, Maddie's freaking out, saying Bob was just sitting on her porch when she left for school that morning. Her parents found out, and as they walked outside, he let himself in, and they said he went to their kitchen to make orange chicken. We later found out another neighbor had a similar story. Another time, we were helping a family move. They have a two-year-old son. The garages are in a triangle shape to the road, almost a roundabout. There's a flat patch of grass behind them. Well, here comes Bob to help us. He criticized the way we packed things and didn't help until our neighbor politely asked him to leave. Well, he left the garage, but instead of leaving, he asked the two-year-old if he wanted to play. The kid said no, and it made him mad. He picked up the kid to play, and the kid slapped him. He asked the kid if he wanted to go behind the garages to play ball, so I go with him and guide the kid to his mom. The climax of the story is when me and my sister went on a walk with our 17-year-old friend and her other friend. Maddie found us and wanted to come along, so we are starting our walk when Bob comes out. He sees our friend and asks how old she is and how much she weighs because she's so skinny. He asks where we're going. My friend tells him we're going for ice cream on a girl's trip. We didn't ask her to say that. He's like, oh man, and stomps away. We continue our walk, but halfway through we have a weird feeling. I look behind us and Bob is running towards us. He yells at us for hiding from him while also telling Maddie how pretty she is. An older neighbor sees this and asks him what's going on. He tells the man we're being mean and he needs to go write a song about us. He leaves, but we see him sitting at the park. Well, he saw us and again comes running. We stop and he asks which one of us is over 18. Maddie's dad is here at this point and tells him we aren't interested in him. He explodes, telling the dad to screw himself and that he's so rude. Maddie is crying and the neighbor who saw us before came to check on us since he saw Bob running. Bob goes inside, muttering to himself. For weeks we don't see him. A single dad and his five-year-old daughter move in and we are introducing ourselves to them. My mom kind of tips him off that there's someone in their building who is a little off, especially around Maddie. The dad says he's seen someone like that giving kids candy at the pool when the kids looked uncomfortable. Well, here comes Bob, as if on cue. He immediately tells the girl in front of her dad that she looks like a movie star and that she's so pretty. He has to play with her, but the dad says no and they go inside. Turns out they're next door neighbors. We still didn't see him much but other neighbors were telling us stories about him. 
There's a woman who's alone most of the day with her two kids under five who told us he watches her when she goes to and from her car. Also, Maddie's parents continue to see him watching her. Then one day we're again babysitting and here he comes. Only this time he's swinging nunchucks. Maddie screams and hides in our car. Bob strolls over with his nunchucks and starts talking to us all casual. Then his head cranes to look into the car and he says, where's Maddie? We told him she wasn't here and he walked away. By then, most of the kids were afraid to go outside when they saw him. He had a habit of wandering around the complex. We could tell by his height and lanky gait. A few times we'd see Bob with his dad. Those times, neither of them glanced at us. Then one day, he just stopped showing up. We'd see his dad and brother come in and out all the time, but never him. We only saw him again a year later, and it was only for one day near Christmas, and then he disappeared again. So I don't know what happened to him, but it was just one of our weird experiences with neighbors in the three years living there. On Friday afternoon, I got a call from my friend named Sarah asking if I wanted to meet her and another friend named Lisa at Dunkin Donuts as we hadn't seen one another in a while. Dunkin Donuts is a 15 minute walk from my house so I decided I would walk, besides the weather was fine. I got to Dunkin Donuts and found where Sarah and Lisa were sat so I went to join them. As we were chatting, I noticed that my sister, Alina, was sat at a table in the corner of the room with her friend, Jess. For some context, my sister and her friend are both 18 years old. My sister still lives with my parents whereas I live alone. I excused myself from the table and went over to Alina and Jess's table. They were sat at a table with three seats so I went to sit down and said hey. They both jumped a little bit but then looked more relieved than anything to see me. Immediately Alina whispered to me, don't look now, but the guy in the blue shirt, I think he's following Jess and I. I glanced over and saw the middle aged man sat at a table facing away from us. He's passed our table a good five times in the past 20 minutes to go to the bathroom, but he walked slower as he passes us, she continued. I told them that they were most likely being paranoid and that there was nothing to worry about. But for their peace of mind, I offered to leave with them so they wouldn't feel as worried. I walked back over to my table and explained the situation to Sarah and Lisa. Both of them laughed it off and assumed my sister to be paranoid. Literally about a minute later, I saw the man get up from his seat and walk towards the bathroom. My eyes followed him and sure enough, he walked extremely slow past Alina and Jess. In fact, it was almost comical how obviously slow he became. Both Alina and Jess looked in my direction and I nodded to show that I had seen him walk slower. About 5 minutes later, I went into the toilets. On my way, I passed Alina and Jess and told them I was ready to leave whenever they were. They both agreed that they were ready to leave now. I told them that I was just going to go to the bathroom and that we could leave after I had done my business. Alina had come in her car so she was going to give me a lift back. I went into the toilet stall, did said business, washed my hands. I was walking down the corridor back into the main eating area when Alina and Jess rushed into the corridor. I asked them what's up and they explained that another man had joined the strange creeper men and that the men were both pointing and staring at them, so they rightfully felt unsafe. We walked back into the eating area, I put my money on our table and explained to Lisa and Sarah that I was taking off and I would explain what was going on when I got home. We all got into Alina's car and left the creeps in the car's rearview mirror. After a two minute drive we reached my house. Just then I remembered that I had been meaning to return something I had borrowed from my mother. So I asked if Alina could drive me to my parents house as she was going there anyway. I jumped out the car to get what I needed when my phone rang. It was Alina. She explained that a car had driven past and had pulled into a driveway. She said the driver of the vehicle was the creep from Dunkin Donuts. I looked out of my window and sure enough there was a car which didn't belong to the owner of the house parked on their driveway. I got the girls into my house and locked the door. I instructed Alina to take a photo of the car and its license plate and I told Jess to call 911 as she gave the operator more information than what I could. Alina took the photos and we sort of gathered around Jess as she was speaking to the operator. She had finished telling the story and I heard the operator assure us that the police would be at my house soon. A few minutes passed and there was a loud knock at the front door followed by a loud voice shouting it's the police. We all did a sigh of relief as I went to open the door. Jess told the operator that the police were here and she hung up. I was in the process of unlocking the door when I thought to look through the spy hole at the top of the door. I peered through and it wasn't a police officer, it was the same guy. I froze in fear and I didn't know what to say. We didn't call the police. I managed to shout back to the man through the door. Elena and Jess were both confused as to why I said this. We had a call, sir. The man shouted back, you have the wrong address. I yelled back and informed the girls that it was the creep at the door and not a police officer. Both were rightfully shocked and extremely scared as was I. I was about to tell Jess to call the police again until I heard the sirens. Sir, you have to let me in. The man shouted again. This time I didn't answer. He was pounding on the door. His commands for me to let him in turned into begging and pleading. I heard the police car pull up in some commotion outside. An actual police officer knocked on the door and I let him in. Yes, I checked the spy hole first. The police officer took the man into custody while another police officer took Alina and Jess into the dining room for some brief questioning. I called my parents and Jess called hers. Both were here extremely quickly once we told them what had happened. The man was found with a kitchen knife on his person and some other weapons in his car. Who knows what could have happened if I hadn't looked through the spy hole first. Both my sister and her friend are fine, just shaken up.
up after the whole incident. Back when I was 17 or 19, I worked at a small local bakery. There were less than 15 employees spread across all the night and day shifts, so we only had a few people working during the day. One of these people was Dave, the delivery driver. Dave immediately gave me an off five. He was in his mid-50s and way too friendly to a teenage girl. But the boss told me straight up that yes, he could be annoying, but no one worked harder than he did, so just ignore his antics. When I signed the paperwork, they never asked me to submit to a background check. In hindsight, that should have been red flag number two. Over the course of the year or so that I worked with Dave, I tried very very hard to ignore him. He was rarely outright creepy, but he was always just a bit too friendly. He would stick around long after his shift was over to talk to me and the other pastry chef on shift. He always wanted to lick the bowl after I made Rice Krispie treats. He would always stand in front of the racks of equipment or ingredients, just enough that sometimes my hand would brush him while reaching for something. He always stood just a little too close. He was constantly asking me about my life, what I liked, what I did for fun, if I had a boyfriend, almost daily. He would tell me how a nice girl like me should have a boyfriend, how maybe a boyfriend would be good for me. I left this slide because sometimes older people can say things that were meant differently in their time. Then it was concert invites. Every other week he had tickets to one concert or another. Once he figured out my genre of music, it was almost exclusively tickets to bands I desperately wanted to see. But I also knew I should not go anywhere with him. I don't like to associate with co-workers outside of work anyway, and I had seen way too many red flags about Dave to trust him for even a second. My birthday came. He brought me a t-shirt. It was two sizes too small. He told me to try it on. I said no. He told me to try it on after work and text him a photo. He gave me his number. He asked for mine. I said no. He asked for the other pastry chef for my number. She had my back and refused as well. He also brought me two tickets to a band I'd been wanting to see. VIP section 21 plus year old only. He said he could get me in but I had to go with him and him alone. I refused. He told me he could get me booze. I declined. For months and months this continued. I brought it up to one of my bosses but they laughed it off as class Classic Dave, when he wanted a hug on his birthday and hugged me without my consent. That's Dave for you. Offering to get me booze or pot? Ah, Dave, you scamp. When he pulled up his shirt and showed me his abdominal scar from a snowboarding accident, well, that's just Dave. No respect for boundaries, but a good worker. I seriously considered having one of my male friends come in under the guise of being my boyfriend just to placate Dave. I was repulsed by him, but he hadn't really done anything to classify himself as a predator. Besides asking for my number, he had never tried to harass me outside of work hours. And besides the odd hug or two that I was too afraid slash shy to refuse, he hadn't gotten super physical. Then one day, Dave was gone. His name disappeared from the employee roster. My boss asked to see me in the office. She informed me that Dave was no longer employed at their business. Dave had been fired. Dave was fired because Dave was a convicted offender. Davey here had two counts of assault and one count of kidnapping a minor from the mid-90s, about the time I was born actually. They had never background checked him, and when they contacted a friend of the police department, they found out that Dave had been lying on lots of paperwork, hiding the fact that he was a convicted felon and not notifying anyone when he moved. Once they brought this information to the police department's attention, they had a few more charges to add. They found out because a Apparently he had been stalking and harassing one of the clients he delivered to, showing up at her home when he should not have known where she lived. After his termination, Dave showed up to work one day. He had a weapon, but I never found out what he had. They told him to leave or the police would be called. He ended up leaving in handcuffs. I am so thankful I wasn't there that day. Another little tidbit, the police officer my bosses knew had been in the PD for a while and knew one of the officers who had arrested Dave in the 90s. That abdominal scar was from a run-in with the cops and he got injured trying to climb over a fence. That was a few years ago, but some Sometimes I still think about how badly things could have gotten had I gone to even one of those concerts with him. This happened when I was a bartender about four years ago, but I think about it often and has changed the way I operate throughout life. I now refuse to go to any store alone after midnight. For the story's sake, I will tell you that I was 25 and a blonde at the time. On a busy Friday night, I was bartending with the bar manager and he had noticed that they were very low on some bar necessities after the dinner rush. Lemons, limes, bitters, that kind of thing. So I was sent out to go to a 24-hour grocery store down the road to pick up the odds and ends that we would require to get us through the weekend. I picked up everything that was asked for me without trouble at the store, until I got to the liquor aisle. There were two country-looking guys that were probably around my age in the aisle and they were staring at me and whispering to each other in a way that made me uncomfortable as I assumed they were making comments about me. All pretty innocent so far. Before they could approach me, I grabbed what I needed very quickly and power walked to the self-checkout. I really booked it out of there because when you're a bartender, it's kind of like you are on stage and are required to be charming and interact with people that you otherwise absolutely wouldn't be able to tolerate unless you're getting paid to. Thus why I am not a bartender anymore. I get to the self-checkout and the two guys are on me. 
I'm scanning my stuff and they use the scanning station next to me. I get a better look at them now that they are right next to me. One is taller, muscular, and average looking. The other is shorter and more plump. They both looked dirty and their eyes were completely bloodshot, not sure if they were high on something or had already been drinking for a while. They continued to stare at me and our eyes awkwardly met, so I did just a polite smile to them. The taller one starts trying to talk to me, hey looks like you're ready to party huh? I replied with something like, yeah, something like that, it's not for me though. They walk closer to me and ignore their responsibility to scan their items. Oh, must be for your boyfriend huh? I flash a polite smile again and roll my eyes slightly, like, this is your hint that I'm not interested. The taller one continues to try to talk to me. You could come hang out with us tonight. We could show you a real good time if you know what I mean. I reply with, no thanks, I'm good. I have plans already. Well, the tall one starts to get upset that his moves aren't working like he hoped and starts using a more threatening tone and moves very close to me, like two inches away, but I ignore him, staying focused on the scanner. I don't think he had showered in a few days by the smell of him. He gets a little louder and says, I see how it is. You probably only screw doctors and rich men like that. You think you're too good for us. We can show you that you aren't. We can teach you a lesson. Now, I'm not sure in what kind context he meant, but it definitely wasn't good. Still not looking at him, I turn away so my body is blocking his view of my purse, which I set on the scanner to grab my 4-inch pocket knife out and slide it up my jacket sleeve in case I need to protect myself, acting like I am searching for my wallet. I do this, however, in view of the self-scan worker standing at her podium and look at her with wide eyes trying to communicate that I do not feel safe and I might need help. I turn back to the machine and slide my credit card to pay, while the creepy and hostile guys are practically standing on top of me. The machine malfunctions and starts beeping. The lady worker comes over immediately and the guys standing next to me change their expressions from, I am planning to torture you for a couple of days and toss your body in a creek, to, just your friendly good old country boys making polite conversation over here. They actually try to act like I knew them and we were friends so the worker wouldn't be alerted to their ill intentions. They tried joking with the worker saying I was stealing something, and that's why the machine went off. The worker was definitely not buying. It. She was a 6 plus foot tall woman with some muscle on her by the way. I wouldn't mess with her on my best day. Anyways, she presses a few buttons on the screen, shooting the guys a very unimpressed look when they were trying to act charming and cancels the order completely. She turns to me and says, I am sorry for the inconvenience ma'am. This machine seems to not be working correctly. Why don't you gather your things and I will bring you up at an actual register. She puts her hand on my back and gives me a wide eyed look like I gave her a minute earlier, letting me know that she sees I am in danger. I pick up my things to follow her to a register that is near the security office. The guys linger around the self-scan, still glaring at me, and eventually complete their purchase, but stand at the exit assuming they are waiting for me. I felt like I would be walking to my death if I made my exit in that moment. The worker keeps a close eye on the guys and scans my items. As she's scanning, she tells me that there wasn't really anything wrong with the machine I was using. It just misread my credit card. She said, I had a bad feeling about those guys from the moment they walked in, and I then saw them getting aggressive towards you. I already rang security to be ready to walk out to the parking lot and make sure you left safely when you were ready to leave. Then I saw you take that knife out and put it up your sleeve getting ready to protect yourself. As much as I'd like to see you show them they picked the wrong check to mess with, I'm glad I was able to pull you aside and make sure you are safe. I see them waiting by the door for you. I'll just keep pressing buttons on the screen and act like I'm having trouble with your order until they give up and go outside. Our security officer and I are both still going to escort you to your vehicle when you leave. I thought to myself, this woman seriously deserves a raise. I thanked her over and over again and told her what they said to me and I was getting afraid because I don't know what these guys are capable of. As I'm talking to her, my bar manager calls me to see what's taking so long. I explain what was happening and he was obviously very concerned and ready to come up there himself. By the time I hang up, the guys had given up and walked out to the parking lot. The worker said to give it another few minutes because she had a feeling they may still be in the parking lot waiting for me to walk out and see which vehicle was mine so they could follow me. My instant thought was, no way, they have to be gone by now. I was wrong. The worker and security guard escort me out and as it was after midnight, you can imagine how empty the parking lot was. Towards the back of the lot, there sat an old big pickup truck running with the lights on pointed towards the store. It was a huge parking lot, and it wouldn't have made sense for them to initially park like that. So I'm assuming they moved the truck to set that way so they had a full view of when I exited the store to go to my vehicle. It was like being stalked by very hungry lions. When I unlocked my car and they saw that me, the worker, and the guard were looking directly at them, and that I wasn't getting in my car until we watched them leave, they then peeled out of the parking lot. I mean, they seriously did a burnout to establish that they were pissed and trying to intimidate us or something. I thank the worker and the guard over and over again, as I am certain they had just saved my life, or at least, saved me from having to live with whatever those guys were planning on doing to me. I did write a long letter to the store manager and to their corporate location describing how their employees protected me and how grateful I was. I really hope that earned her a promotion, bonus, or raise. She didn't know me at all and was ready to protect me, which really isn't her job, but she did it anyways. Needless to say, I do not go late night shopping by myself anymore, never will again.
This is my brother's girlfriend's story. She doesn't have a Reddit account, but I've told her about this subreddit and she wanted to share her story because it's creepy but also a good lesson to learn from. I go to a school in a big city that is one of the least safe cities in the US. I chose this school for nursing and definitely not for the location. I live in a row house off the campus with four other girls. Cheaper and nicer than dorms, or so we thought. I guess you get what you pay for. We're all sophomores in college. As you would guess, we go out and drink, come back to do things we don't remember. We had just started our rent in August. Three floors, plus a basement which was padlocked by the owners. Understandable, we would definitely have parties down there to avoid immediate cleanup. The house was great, amazing location to the school and work. I am a CNA who works odd hours, important for later. It was not expensive, and in good condition. I had never lived with that many people before, just one roommate so before we definitely knew if one of us had misplaced or changed something. I started to notice my snacks were either half gone or completely gone. I was getting annoyed, but a house with many people, it's too much work to go and figure out who ate what so I ignored it. Slowly, we started making comments about someone eating our food but passive aggressively. We all just let it go because none of us want a whole house fight. I work until about 11 in the NICU. I get home at about 11.30 mostly on weeknights. I started to notice pants left out or snack wrappers around. I thought it was odd cause none of my roommates had done that before but just thought, oh they probably drank a bottle of wine then went to bed and forgot all about this. Again, my roommates started making comments. This time we started to ask because it was getting annoying that all of our food would disappear and things being left out. I knew it was one of them but no one wants to admit that they ate someone else's snacks in college. We chalked it up to the girl who always smokes and eats her weight in food. She swore it wasn't her. This went on for about two months. It got more obvious that someone was clearly taking everyone's food. It definitely had to be the girl that always smokes. I see her eat her whole snack pantry in a night. Come to find out it was not her. One night at work I was about to get off but a situation happened and I ended up leaving about 12.30. I took the bus home. I got home and was about to collapse. I wanted to go to bed ASAP. I walked in the front door and the stairs are directly in front of you. You can also see down the side into the kitchen. I walked in and saw someone in the kitchen but was way too tired to say hi. I thought it could end in like a 30 minute conversation about nothing so I went straight upstairs. When I got to the second floor I noticed all of my roommates doors were closed which always means they're either all in their room for the night or asleep. I got a weird feeling, just something that made it click. I texted our house group chat asking if anyone was in the kitchen. I felt stupid for even asking. Two responded no, and they said the other two had been asleep. I knew it wasn't any of my roommates down there at that moment. I dialed 911 but didn't press call. I crept into my roommate's room across the hall. Thankfully, she didn't have her door locked. I whispered telling her I think someone is in the house. She gave me the whitest eyes ever and almost looked like she was going to cry. She didn't suspect anything like I had, but for reference there was a shooting in the house two doors down only weeks earlier by an intruder. She mouthed to make the call. The whole time we were dead silent, we didn't hear anything at all. I was starting to think I was seeing things after such a long day at work and was regretting that I dialed thinking I'm going to look like an idiot when they show up and I was just exhausted and dreaming. We explain what's going on and they said that they will send someone ASAP. That actually does mean right away since it is a big and dangerous city. The police showed up and I didn't even want to go downstairs, but the operator confirmed it was them so I did. The police come in and look around. I'm thinking, I look so dumb right now. They ask if there are any other floors. We tell them technically the basement but it's padlocked so not really. They check the basement just in case. And well they were right. A man had been living in the padlocked basement. The lock was pulled off the hinge and just kind of propped against the wall. We never looked at that though, we rarely went out back. The guy had taken a comforter out of the hall closet and had a mattress from somewhere in his clothes. He was the one moving and eating all of our stuff. He would come out in the middle of the night and do it. He started getting more comfortable. I'm not sure if he was drugged out and forgot to clean his tracks or if he didn't really care. Me and my roommates have pretty consistent schedules during the week, probably letting him think that any time after about 12 was good to come out. We never slept with our individual doors locked and that's what freaks me out the most. He had access to any one of us at any moment, and we had no idea. A little backstory, when I was 19, I lived with my mom in a ranch style house on a road that backed up to a large field. On the other side was the main highway, about a half mile down from me was a loony farmer, and about a mile on the other side of me was pretty much a drug house. I guess someone used to live there, but it was run down. I will say that they were pretty quiet, other than those two houses we were isolated. At the time I was working full time and going to school full time. One of my classes ended at 10.30pm, I often wouldn't get home that day of the week until about 11.15ish. I was driving home 
one night and I noticed some guy walking down the road. He had a yellow shirt and track pants. I remember his outfit because it was weird. It wasn't weird to see people walking down my road because of the whole drug house thing, but I instinctively looked over at him when I drove past. He turned and smiled and waved, which freaked me out. So I speed the half mile home and pull into the driveway, weirded out. I made sure all the doors and windows were secure and then sat on the couch to be a paranoid freak and wait to make sure the dude walked past my house. Except he didn't. And there was another guy with him, dressed in darker clothes. They actually walked up my driveway and started playing around with my car, testing the handles and stuff. In my hurry, I forgot to grab my phone from my car, so I was kind of worried that's what they were after until the guy in yellow started approaching my door. I'm freaking out, so I go and wake my mom up. She's bleary and I'm trying to explain the situation when we both hear the doorknob turn very slowly. Good thing it was deadbolted. She got out of bed, walked to the door, and then yellow shirt knocked. I perched up on the couch so I could get a good look at him and his friend, still in the driveway. The porch light was on because of the sensor. Yeah, my mom said, you dropped your wallet. I told my mom that I had my wallet, it was in my purse. So she calmly told him that she had her wallet and it was too late to be knocking on people's doors. I remember perfectly what he said next, even though this was about six years ago. Okay, I'm not a bad guy, just so you know. We were all pretty still. No one moved, not even the guy at the door. Not even when the porch light went off. Then he tried the handle again. My mom told me to call the cops so she could get the gun and I told her I didn't have my phone. So she walked to the kitchen to grab hers from the charger. She handed me the phone and walked to the bathroom. I stared out of the window into the backyard. Then she went to her room to grab her Ruger. I was talking to the cops and explaining the situation all while watching the two guys. Explaining that they were two suspicious guys at our door when my mom came back out and said, one in our backyard too, which explained why she had looked out the bathroom window. She glimpsed him from the kitchen and went to get a more discreet look. My mom walked back over to the door with her gun and loudly said, if he tries the handle again, I'm just going to open the door and shoot him. I don't know why she said that instead of waiting for the cops to arrive, but the guys took off down the road. I told her and she rushed to the bathroom, where the guy apparently in the backyard saw his friends running down the road and sprinted off too. They were going in the direction of the drug house. The cops searched our house and our yard and went to the drug house, where they found five dudes hanging around. One was the yellow shirt guy and I'm assuming his friends were with him. They did get arrested and nothing weird like that ever happened again, but I was on edge for a while. I still make sure the doors are locked at all times every day, even though I live in a much nicer area now. This was back in 2015 or 2016. I'm a career tow truck driver. At this point, I've been towing cars for most of my adult life, and will likely do so until I either retire or die, whichever comes first. At the time, I was working for a pretty small towing company with only two employees, and we rotated who was on call each weekend. It was my weekend on call, and it was summer, so with people being out and about late and whatnot, I was pretty busy. Cleaning up accidents, towing broken down cars both in the city and off the highway. I was fine with it, as I was paid commission at the time, so the more calls I did, the more money I made. So it's Saturday night, now Sunday morning, and it's around 2.33 in the morning, and like I said, I've been busy, I'm tired, a little grumpy, and kinda wanna go home when my phone rings. It's an insurance company calling asking if we can do a tow for one of their customers who has broken down on the side of the highway. The breakdown location they give me is about 15 miles out of town, which I normally wouldn't do, but the tow destination happens to be a dealership that's just a couple of minutes from my apartment. I contemplate rejecting the call, but because I'm paid commission, I figure screw it. I could run up and grab this car, drop it off around the corner from my place, then hopefully I can head home and get a couple of hours of shut eye. So I take the call and hop on the highway. The insurance company provided me with the customer's first name, which we'll say was Kara, and gave me a phone number for her. Usually I try to make contact with people who are on the side of the highway to let them know I'm on my way and give them an ETA. I try calling her a couple of times, but she doesn't answer, not unusual. After a short while, I see hazard lights up the way on the shoulder, so I turn on my strobes and start slowing down. As I approach, I noticed that not only is there the late model car that I'm looking for, but there's another car on scene as well that doesn't have its hazards on, but it's parked in front of the car I'm meant to tow. This is annoying but not uncommon, as I need to be able to get in front of the disabled car in order to load it and sometimes people don't realize that, but because the other car is there, I instead pull up behind both cars. You do this so that as the tow driver, you're the one that has to make the weird maneuver of pulling off the shoulder and back onto the shoulder, and that the other car just has to drive straight forward on the shoulder. Otherwise, if I pulled up in front, then the other car would have to go around me and it's unprofessional and unsafe to make them do that. Standing in the trunk of the late model car, which is now directly in front of me, are a man and a woman. The woman is probably in her early 20s and dressed to the nines for a nine out. She's about 5 foot 1 or 5 foot 2. She's wearing tight leather-ish or something pants, a halter top, long black hair. The man is probably around 5 foot 10 and skinny, maybe 150 to 160 pounds, wearing a dark hoodie and dirty jeans. They're standing very close and facing each other. She has her arms crossed and he's leaning down talking 
speaking to her. I step out of my truck and approach them both, introduce myself. They separate a few feet and I look to the woman and say, are you Kara? She nods. I say I'm here for her insurance company and I ask what's going on with the car. Immediately, the man pipes up and says, yeah, it's just having some fuel issues. It's an easy fix. Can you just drop it off at this commuter parking lot? I'm going to fix it for her there. I'm rather annoyed at this because the commuter lot in question is further up the highway and I'm already 15 miles out of town. Like I said before, I only took this call because it was supposed to be coming back toward my apartment and I really wanted to go home. Not only that, but in order to change the original tow destination, I would have to call the insurance company back, wait on hold for who knows how long for a representative, and then let them know the change and try to get them to pay me extra for the deadhead miles back home after unloading. And I really didn't want to do any of this. And thirdly, this is a late model car. I'm no mechanic, but it's new enough that whatever's wrong with it is likely covered under warranty, so the dealership is really the best place for it to go anyways. I explain all of this to the guy, but he's really not having it. He gets stern with me, saying something like, look man, you just need to take the car where I tell you to take it. We go back and forth on this for maybe 60 seconds and he's just getting madder. Well, you know what man, you're not the name insured, Kara is. The easy way to settle this is to ask what she wants me to do with the car, and whatever she says is what I'll do. Fingers crossed she'll want to take it to the dealership so I can get home sooner. I turn to look at Kara to ask her that question and I don't see her right away. She's no longer standing where she just was a minute ago, which was slightly off to my right. I continue to not see her until I've turned almost all the way around, because she's standing directly behind me, and by directly I mean within an inch of my back, arms still crossed. I look down at her and she locks eyes with me. Her eyes are as white as plates, almost owl-like, and immediately it feels like she's staring into my soul. She didn't say a word and she didn't have to. I took a step back and did what felt like a double-double take. I looked at him, then at her, then at him again, and then back at her. And it slowly started to dawn on me that maybe something isn't right. I ask her, do you know this guy? And she ever so slightly shook her head no. Without a word, the guy starts to move for Kara, and I move to stay in between them. He tries to push me out of his way by shoving me in the chest, but because I believe he underestimated my weight, only pushed me hard enough to make me take a single step back. Immediately, I took that step forward towards him and body check him, hard, as hard as I could, hard enough to completely knock him over basically onto his back. Because we rotated during the back and forth push bit, Kara is now in front of me to my right, somewhat between me and the guy who's trying to scramble to his feet. I reached out and snatched the poor girl up by her waist, spun her towards my truck and yelled for her to get into the driver's side, and she does so. I turn back to the guy, who is standing up again at this point and he's breathing hard. He gets right up in my face but doesn't do anything, just breathes at me. I stare him right in his face and tell him, you need to go. I'm shaken now and I'm absolutely terrified. I don't know if he has a weapon, I don't know if he's going to try to fight me, and I don't know what I would do if he did. After probably around 15 seconds or so, which felt like eons, he kind of huffs a bit, smiles one of the creepiest smiles I've ever seen, and starts to back off. Sucking his teeth and rubbing his hands together, he slowly walks backwards a few steps, then makes his way to the front car, gets in and drives off. I stayed motionless, watching him until I could no longer see his taillights. I got Kara's car loaded up on the tow truck, and as we made our way to the dealership, she told me through tears that her car had shut off while she was driving, and she pulled onto the shoulder and called her parents, because she was on their insurance. Her parents made the call to the insurance company, who eventually dispatched me to her location. While she was waiting, a bit after she made the call, the guy pulled up in front of her and walked up to her passenger side window to try to talk to her, asking if she needed help, etc. And she told him she was fine, that a tow truck was coming and that she didn't need help. He persisted and she tried to tell him off and eventually tried to roll up on the window. Apparently he stuck his arm in the window and got the door unlocked and opened the door. In fear she jumped out of the car leaving her phone inside and ran to the back of her car and stayed put there because it was in the line of sight of traffic. Apparently he was pretty lewd with her and whenever she tried to go back to the car he would prevent her from getting in. Several minutes later I showed up. Who knows what would have happened had the timing been any different. Her parents were waiting at the dealership when we arrived and she told them what had just happened. Her parents gave me a $20 tip, which was all the cash they had on them at the time, and Kara gave me a very tight and clearly heartfelt hug before I left. I never saw her again. To set the tone, I always hated the town I lived in. I moved there alone when I was 18 for college and quickly regretted it. It was a decent sized town but full of not decent people. Nearly every gas station was robbed frequently, there were shootings in broad daylight, robberies, you name it. Well for the first three years I lived with roommates on a side of town that wasn't awful but it was sketchy. So when I was making decent enough money I moved out on my own. The house was tiny, maybe 500 square feet if that, super old and poorly built. It was just me living there so I didn't mind how small it was 
was. But what originally sold me was that it was in the middle of nowhere. It was surrounded by a bunch of fields and some wooded areas with only a few houses nearby. Considering I hated being in the town due to the continuous paranoia of getting mugged or shot, I love the idea of living out there. So at the beginning of July I moved in. Everything seemed super swell minus not being able to get good internet. A month goes by and everything is still swell to me and I decided to get a dog to keep me company. He also loved the place and spent long amounts of time lounging about the yard and trying to convince the nearest neighbor to walk over and pet him. Important later. Roughly two months into living there I started to notice things at a place. Something to note is that an old roommate of mine was using my spare room as a storage place until he got moved himself so he had a key but was never there. He kind of just popped in every once every other week to grab something and usually let me know beforehand. But I'd come home to my kitchen chair being pulled away from my table or a bowl in the sink, things like that. There were such small things I wrote off as my roommate swinging by or just stuff I was forgetting. But then my dog developed this crazy bad separation anxiety. Up until now he didn't even care when I left. He just lay on the couch and chewed his toys. He never barked, never did anything weird. However, all of a sudden he began acting really awful every time I tried to leave. He'd literally cram his body through the door as I was closing it, screaming and barking and wouldn't stop until I came back in the house. He didn't want me to leave him there alone, at all. I couldn't afford a kennel for him yet so I decided one day that I'd put a movie in while I was out, thinking maybe the sound of people talking might keep him calm down. I only had to finish one task up at work and knew I'd be home early so I put in a copy of Hamlet. I know, boring, but I chose it because the copy I have is 5 hours long. I knew it would be playing when I came back. Flash forward 3 hours, long before Hamlet should have been over but when I walked in the door not only was the movie not playing but the TV and the Xbox were completely off. I immediately called my roommate and asked if he had been over and he wasn't even in town. I explained the TV situation to him and he shrugged it off as the TV powering off when it idles for a while. Even though this is true, there are several reasons I know this isn't the case. 1. It wasn't idling. A 5 hour movie was supposed to be playing. 2. Even if it had shut off, my Xbox wouldn't have. I have left it on by accident for weeks that was gone out of town or whatever and it was still on when I came home. Always. But it was completely powered down this time. The weird thing is none of my stuff was missing and the door was locked when I entered. I eventually convinced myself that it was something weird with the Xbox or whatever and shrugged it off. That is until my dog started acting even weirder. Remember earlier I mentioned he used to play with a neighbor? Well all of a sudden, if she even walked by the house while he was out, he'd start yelping and running at me away from her. This was incredibly weird to me and made me incredibly cautious of her. I put some cheap alarms on my doors, the kind that go off when the doors opened, and slept with my pistol handy. The second night the alarms were on my doors, I was woken up by the one on the back door going off. I flew out of my bed with my pistol, trying to convince myself that I was about to shoot some intruder, but once I got to the door it was shut and there was nobody there. The alarm had been knocked all the way across the room. The door would have had to open for it to be chucked like that. It couldn't have fallen off and landed there. Something else weird, the door was locked, but not the way I had locked it. I always locked the knob and the deadbolt, but upon checking my lock after this, only the door knob was locked. The police wouldn't do much as I had no witnesses, no lead, and they didn't have much to go on. Needless to say, I changed the locks. I didn't have any noticeable problems inside after that, but later found out that the close neighbor that my dog hated had previously lived in the house I was renting, and the locks had never been changed. I have no way to prove my theory, but it's pretty obvious she had a key and was coming and going as she pleased. Why though, I can't figure out. Nothing of mine ever went missing. The most unsettling part for me though, is that she had tried to come in at night until the alarm scared her off. How many times has she been in my house at night while I was asleep, and why? Not sure. Luckily though, I don't live there anymore and never plan to move back there. A while ago, I was staying in an upscale hotel in the safe area of a large midwestern city. I am a 16 year old female and I was in a room all by myself, with my parents a few doors down. In theory, this isn't unsafe by any means, but I had bad luck on this particular trip. Our first night there passed without incident. Me in my room, my parents in theirs. I watched a pay-per-view movie and ate way too much from the snack bar. I didn't have any reason to feel unsafe. The next morning, we did the usual tourist stuff that one does when visiting a new city. As we ate a breakfast in the hotel restaurant, I noticed a man who looked to be in his 60s staring at me for an abnormally long amount of time. I ignored it and chalked it up to him thinking I looked like his granddaughter or something. The next night, my parents allowed me to meet up with a friend for dinner who lived in the area. He met me in the hotel lobby and we had a nice dinner and then went back to the hotel for drinks. Yes, I am underage, I had a drink, my bad. Coincidentally, the same man who had been eyeing me earlier was at the bar. This time, I knew I didn't remind him of his granddaughter. Even with my buff guy friend 
next to me. His eyes traced my body. I felt unsettled and mentioned it to my friend, Ethan, who glanced over and also seemed really weirded out by how obvious this guy was leering. We left the bar quickly and by now, it was around 12.30 a.m. Ethan walked me to the elevators of the hotel and once I pushed the button, I left. I wish I would have asked him to stay, because no sooner had he walked away that my creeper came, rounding the corner, and stood there waiting with me for the elevator. I felt so uncomfortable knowing that he would be seeing what floor I was going to, but it hadn't occurred to me to get off on a different floor at the time, and even if it did, he planned on following me, so it would have been just as bad a move. When we were in the elevator together, I tried to keep my eyes averted from his, but they literally bore into my body. He kept trying to step closer and I kept backing up, too scared to even speak. What freaked me out more was that he hadn't pressed a separate elevator button, so he planned on getting off when I did. When I got to my floor, I almost ran to my room, and the guy just stood at the end of the hallway, waiting to see where I was going. I stayed in my room for 15 minutes until I was sure he was gone before I told my parents what had happened. They were freaked out and told the hotel staff, but there was no sign of the guy and it was really late, so I just locked my door and tried to get to sleep. I had almost drifted off when I heard a knock at my door. I obviously wouldn't just go and open the door at nearly 2am. Instead, I turned on a light and froze. At this point, my intuition had kicked in and I knew it was the guy. I was near tears but the knocking kept continuing, harder and harder, so I finally shouted and asked who it was. The voice that replied to me was the most chilling thing I had ever heard. High pitched but growly, almost giggly, and so disturbing I could barely describe it. It's hotel staff, please let me in. I was terrified. A look through the people confirmed that it was the same creepy old guy. I locked myself in the bathroom and called my dad's phone. He has a habit of always keeping his ringer on, so he answered me almost immediately and I tried to tell him what was wrong through my tears. The guy before, I managed, is at my door. And what happened next gives me nightmares. My dad naturally went into superhero mode and opened his door to find the old man in just a robe, whacking it. It's pretty obvious to piece together what he was planning. My dad slugged the dude in the face and made sure he didn't move an inch while my mom called hotel security. We press charges and the guy is in prison now. Some backstory before I begin. These events started when I was in second or third grade, 2002 to 2003 ish, and ended during the fall of 2015. I'm a 21 year old female living in Canada. The RCMP are involved in the story, which stands for Royal Canadian Mounted Police. When I was in elementary school, I was friends with a girl named Jessica. We had a group of five or six girls that we always played with. Jessica's parents were divorced, and I often went over to her dad's house after school because they had a trampoline and a slide. Her dad was a totally normal normal dude. His name was Richard and he held a job as a pilot which is definitely a job that requires mental stability. Jessica came over to my house as well and her dad would always come pick her up after the play date so he was familiar with where I lived. And I think second or third grade, Jessica moved away to live with her mom. I didn't fully understand what was going on as a child and I still don't know what happened, but something had gone wrong with her father. We didn't hear much from Jessica, but around her birthday the following year, Richard invited our group of girls over for a surprise birthday party. We arrived at the party and we were waiting for Jessica so we could surprise her, but Jessica never showed up. We were just hanging out with her dad for a while. As a child, this didn't seem as weird as it does to me now. When our parents picked us up, we obviously told them what happened, and we didn't hang out with Jessica or Richard again. After that, some of the girls started receiving presents from Richard at their homes. I never received them, but my mother told me about it years later. The presents usually consisted of cheap jewelry and notes. I have no idea what the notes said, but I'm not sure if I want to. After this, Richard goes away. My mom later told me he he was in a mental institution. Years go by, I completely forget about the whole situation. Then, in the winter of 2013, I was out of town for a cheer competition. I was scrolling through Facebook one night when all of a sudden a new group chat popped up with five girls from my elementary school. I had not kept in touch with any of them, so this was weird. The chat was about how they had received messages from Richard on Facebook. I checked the other folder of my Facebook messages and sure enough, I had some too. I had a variety of messages that did not make a lot of sense, including some strange poems. Many of the messages were descriptions of dreams he had about me. Though some of them were nonsense, others were understandable enough to come across as violently threatening. I don't feel comfortable sharing some of the more explicit messages, but here are a couple of the shorter and less scary messages. Hi little girl from not long ago, pristine of pristinus, I want you, I want you, I want you. We're gonna have planets to go to someday provided you don't melt them first. I'm so proud of you, stay happy, and I haven't found a way to keep you all off my mind. I clicked on Richard's Facebook profile and his whole profile was dedicated to his five girls. 
Charles. He didn't have any friends added, so clearly nobody had seen it. Unfortunately, we didn't have very good security settings on Facebook. He had saved dozens of photos of us, and they reposted them with nonsensical and inappropriate captions. The captions ranged from essays about his love for us, to a one-sentence caption that simply said, she is so ugly. Here are some of the shorter photo captions. Emily, hopefully and not too soon, I'm gonna find out your address, and I'm gonna show up as a man that knocks on your front doorstep and bite your bottom lip off before you can say a word. Kiara, because of my initial euphoria, turns into sucking depression when I realize that there is nothing I can do about anything beside you because you're inside me, and I can't get you out of my mind. I love you so much. Melissa, can I paint your picture? I want to lift you around to see how heavy you are and well go for a drive on Hollywood Drive with the windows rolled down so we can get a crystal clear view. We were all freshly 18 at the time and didn't know what to do, so our moms contacted the RCMP. They told us not to block Richard on Facebook, but not to reply as the messages could be used as evidence. He continued to send us messages every single day, and we shared the screenshots with each other in the group chat and sent them off to the RCMP. He had several different Facebook accounts that were all variations of his name along with one randomly named Esteban. One of the girls got in touch with Jessica to find out if she still had contact with her father. She only saw him on supervised visits every once in a while. She was very embarrassed and apologized a lot. She was a super sweet girl and obviously none of us were upset at her in any way. Eventually, Richard was charged with five counts of criminal harassment. He pled guilty and went to jail for around five months. When he got out, there was still a no contact order in place meaning that he could not contact any of us girls or come within a certain radius of our homes. He was not allowed to use the internet either. I'm not sure how all of this works, but this is what the constable handling the case told me. However, not surprisingly, he started contacting us on Facebook again. He went back to jail for breaching his probation. It was the summer of 2015 and he got out again. I started receiving more messages. I immediately wrote on the group chat to see if the other girls had gotten anything. They hadn't. It was just me. I immediately contacted the police. It seems they had forgotten to include my name on the no contact order. He knew not to contact the other girls, but thought it was still safe for him to contact me. This time things got worse. I had just started working at a new job, and being the idiot that I am, I had my workplace public on my Facebook profile. One day I came into work and there was a package waiting for me. I was obviously confused because I would never order something to be delivered to my work. I opened it up with my managers and there was weed inside along with a disc with encryption software on it. He had mailed me weed to my work. I knew immediately that this was him, and awkwardly explained the situation to my managers who thought it was hilarious. The security in my office tower was alerted and given a photo of him. They began walking me to my bus stop after my shifts. It was scary knowing that he knew where I worked. At this point, I hadn't seen Richard in years, but it was clear that he was mentally unwell. I had absolutely no idea what he was capable of or what his motives were. The RCMP did not seem to take this case very seriously, and they moved very slowly, passing the case around to various officers. Meanwhile, I was terrified. I could hardly walk down my street at night without freaking out. Every time somebody knocked on my door while I was home alone, I would drop whatever I was doing and hide under the kitchen counters. I had I had not moved since I was a child, so it was very possible that he remembered where I lived. The packages kept coming. I received more weed in several different forms, including cookies, what appeared to be cocaine, and a key to his apartment along with some miscellaneous items. I opened all the packages at the police station. One of the packages included a USB stick with a bunch of audio recordings on them, but I decided it was better for me not to listen to them. The return of the packages was to a random PO box in another city that did not belong to Richard, and no fingerprints were found on the packages. During all of this, the Facebook message messages were made constant. Luckily, in one of the messages he informed me that he had sent me drugs and the key along with his home address. This confirmed that the packages were from him. He was charged again. I received a subpoena in the mail to appear as a witness in court. However, he once again pled guilty and I never got to go to court. I was actually a bit disappointed as I thought seeing him in person would provide me with some sort of closure. He is still locked up somewhere as I am writing this, but I still get scared walking at night or when somebody knocks on the door. The police provided me zero information on where he was being held or when he would be released. I feel like I am just waiting for the day that he will contact me again. I just hope that he never does. I had just moved out of a share house in the suburbs and into my own one bedroom apartment in the city. I'm a male and at the time was around 25 years old. My apartment, while old and small, was located about 500 meters from one of the most popular night spots in the inner city. As I was in my mid 20s and out on my own, this was the perfect place for me. This was because my friends and I were quite social and would frequent bars and nightclubs in the city and the taxi fares were starting to add up. Also, this new apartment was close to my work so it made sense. I got settled in right away and invited 
have my friends over for pre-drinks before hitting the clubs. Due to the limited space in the apartment, this meant that some friends were inside and some were drinking on the walkway just out front. We had the music up and I just started drinking but between songs, I could hear the couple next door arguing. Now, the apartment was old and bad which meant thin walls too, so I pressed an ear to the wall in order to listen in. I hadn't met any of my new neighbors at this time as I didn't take long to move in and I didn't really see anyone during. I was curious. Judging from what I could determine while eavesdropping, they were a gay couple in their early 30s. One of the men was yelling at the other to go next door and tell us to keep it down. The other was arguing that it was just a housewarming and to let it go for the night. Since I didn't want to cause trouble, I marshaled everyone outside to start making our way to the nightclubs, leaving my new neighbors in peace. Later that night, I came home alone as I was tired from the move. I decided to let my friends carry on partying without me. I arrived at my door and proceeded to fumble around for my keys when I looked up to see a man standing in the walkway in front of the next apartment smoking a cigarette. He was tall and thin with brown oily hair. I noticed that he also had a cut lip and a faded but still visible black eye. I said, sorry about the noise earlier, correctly assuming he was my neighbor. He replied, nah you're alright man, I'm Chris by the way. I shook his hand. I noticed his knuckles were red and a little bit scratched up so I knew something was off. I apologized for the noise and said, I hope I didn't cause any trouble for you. He withdrew his hand and with a soft but cracking voice said, nah, that's okay, Rick just gets a bit cranky sometimes, I'm used to it. With that, I finished off the conversation and told Chris that I'd see him later. It was about 2am at this point and I just wanted to sleep but couldn't help worrying about the potential domestic abuse going on next door. I decided to just keep an eye on it for now as I didn't have all the info, for all I knew, he could have gotten into a fight with someone else. As the weeks passed, I noticed that my new neighbors got drunk regularly and would argue almost every time. I could tell that Rick was the dominant one as his voice was a lot deeper and Chris seemed to be afraid of him during their shouting matches. This is why I kept my distance and never really socialized with them. I would even overhear them arguing about me and that Rick thought that Chris liked me etc. I would just tune all of this out with headphones and video games, not to mention an active social life and full time work to keep me occupied. I did find myself avoiding having guests over because of the neighbors. I would opt to meet people out as their arguments could be quite upsetting. This was working out fine enough for a while until Christmas Eve that same year. I was arriving home after coming from last minute Christmas shopping. I was getting ready for a night of present wrapping as I was to visit my family the following day for Christmas. As I arrived home, I noticed two police cars outside and Anna, an Asian woman who lived a few apartments up from Chris was screaming. I asked her what was happening and all she said was, it's just so sad, while sobbing. I could see three officers trying to restrain somebody and there was blood on their uniforms. I came just a little bit closer to see Chris's oily brown hair in the center of the affray. His face was bleeding from his jaw where he had apparently been slashed by something sharp. They got him to his feet and I could see that his cheek had been cut so deep that the skin was flapping open as he struggled and resisted with the police. I recoiled in shock and went to comfort Anna who was crying uncontrollably at this point. Suddenly, Rick's voice boomed out from nowhere. You see what you've done, you loser. This frightened me and my instinct was to get myself and Anna to safety. Even though the cops were here, they had their hands full with Chris and I certainly didn't want to get involved in such an ugly fight where knives were involved. Anna refused to come with me and said that she would be fine. I looked around to see where Rick was as he kept yelling at Chris the whole time, the three cops struggled to restrain him. I could hear Chris whimpering apologetically in between. I couldn't see where Rick was so I decided just to go to my apartment and lock the door. As I turned to go, I froze in horror as Rick's voice boomed, where are you going? A deep chill went down my spine as my brain struggled to reconcile the fact that these words were coming out of Chris's mouth. I felt panic grip me as I realized that all this time Rick and Chris were the same person. All the fighting, laughing, drinking, and carry on that I couldn't help overhearing over the last couple of months had come from one solitary person. A lonely guy in his small one bedroom apartment. For some reason that made me feel sick. I learned later from Anna that this wasn't the first time the police had to come take Chris away. Anna explained that he spends a couple of months at the local psychiatric hospital each time. His father owns the apartment so it's here waiting for him when he gets out. I moved out a few months later and while it is a sad situation for Chris, I really do feel him. Today was like any other, just another ordinary day, working by myself in the store, checking out customers, stocking shelves in my moments away from the register. A normal day. At some point while on register, I greeted a man with a large dark beard, bald, and wearing glasses as he came through the door. He immediately smiled and got that surprised look on his face after seeing me as if he had just found his next victim. Eventually, after about an hour or two of being on register, I'd pretty much cleaned the store out of my customers and moved on to stocking candy. The man before 
before with a beard approaches me with a smile and holds up a large white trash can. Uh, excuse me. Yes, I reply, glancing up from the box I'm stalking. Are there any more of these in the back? This one doesn't have a lid, he says, gesturing to the large trash can in hand. Oh yeah, I can check for you. I smile and turn away and head toward the stock room. I notice he's following me and think nothing of it, but glance down the aisles for any other customers as I walk, immediately taking note of the store's emptiness. Well, I guess it's just us in the store, I think to myself. Moving through the stock room door, I'm quickly relieved this guy stops at the entrance. I'll be right back, I say, as I make a turn around some full roll tainers, which due to just receiving a truck, our stock room is full of them. They stand very tall and are like giant movable walls, but very heavy, mind you. Being short myself, I don't have to move them much to make a path through and see what's on them. So after only a minute, I've made myself a little path, having three heavy ones on my right and left and in front of me. I decide to give up my search for trash cans. Sign, I go to turn around and inform him of my defeat only to find he's in my tiny path of walls. A very tight squeeze for a man of his stature, standing directly behind me. Find them? Uh, no, I don't think I have any. I try to laugh and avoid acknowledging the creepy situation. I'm in a very small area with walls at my back and sights towering over myself and this very robust man standing in the way of my only exit, in a room very far from any customers with no cameras and no other employees in the store. I'm helpless and increasingly growing scared at how this man isn't moving to let me out. I go to voice that I need to return to work after a solid minute goes by, but I am not able to get out a single word before he says in this creepy, almost shy voice, you're just the cutest little thing, did you know that? Within an instant, I'm scared and feel ill attention from the sky. Surprising myself though, I choke out without thinking. I just heard my bell, what? He looks confused but doesn't budge. I just heard my bell, there are people up front who need to be checked out and are looking for me. I stand nervously knowing full well neither of us heard the familiar ching from the service bell I keep on register. But what about my trash can, he asks, stepping forward but taking a glance back toward the trash can. And again, with lightning thinking, I blurt out, I'll mark it down half price, no big deal, laughing and trying to act like nothing is out of the ordinary. I slip by him, seeing my opening at his turning around. I try my hardest to walk away, pretending to be calm as I exit the stock room, then sprint to the front of the store the moment I was out of sight. He wound up leaving without purchasing the trash can. So, creepy guy who I expect to pull something like that again, I hope you and I don't meet again. My fiance and I threw a dinner party one time to celebrate his mom completing chemo. I hired a caterer. We were expecting 25 friends and family, so it was more than the kitchenette of our single story ranch house could handle. We'd also only just moved in, so didn't have a lot of cooking staples. The caterer said he'd bring everything 75% done, but he needed to finish off some dishes in our kitchen. I told him that was fine as long as he was finished by 5, because the kitchen is centrally located and we'd prefer everyone be finished before the guests arrive due to the intimate nature of the occasion. He said that would be fine. He arrives as scheduled at 12 p.m. We gave him until 5 and the guests aren't even arriving until 6, so it's plenty of time. He smelled bad. It was more than a sweat smell though. It smelled like sunbaked diaper and that made me uneasy because he was going to be preparing food for sick prior and young kids. I just made sure he washed his hands and then left him to his own devices worrying I was being presumptuous. Throughout the entire process, he keeps pulling me aside to ask me questions and have me taste things. I was super busy because my husband had to work during the day and pick up the surprise guest right after. So setting up the deck, decorating, putting together the slideshow equipment, coordinating the surprise guest, we flew in her sister and I had to make sure she got an Uber at the airport and her hotel had worked out etc and just a million other little details. So every 10 minutes being asked things like, do you prefer this with paprika or without? With this fine, whatever you think, tasted to be sure, was getting old. When he was still there at 545, after two gentle reminders, I flat out told him I needed him completely out by 6 no matter what. He apologized and said there had been a delay because our oven wouldn't stay up to temperature. I never had a problem with our oven, but I figured he's the professional. Maybe it was a subtle problem. A little before six rolls around, a few of our friends start trickling in. I decide to tell him whatever's done is done, and whatever isn't, he should just put in the fridge. But he's nowhere to be found. I go out on the deck to ask my friends if they'd seen him, and he's out there, alcoholic beverage in hand, out of his chef whites, and now in a t-shirt and jeans, mingling with my friends. I walked out just in time for him to introduce himself to my cousin-in-law as a good friend of mine. Nope, too weird for me. I met him in person for the first time barely six hours ago. I told him he needed to leave, now. So he goes inside and gets his bag and makes a beeline for my bedroom. I'm taken aback. I say, excuse me, where are you going? And he says, to change. So, first of all, we have a guest bathroom clearly visible. Second, why can't he wear a t-shirt and jeans home? I tell him I'm not comfortable with him going to my room, but he insisted to only be a second and goes in and shuts and locks the door. I couldn't even get a word out before he went in and I felt helpless. I was going outside to ask one of my friends to 
to help me usher him out, but at that point my fiance got there with my aunt-in-law. I had to explain the situation to him nearly in tears at this point, and he was like, what? He went in the bedroom? Why? So he pounded on the door, and the caterer came out, still in a t-shirt and jeans, and my fiance said, you shouldn't be in there, you need to leave. And the caterer said, excuse me, but this is not your house, it is not up to you to decide. And my 6 foot 4, 260 pound fiance tells him, yes, actually, it is his house, and puts a hand on his back and guides him to the door. The caterer says, I thought she lived here, referencing me, and he says, yes, my fiance lives here with me and the caterer goes nuts. He turns to me and screams, you lied to me. I have no clue what he's talking about. He starts yelling about how I let him on and calling me more names. I don't know who he thought the man in the pictures with me around the house was. So my fiance says, oh no, you won't talk that way in my house. Find the door. And the caterer goes in the kitchen and starts throwing the trays of food out of the refrigerator and onto the floor. At that point, my fiance realized two of his brothers, both currently offensive linemen at the college level, had come in and were on the deck. He signaled to them and they came inside and he basically said, Said, this guy's harassing my fiance. They helped my fiance out. The party then went on as planned, but I insisted we just order pizza and throw out all the food he made. My fiance and friends kept saying, Isn't that a bit much? But I was insistent. We went out late drinking with his brothers and got home around 3 30 a.m. and passed out in our room. At around 5 a.m., I was woken up to the sound of the door opening. I figure either we forgot to lock the door in our drunken stupor and it blew open, or one of his family forgot their keys or something in the house and didn't want to wake us. His parents and his local brother have a key, but his parents never ever let themselves in when they know we're home. And his brother had even more than we did and was definitely not awake and driving around at 5am. It wasn't nearly windy enough for the door to have blown open, it had been tranquil all night. So I wake up my fiance and whisper, someone just came in the house, and he said the same thing. Probably my brother left his wallet or something. I figure I'm being paranoid and try to put it to rest when I hear a loud crash sound. With that, my fiance was up and on his feet in one movement. He told me to lock myself in the closet and call 911 while he he went and looked around. As I was pulling out my phone, we hear in the distinct accent, hello, and I realize it's just this insane caterer. I'm not worried about this caterer physically overpowering my fiance, or me for that matter, so I charge right out there. The caterer is shirtless and clearly on something. He's taking the pictures that are of just me off the wall and holding several in his arms already. He lunges toward me when he sees me. My fiance gets between me and him, and I call 911. My fiance tells him cops have been called, and it is in his best interest to get off the property. The caterer says, no, I have to make sure your fiance is okay. And I say, what? Why wouldn't I be okay? And my fiance rightfully says not to engage with him and feed into it. My fiance stays between me and him while I climb out a window. He watches as the caterer throws photos of us on the floor. My fiance didn't want to subdue or touch him in any way so the caterer couldn't make any assault claims. He's begun to destroy our kitchen at this point and when the cops come in he has a butcher knife. My fiance considered going for the gun safe when he first got the knife since we live in a standard ground state but he decided the situation was hectic enough without introducing a firearm. The caterer doesn't obey the police's orders to drop his weapon and he says he isn't leaving without me, so they tase him. It's lucky for him he only got tased and he didn't antagonize my husband into squashing him. As he's let out in cuffs, he's shouting how he and I are in love. He continues on this tirade the entire time police are reading him his rights. The police ask us to do an inventory of the house and see if anything's missing or damaged besides what we witnessed him do. We go around and there's nothing, but then I remember he was in our room yesterday and he went through the room. All of my underwear from the dirty laundry hamper were gone. We were so freaked out in the aftermath that we replaced all of our kitchenware, toothbrushes, sent our sheets to be professionally cleaned, and had a cleaning crew do a deep clean on the whole house. So glad we decided not to serve the food to our guest and my fiance's medically fragile mother. He sent me a letter from prison that thankfully my husband intercepted, because I was still recovering from the whole thing. We gave it to the police who helped us get issued a no contact order. He was sentenced to three years in prison. This happened in May of 2015, in California which will help those of you who are familiar. I had graduated college in June of 2014, moved back into my old hometown, and started a consulting company with my boyfriend which was going very well. We had just finished a contract in the Bay Area, and were beginning a new one about 8 hours south in Torrance. He moved down there first to start setting up, while I took care of loose ends at our closing contract before moving down to meet him. The day comes and I pack my car and head down south to I-5. For the uninitiated, it's a straight highway with 
with little in the way of scenery aside from the occasional strip mall and its monotony has a reputation for putting drivers to sleep at the wheel. I pass a strip mall with gas and a fast food joint and decide to fill my car and my stomach. I go to park in the food venue's parking lot but it's completely full so I park across the street at a hotel, which at the time I didn't think anything of. I go inside to eat my meal then cross the street to get back to my car. I'm well into the hotel parking lot when a pickup truck pulls down the aisle and cuts off my path and stops, with the passenger side facing me. The driver is alone and a clean cut white male in his mid 30s. I don't remember anything about him except that he looks very generic and buttoned up. The way he pulled in front of me to block my path didn't initially set off alarm bells, as he has done it pretty organically. He rolls down the window and the dialogue follows. Excuse me miss, but could you please tell me where the grocery store in town is? I'm sorry, I'm not from here so I couldn't say. Oh, where are you from? Uh, good question, I don't know, not here though. I didn't say that to be rude, I had just moved through so many cities at that point and was on my way to a new one. I wasn't sure how to answer. He laughs and makes a joke, then asks me where I'm headed. I mentioned that I'm moving. I will say he was very charismatic and at this point I just think he's trying to flirt with me. And if I hadn't been so exhausted or in a relationship on another date it might have worked. He makes another comment about how unpleasant moving can be and then gives a warm chuckle and extends his hand to shake mine and goes, well I'm glad I got to meet you, I'm Scott. If you recall the truck is in front of me with a passenger side facing me. I actually take a step forward to grab his hand and then got the delay response of every alarm bell that should have gone off earlier. I'm in a hotel parking lot, he asked me a question that establishes I don't know where I am, another question that establishes establishes I'm alone, and another question that establishes I'm not expected at my destination for many more hours. The thing that connected all these synapses when he extended his hand, he didn't make even the faintest effort to make it accessible to me. He didn't lean over the seat or move toward me in any way. His hand was hovering comfortably over the center console waiting for me to grasp it, which in order to do I would have to lean well into the car. Again, I had already taken a step toward him and begun to raise my hand to take his when the sirens went off. I rocked backwards back to where I was standing and I just remember looking in his eyes what felt like forever feeling everything click into place while also half convinced my imagination was just running wild. His hand still waiting, I lowered mine and felt my eyes slightly narrow with suspicion and slowly said, I'm going to walk away from your car now Scott. Boom. Truck burns rubber with thick gray smoke as the guy guns it out of the hotel lot at 100 miles per hour. He must have floored it. Regrettably smart on his end because I didn't have the license number or anything to offer the police. In the immediate minutes following the event, I felt relieved but hadn't really processed the full weight of what happened. Unfortunately for me, I had many more hours to think back and analyze the whole interaction to shreds. The car was somewhat lifted, there could have easily been another person or even two to three other people hiding inside. I still get creeped out about thinking how close I came to taking his hand and how fortunate I was that I didn't allow my reaction to be driven by manners as criminals often take advantage of. This happened when I was in high school long ago. My mom just recently found the paperwork about it when she cleaned out her office upon retiring from the police department. I remember being upset and scared when it happened, but reading the details as an adult, it sounded even worse than I remembered. I was a 17 year old female, working at a flower and gift shop. It's nighttime. a man comes in, short, overweight, balding, and 40 years old. He tells me about how he needs an apology gift for his girlfriend. So I offer a bouquet, obviously it's a flower shop. He says she doesn't like flowers because they die. This is the first weird thing as he came into a flower shop. Then he goes into detail about how he hit her and asked me if I think it was the right thing to do so. This was long ago so I don't remember exactly what I said but it was something along the lines of not if you want her to continue being your girlfriend. He then tells me what a great job I'm doing and asks me when I get off work. I dodge answering and he leaves. Nothing for six months. Then right before Valentine's Day he walks in the door one minute before close. It was dark and from the outside it looked like I was working alone as my coworker, about a 40 year old female was in the bathroom. Instinctively, it felt like a predator had just entered the room. You know when something isn't right and everything felt not right. I then noticed he has a tarnished revolver tucked into the front of his windbreaker, which is halfway unzipped. It was obvious he wanted it seen. I quickly scribbled a note to my coworker that said he has a gun and handed it to her when she came out of the bathroom. She calmly walked to the phone and looked at me, wordlessly asking if she could call the cops. I shook my head no as I felt like it would escalate the situation. God forbid he heard the police coming and took us hostage or something. I was just going to try and act as calm and normal as I could and hopefully not tip the situation into something more dangerous. He spends 15 minutes wandering around what was a fairly small shop. In retrospect, he was probably waiting to see if my coworker would leave as it was now well past closing. Finally, he places an order for pickup on Valentine's Day, which gives me his name and info, which I'm going to for sure file with the police report. He buys a card and pulls out a wad of $100 bills, which he slowly thumbs through as though looking
looking for the right one with which to pay for his $40 order. I ask him if he wants a bag, as it wouldn't be very inconspicuous if he just showed up at home with the Valentine's card. He replies, no, I didn't feel like being inconspicuous tonight, which seemed like an obvious reference to the gun hanging out of his coat. He leaves. We quickly lock the door and watch him sit in his truck outside. We were not about to exit the shop until he was gone. Finally, he pulls out of his parking spot and moves to another spot further away and continues to just sit there. I don't know how long we waited, but he finally left. I called my mom crying. She called the police, who came to the shop the next day to take a report. I told my best friend at the time what happened. She told her mother. Her mother happened to work with the man and informed security at her job. She said he was very weird, creepy, and liked to talk about weapons a lot. Security at his job, it's a large company with government contracts and things having to do with tech and security, pulled him into the office and questioned him about it. He claimed it was a glove in his pocket, not a revolver. The police were pissed that this company made contact with him about it before they did, and he successfully dodged the cops multiple calls and visits to his apartment. My mom, much to my teen fury at the time, made me quit my job, which was devastating as I loved it there. In retrospect, totally the right call. I never saw him again. In my late teens and early 20s, I was friends with a girl named Lucy. She was a very lonely kind of girl whose parents were, well honestly, not really great parents. Her mother was verbally abusive and her father really couldn't care less about anything. Because of the lack of love in her life, Lucy searched through dating sites for love and comfort from strange men and she was not afraid of meeting them face to face even if they'd been chatting for only a few days. My friendship with Lucy was a strange one. I found her quite annoying sometimes but I also felt awful for her because of her loneliness and lack of friends and love in her life. Sometimes I really didn't want to hang out with her and some days I would accept her offer to hang out. When it was just her and I together, she was normal and okay to be around but also very appreciative of having someone giving her attention. We had a small group of friends and she would try to get all of us together as often as possible and honestly, the whole group together was really quite fun. When we were all together, Lucy was very hyper and you could just tell that she was happy to be around people who didn't insult her as her mother does. Suddenly, Lucy tells us she has a boyfriend. We were all surprised because we knew she met a lot of guys online but we had never heard her say she was dating someone. A few days later she sets up a day for our friend group to meet Trevor. None of us were looking forward to it because we thought he was going to be like all the others. A temporary boy toy. When we met him we all felt awkward. He barely spoke a word. He wouldn't look directly at any of us at all. Lucy would try to be funny but he would just give her dirty looks. Needless to say we thought he was a weird one and could tell he didn't care much for her. As the days went on Lucy kept telling me how much Trevor did not like me. She kept saying he thinks I am using Lucy for her money. Not sure how he thought that since I paid for everything for Lucy. To keep this piece of the story short, I think he was trying to find reasons to convince her to get rid of me. I got a terrible vibe from Trevor. He dressed like he didn't care about life, he never smiled, he didn't shake our hands when first meeting us, he stank of weed and really had an overall uncomfortable feeling about him. After months of Trevor trying to convince Lucy that I'm a terrible friend and she should not hang out with me anymore, she started to do as he said. She would start to hide me from him. If she and I were to together and he would call her on her phone, she would lie and say I wasn't there. If she was with the group of friends, he would have her swear I wasn't there. When he was going to be joining the group on an outing or just hanging out at her place, she would tell me I couldn't come. Lucy will do whatever a boyfriend says just to keep pleasing him so she doesn't lose them. Now here's where it gets scary. Lucy calls me one day and says she wants me to come hang out at her place. I agreed. She came to pick me up and we went to her house and watched TV for a bit. We then decided since the day is nice outside, we would take her two dogs for a walk to a nearby pocket park and would later return to the house to have lunch together. While at this park, she receives a phone call. Now, let me say that Lucy is not a private person whatsoever and has never, ever walked away to answer a phone call until this day. She walked far enough away that she knew I would not be able to hear anything she said. This was suspicious to me, but not enough to question it. The call ends as she begins walking towards me with a look on her face as if she is trying not to smile. She tells me, so I need to bring you home now. I was slightly confused as we had only been together for about an hour, when we usually spend the entire day together, and she would never want me to go home. She would even frequently beg me to sleep over to avoid being alone. So anyway, I said okay and we walked to drop off her dogs at home and we got into her car and off we went. About 10 minutes into the car ride, I realized she isn't going in the direction of my house so I questioned it. Where are we going? She smirked but didn't respond. I asked again laughing uncomfortably. Seriously, where are we going? She continued to smirk but didn't want to answer me. I started to realize she was heading in the direction of where her boyfriend lived. I asked one last time with anger my 
my voice, where are you taking me? Her only response was bone chilling to me. Trevor wants to talk to you. I wasn't having any of this. I insisted and demanded she let me out of the car, but with her evil smirk and same response, she said it again. It's okay, he just wants to talk to you. I was furious at this point because this creepy guy who looks like he wants to kill someone, who also despised me, wanted to talk to me. Why can't he talk to me on the phone? Why do I need to go to his sketchy apartment? She absolutely refused to let me out of the car. She had the doors locked, as if I wasn't able to unlock my passenger door. I waited until she reached a red light. I grabbed her wallet from the back seat and took out her bus pass and bolted out of the car. I had no idea where I was or where the nearest bus stop was, but I was not about to let her crazy boyfriend do whatever he wanted to me. She yelled for me to get back into the car, but of course I ignored her. She sped off furiously. I immediately blocked her number on my phone. I removed her as my friend on social media and immediately warned the group of friends not to talk to her because she has gone nuts. I have not spoken to her since that very day and she also lost the other five friends of the group as well. I've recently moved into a new apartment three weeks and I'm starting to share it with my sister. The only reason we know properly is a single mom who lives in the apartment next to us. Ever since we moved in, she's been giving us advice and helping us out with things, etc. We don't know any of the other neighbors properly yet. Today I was out with my friends and after that I went to get my sister so we could go out for some food. We got home around 10pm. My sister and I got into our PJs and were sitting around watching TV when our buzzer rang. I jumped up to answer it and it turned out to be our neighbor single mom. I asked her what was up and she said that our dad is asking for us downstairs. Straight away my stomach dropped. I immediately asked her if she's sure he said that he was our dad. The reason I asked this was just to make sure that is what she actually said. But she replied that yeah, he said he was our dad and he was asking for us. The neighbor then asked me if she could let him up to our flat, but I told her no. I wanted to shout out to my sister, but I didn't want to worry her right away. So I asked the neighbor to not let him come up yet, and I heard her repeat this to him. I couldn't hear anything for a few minutes and I started to get really worried. At this point, my sister comes up to me and asks who it is. I called out to my neighbor a few times, but she didn't answer. It must have only been about a minute, but it honestly felt like ages when she didn't reply. I was about to tell my sister to call 911 because I was starting to panic and I didn't know what was happening out there. But then she came back on and told me that he was gone. She then came up to our flat and explained what went down. She said that she was walking back to her flat after finishing work and she saw a man by the buzzers. At first, she she assumed that he was just someone who lived there but when he noticed her walking up he asked us by name and asked us if she could let him up to our flat. She asked him who he was and he told her that he was our dad. Obviously she buzzed us and told us first since our neighbor doesn't know us that well so she doesn't know what our dad looks like. She said that because we were young and on our own and she didn't want to buzz an estranged man up to our flat. She said that her mom instincts kicked in when she heard me being hesitant to let him up to the flat. She said that apparently after he heard me say that he got really pushy with her and started trying to move her out the way. He kept on saying to her, it's okay, I'm their dad, let me in, I'm not gonna do anything. She started arguing with him and told him that if I don't feel comfortable letting him in, there's no way he's getting in. He then got into the car and rode away. Now this is the reason why I hesitated. We haven't spoke to our dad since I was 16. We even considered getting a restraining order from him at one point. He's not even our biological father, but we were legally adopted by him when I was 9. He was very abusive. It got to the point where we, me, me, sister, and my mom had to leave him in the middle of the night. He was always really controlling and after we left, he would secretly follow us around and leave threatening voicemails on the phone. I found out that he has a criminal record as well as I believe he was convicted of manslaughter in the 80s. I have no idea of the backstory behind that and I honestly don't really want to know. Like I said, we haven't from him since I was 16, which was 3 years ago. And as soon as she said the word dad, I almost had a panic attack. I asked her to describe him and she said that because it was dark out, she couldn't really see him. We ended up staying with her because me and my sister are really shaken up. This happened a long time ago when I was around 15 or so. I'm 25 now. Back then I was really into singing and dancing with my friends and I was introduced to K-pop as a result. This was way before K-pop became noticeably mainstream. So whenever events relating to it came up we got very excited. There was a global audition for one of the big companies in my town and my three friends and I decided to go. I was the only non-Asian girl in our friend group. I'm only mentioning it because this pertains to the story later. The K-pop fandom back then was pretty much the same as now. 
people of various ethnicities were into the idol music genre. We all knew the likelihood of getting into the industry was super low, and for me even more so, as I wasn't of Asian descent. But I knew that going in. That wasn't the point of us going though, we just loved being in proximity of something important to the genre we enjoyed, just kids having fun. By the way, I looked pretty young for my age then, and wearing pigtails this day didn't help with that either. So we get dropped off and meet up at the audition place, a community center of some sort. We kind of dilly dally around a bit until we have to line up for our respective auditions, i.e. singing, dancing, etc. I was going to go sing, so I was mentally preparing myself in the crowded space outside of the audition rooms. That's when out of the corner of my eye I see a tall, older, maybe 40 years old, white man beginning to approach me. I remember thinking, huh, is he going to audition too? It was strange because everyone else in there was younger, maybe he was a parent. He walks up pretty close and goes, can you help me please? I'm confused and I ask him what he needs help with. Oh, the staff here, my son. My son's trying to audition but they won't let him audition. Okay, this was weird. I then asked him why. He said, because he's not Korean. That was when I started to get creeped out. I looked around to see a pretty diverse crowd and then back at him. Uh, I don't know. That's terrible. You should talk to, and then I point towards the staff. They should be able to help. I knew he was lying, but I was too scared to say anything else. I went on, anyone could audition here. He didn't listen and insisted on me helping him. Then he said something that sent a chill down my spine. When I was trying for the fifth time to convince him to approach the staff instead of me, he beckoned me to come outside with him. My son's just outside in my car. Can you come talk to him, please? That was when I repeated what I said earlier and began to firmly walk in the opposite direction. He kept trying to coax me out to see his son. I managed to lose him in the crowd of people. Only seconds later, I see him talking to my friend about me and helping his son and all that. I was shocked. The man had clearly been watching me for a while to know who I came with. We were split up at that point. I went up and told her we should get going without looking at the man. He ignored me and kept on talking to her. Without speaking, I went up to her, grabbed her hand, and pulled her at once to get her away from him. She was super gullible and didn't understand why I was so worried. That man clearly was unnerved by what I did and left my friend and then disappeared into the crowd. So about 20 minutes later, I'm in the lineup for the audition when I get a cold feeling in my body, and I turn to look towards the entrance. My audition room was close to it and there he was, standing. But he wasn't just standing, he had his arms crossed and he was glaring at me. I've never seen someone look at me with such vitriol. He looked like he wanted to kill me, it was terrifying. The crowd of people was sparse because we all had lined up outside our assigned rooms. This man waited there, staring at me non-stop for an hour. An hour. He glared at me all the way until I got into the audition room. I was so scared that he'd be there once I got out, but I guess the auditions went on longer than he expected and he went home. With his son in tow. I'm guessing. I was so scared that he'd be there once I got out, but I guess the auditions went on longer than he expected and he went home with his son in tow, I'm guessing. I've worked a few odd jobs in my life. My first job was a summer job at 16 during summer break at a dairy farm. I absolutely hated it there and made it harder for me to find the motivation to even try finding work again when the time came. I don't really remember how I was first referred to the job, but the following summer, I ended up working as an office assistant for a self-employed photographer. My parents knew her because she used to be a member of their church, and my sister attended her 4-H program when she had it. By that time, her health had begun to take a hit as she claimed it was a mixture of things from chronic Lyme to fibromyalgia. I had had also been warned by my parents that she was a little off. She was very religious and claimed to have had real encounters with demons, even participated in a few exorcisms. I'm an atheist and a skeptic, so I never took her story seriously. Aside from the weird things she would tell me, she was mostly harmless and working for her was not hard. The job basically required me to do a lot of data entry, as well as help prep her photos with some minor touching up and the addition of her company watermark before uploading them to a site where her customers could browse them and then pick which ones they wanted to order. She primarily photographed horse events, dressage, stadium, and cross-country jumping, etc. And for the first several months, my job stayed in her living room, which is basically my office space at the time. Eventually, I was talked into tagging along at shows where she trained me as a photographer, and soon I was shooting at the events along with her. It was boring work, I won't lie. I'm not a horse person. But things didn't get weird until a year later when I learned the hard way it was not her that I needed to worry about. She had two sons, one who was out of state, the other one was in the Navy. The latter of the two, a guy called Nate, I had only heard small things about. When he finally finally returned home and I met him for the first time while working in her living room, he seemed like a nice guy, a little odd but not concerning. He was obsessed with movies, and being a bit of a movie buff myself, whenever he would venture to the living room to strike up a conversation, it would always be about whatever movies we were into or were excited to see. I should point out here that I was 18 by this point and he was in his mid-30s. At some point, he got it in his head that I was interested in him, though he never said anything directly to me. I had to find out about it from my parents. My mom worked as the secretary at her church in 
Nate knew it. I can only guess my boss had told him. One afternoon, Nate showed up at my mom's desk and started gushing about me. He talked about how much fun I was, how he loved talking to me, how he was planning to take me to the movies and take me to this church and all these other plans he had for me. My mom was beyond uncomfortable, as was the pastor who happened to overhear it. And when I got home that night, she told me what had happened and suggested I make sure not to lead him on. I was completely baffled because I hadn't done anything. We never even discussed the possibility of doing anything together. I made an effort to acknowledge him less when he was around and keep the conversation short while stressing I had work to do. Eventually, he got his own place and moved out of his parents' house, so I figured the problem had solved itself. A couple years later, I had moved out, my boss's company had closed, and I was working someplace new. I was friends with both my boss and Nate on Facebook, and around that time I was finally coming out as an atheist, something I couldn't do when I was still living at home. One night, my old boss messaged me, asking about a ring I had on my finger. It was a black ring with a white solid star in the middle of a black circle. Already knowing where she was going with this, I told her it was just a ring. She started accusing me of wearing a pentagram, because she didn't know what a pinnacle was, and that I was promoting Satan. I tried several times to explain to her that not only was it not that symbol, but that also paganism has nothing to do with Satan anyways, but she refused to listen so I just ignored her. It was typical behavior of her and not worth the argument. The next morning, I had a message from Nate, telling me I needed to come to his church with him. I told him no and the messages I received back gradually grew angrier and angrier. He went from asking to demanding I go with him. He told me I was lost and that I would not find the answers I needed by living the life I was. Eventually, he outright said he thought the fact that I was wearing a pentagram was disgusting and that I was opening myself up for possession. Knowing there would be even less of a point in arguing with him than there was with his mother, I went ahead and blocked both him and her, deciding I was done with the both of them. Then, he started showing up at my workplace. He would always search through the store until he found me, and then once he did, he would corner me and not stop talking to me no matter how many times I tried to dodge him or tell him I needed to get back to work. Eventually, the managers caught on and started intercepting him whenever he showed up. I wasn't making enough to pay the rent with that job, so I had to take up a second one. Within a week of working my second job, which was in a different town, he showed up there too. This time I told the managers outright who he was, and after that, every time he showed up, I was allowed to hide in the back room behind a locked door while they sped his order along and got him out. One of those mini encounters, while I was hiding in the back, one of the managers was back there with me, inputting employee time punches into the computer when the both of us heard Nate shout in our directing, I know you remember me. That was the last straw for them and they told him his business was no longer welcome there. He started showing up at my other job as well for a while, which was a relief. Fast forward to a few years later, I was getting used to not having to look over my shoulder every shift or checking the parking lot for his truck. Then one day he reappeared. He was browsing a section I was walking past when he spotted me and got this deer in the headlights look. I made a beeline to the break room because just seeing him made me scared. After that, he started showing up regularly. I would always find ways to dodge and avoid him, but he would still eventually spot me and know I was still there. I was debating whether or not to tell the managers because at this point it had been a while since he had done anything and saying something just because I was nervous didn't feel right. Call me a coward or an idiot, but that was my thought process. What happened next made me regret not speaking up. It was bound to happen eventually, but one night he managed to catch me while I was at the customer service desk. He approached me and said hi, and I immediately started to look for someone to signal over so I could make a break for it. But before I could say a word, he said something that made me feel sick. How's your little girl doing? She's three now, right? I look at him horrified. I had him completely blocked from all of my social media, I had his number blocked, I was living at a new address, and I had not seen or spoken to his mother since she confronted me about my ring. I had not told either of them I was a parent now or that I was married, and I was not friends with any who knew them, but he knew. How's your husband doing too? He asked when I didn't answer. He's good, he's a good man, I said, trying to reinforce the idea that I was not available to him and that I had no desire to have anything to do with him. Where does he work? At this point, I felt like I was going to pass out. Thankfully, another employee approached just to gather some reshelves, and I got out of there. As I was leaving, he called out behind me, I'll see you again, we'll talk. We'll go out and do something together, we will. I reported him to the managers, telling them everything about the encounter, including all the information he had on me and my family that he should not have had. They were able to pull up his face on CCTV. I haven't seen him since the incident with my managers. I think he may have gotten scared off. Turned out one of my co-workers used to work with them too at a different job and she also made a complaint about him to the managers. I don't know what they did with that information afterwards, but I know he hasn't shown up since. It sounds like they plan to call the cops if he sets foot in the store again. With two employee complaints of stalker-like behavior, they refuse to ignore that. 
When I was about 7 years old, my father bought a few hundred acres in southern Mississippi about 1.5 hours west of Mobile, Alabama. He built a small cabin on top of a hill that was in the middle of a large field surrounded by woods. This house was about 5 miles from a paved road. To get to our land, it took nearly 10 minutes of driving down dirt roads from the main highway, which was south of the house. About a quarter mile north from the house, he built a small lake, more like a pond. It was about as long as a football field but wider. To get to the lake from the house, you could take Route A which was a hard packed dirt road that was lined with dogwood trees. It was beautiful in the spring. Route B was about 100 yards east of Dogwood Lane and we named it Vampire Trail because it was always so gloomy. The trees blocked out the sun on the brightest days and it had a slight decline as you walked toward the lake. I say walked because this trail was not for vehicles. Thick woods filled the area outside and in between both trails. One morning during the fall, my parents and my little sister had gone to get ice cream and do some shopping. This trip would take them at least an hour or two. I was 10 years old so I decided decided to go fishing while listening to Bama play Ole Miss. The game was the usual Bama win so I thought I could ease the boredom of a blowout by fishing in the well-stocked lake, so I carried my pole, small radio, and my small ice chest. I had an Airedale Terrier named Bull that never left my side and it was on this day I realized how awesome he really was. Onto the lake we went. Picture a large oval roughly the size of a football field but larger with an L-shaped pier in the southeast corner. Vampire Lane opened up to a more severe decline to the shore and then the small pier. Across the lake on the west side there was a narrow tree line that separated the shore from Dogwood Lane. The north side of the lake was the dam and the south end in thick and swampy woods. Fortunately for me, I realized later. About five minutes after I threw out my line and two Bama touchdowns later, I got that feeling. It's a feeling I have come to recognize well and it may have saved my life this day. The feeling of being watched by something dangerous. Bull must have felt it too because a few seconds later I could hear him growling low and staring across the lake to the west. To the tree line that separated Dogwood Lane from the lake. I turned my head in that direction and almost immediately my eyes lit on what I thought to be half of a silhouette of a large man behind a tree. It was too far to make out details but close enough to be sure of what I was seeing. Almost five minutes went by and right before I scolded myself for an overactive imagination, the half silhouette moved behind a tree slowly. Bull stood and growled louder and I told him quietly to stop and I turned my head north towards the dam while keeping my eyes and attention rooted to that tree. Over the next ten minutes, which felt like hours, I watched while this figure moved slowly from tree to tree, always north and always facing me. The saying scared stiff was something I found to be true. For some reason I thought it was important that whoever or whatever it was did not know I was aware. I finally realized that the figure's path was bringing it closer to the dam, which would make its path to be shorter and easier. My paralysis broke and I casually put down the fishing pole and started walking towards Vampire Lane. As an adult, I was in the army for 11 years as an MP, but not turning to look over my shoulder during that walk was the hardest thing I have ever done. In my mind's eye, whatever it was, was screaming across the dam towards me. When I hit the tree line, I broke into a run. As I was running, Bull dashed ahead of me and my anger turned into admiration as he stopped some 20 yards ahead and faced north until I passed him. He continued this action the entire run home. My dog was watching my back, just epic. Although I can grasp the awesomeness of this now, at the time I was so scared that I was literally sick. Even at such a young age, I knew that a large man watching and trying to creep up on a 10 year old boy was up to no good. When I reached the cabin, I immediately locked the door and got one of my dad's shotguns as well as his 38 revolver. I sat at the large front window, my eyes glued to both trail openings in the woods between them. My family returned shortly after and for some reason I did not mention what happened. I never felt safe there again. When me and my friends or my little sister wanted to go anywhere other than the area around the cabin, I made sure my parents were with us. What scares me the most though is the fact that our closest neighbors were about two miles northwest of us. With thick woods in between us, the crow flies. Who or what was watching me from the woods that day, guess I may never know. I sometimes wish I could go back then. As a grown man with military training, as I am now. Bull lived a full life and was put to sleep peacefully as a very old but great dog. The best dog I have ever known. This happened a few years ago, and since then it has made me look at people very differently. I used to work in a strip mall out in a fairly rural area. Most people are recognizable even if you don't know them personally. People from out of the area frequently stop on their way through to other towns, so it's not like there are never out of towners, just that they might be easy to spot. Like in many places, we have a few homeless folks that hang around the shopping center, and they occasionally ask people for change or food. It could be a nuisance, but the folks that worked at the shops kind of kept an eye on them to help them out or to keep track of how they are doing. There's this one guy, let's call him Shane, that over the course of years has slowly gotten in worse and worse shape. 
He would be filthy and was clearly not doing well mentally, and was usually intoxicated. He always had several layers of clothing and the pants that he wore on the outside of his other pants always sacked making it hard for him to walk. He'd go missing for days and then show up again. We'd wonder what happened to Shane and ask around a bit, and a few days later he'd appear again. He was always so dirty. I always wished there was a way we could get him some help, but I didn't really know what to do. One day, I was out in a major city that is about 80 or so miles away from where I work. I happened to see a well-dressed, very well-groomed gentleman that looked exactly like Shane, but at that moment, I figured my eyes were deceiving me. This guy has an expensive-looking shoulder bag, a new iPhone, and an Apple Watch. We were both in line at a popular food truck, and it was usually a long wait to order and get your food. Most people just mind their business and scroll on their phones while waiting. This guy, on the other hand, is staring daggers at me. I keep avoiding looking that way, but I keep glancing to see if he's still there, and at the time, I want to look at him because I'm so curious about how much he looks like Shane. I glance his way and I have to stumble back because he's practically right up against me. He has such intense eyes. He sort of whispers to me, but really intensely, and tells me he knows where I'm from and what shop I work at. He gets closer and I can tell he smells good, and I can even smell his minty breath. I ask how he knows, and he just smiles. I ask again and he smiles brighter, exposing a perfectly clean set of teeth, minus one tooth. I'm almost positive Shane is missing that tooth. I edge away, feeling more than a little uncomfortable. His order gets called up, but they say his name is James. The next few days, I don't see Shane anywhere around the shopping center, and I ask around and no one had seen him for a few days. Someone says they hope he's okay, another person shrugs and says they wish they could do something to help him. The next day he is here, filthy as ever, grimy teeth, dirty fingernails, and wearing all his layers. He sits on the curb outside my shop and asks people for change. I decide to venture out and confront him. I'm 100% sure it's him, but I don't understand how he could get so filthy and smelly in such a short time. I ask him if he was in the city and he looks at me through bloodshot eyes and mumbles that he'll kill me if I tell anyone. This takes me aback and I look at him puzzled. He slurs again that he will kill me if I tell anyone that he's not actually homeless. He starts to get worked up but I ended up calling the police because I didn't know at that point what he was capable of. He wandered off and I haven't seen him since. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.